Settle in, class, because we've got a long one. It took a year and a half, but we've finally done them all. At least I beat the next edition, if only thanks to their incompetence. I thought it'd be fun to do one last supercut of them all. I walk through memory lane and my increasing editing skills. Well, fun for you. Digging through some of my first serious attempts at video making since childhood was a bit painful. At least I can fix a few oversights. Still can't believe I forgot the Artificer's flavor suggestions. So before we move on to monsters and ancestries and who knows what, how about one last look at what we have? You ready? Let's go. Settle in, class. I know it's an exciting day. It's the start of your journey. Yes, there's a lot of general knowledge to learn, but eventually we all have to choose a path to focus on. We'll be doing a video for each class, breaking down their specializations, strengths and weaknesses, ease of play, and more. Let's start with a basic overview. In D&D, your class is your main career path, the broad type of power and skill set you have. There are 12 main classes in your handbook, and an extra one revealed in Tasha's Cauldron. The class determines your hit die and core abilities, as well as granting you proficiency in things like armor, weapons, tools, saving throws, and skills. This is your area of focus, and grants you increasingly powerful abilities the longer you stick with it. Each class is divided into a number of categories known as a subclass, which more narrowly define your source of power and specialization. These grant additional abilities, proficiency, spells, etc. In some cases, they'll even change how your features work, like making a core ability more powerful or expanding your spell list. We'll touch on these classes more in future videos, but for now let's dive into the classes. Let's start with Artificer, the one that was recently revealed. This is your Hedge Mage, your Tinkerer, your Demolitionist. Artificers are mages who use wit and creativity to use and make magic items. And yeah, make. Making magic items is kind of our whole thing. We don't get as many traditional spells, but we infuse items with raw power. We're highly versatile and have a version that fills any role you need. On top of that, the most powerful magic items make you attuned to them, and you can only typically attune to three at a time, unless you're an Artificer and eventually they get double that? Maybe you like the Mecha Magical Might of Magic Custom Armor, Golems, Turrets, a Flamethrower, or maybe you're like me and just love brewing potions and casting with a spoon. However you want to spin it, if magical items suit you, then so do we. Now the next class needs little description. You know it, you love it, the Barbarian. Barbarians are brick houses with higher HP than any other class. They're the only ones who can eventually break the limit of strength and durability, becoming legendarily mighty. They feel emotion to the primal root and connect with a core power that gives them supernatural ability. The source of this is buried. For some, it's a connection to the Fae, or spirits, or nature itself. Others tap into their fight-or-flight mechanism, or they might actually get too angry to die. Their features almost entirely revolve around hitting hard, hitting harder, and ignoring the fact that they were hit. They don't even wear armor, adding their constitution modifier to their AC. Barbarians are a sledgehammer of a class. Not suited for every role, but when you need one, accept no substitute. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Bard. Instead of a specialty tool, these are a jack of all trades. So much so that it's one of their main features, letting them get a bonus even on the few skills they aren't proficient in. They're among the most varied spellcasters, even taking spells from other classes. But at their core, they excel at support. They can heal, they can make their allies better, they cover pretty much any skill check, and they can temporarily plug pretty much any hole that needs filling. Speaking of which, let's air out the jokes for a second, because a Bard's great charisma lets them do more than just flirt. They can be a daring swashbuckler or a cunning spy the wise old keeper of history, or a seeker of legend. You can make one a flashy performer, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just as valid to be the quiet kid in the back of your band class. If you're interested in being a jack of all trades, or supporting your allies, or even just having your words physically hurt, consider choosing Bard. You know what isn't a choice though? Being a cleric. A cleric is usually a priest of some respect, but not always. Divine powers are bestowed at the wishes of the god, and while that can be as a reward, it's often from the god seeing the potential in the person. Even a high-ranking member of a religion might not have divine power. You might be well known, but you you might just be a grunt with a violent past, and right now that god needs a field medic. You might not have even known they existed before getting zapped with power and having great responsibility thrust upon you. Powers like driving off or destroying undead, and eventually being able to just ask the god to directly intervene. The rest of the power depends on the god and which aspect you embody. If you're looking to draw power from the divine, have a link to the gods for better or worse, and serve in often unusual ways, consider cleric, and don't feel pressured to heal. I mean, you can if you want, you can be the best healer around, but if that's not your style, go with great or guard secrets with knowledge, praise the sun, worship the storm or magic or bloodshed. Whatever flavor of priest interests you, we got you. You could even be the person who got in trouble for starting a fight club in your congregation's youth. And it was all cool and everyone involved had a blast, but people didn't like you throwing children or the kid-shaped holes in the wall. And you left it pure on a cord, but there is tension for years. That one's the nature domain? I think at least. The guy I know who did that called himself the king of the squirrels, so I guess it works. But if you want to actually rule the squirrels, think about the druid. Druids are worshippers of nature. It's wrath and it's protector. They're not the toughest in their normal form and can't use metal weapons or armor, but more than make up for that with a might of full spellcasting, many of those spells being exclusive to them. They can also turn 
turn into animals. They focus on balancing natural forces, like growth and forest fire, fungal decay, and the cosmos. Or just buffing that shape-shifting until they don't need weapons because they're a mammoth. If you want to bring nature's fury to bear, especially if you want to use actual bears, the druid makes a fine choice. I would have a transition for fighter. Fight me. The fighter is exactly what they sound like. They're a basic combatant that's just really good at their job. Second highest HP, access to all armor and weaponry, knights and mercenaries and town guard alike. They pick a fighting style that will be their specialty and it does grant them bonuses, but they excel at any type of mundane combat, like sword and shield or archery. They get general improvements to shrug off small blows or get extra attacks in, but their primary skill is their versatility. They get to improve their stats or gain a feat twice as often as everyone else, allowing for great customization. The subclasses just add specialization to that, like magic or a mount, or just getting really good at landing a critical hit. If you're looking for a standard, reliable warrior with a good toolbox of combat features to customize, the fighter is a great choice to consider. And if nothing else, they have the samurai, which I know a lot of you are looking at. But if that's your style, you might want to shift your eyes to the monk. We're talking about a martial arts master. They hone their bodies into deadly weapons, often at remote monasteries where they learn inner peace. That's the standard origin, at least. But what actually matters as a concept is that they've honed their body and mind. Your basic monk can catch projectiles, run across water and up walls, effectively speak every language, and release a flurry of punches with the strength of an actual sword. They don't even need to wear armor. They add their wisdom to their dexterity, dodging on pure instinct. And that's before their subclass lets them teleport through shadow, or throw out an energy blast, or summon an avatar of their own soul to hit you even harder. You'll hear people saying that the monk is bad because the other classes can hit harder or tank more or cast spells, but you know what they can't do? Run across the castle moat and up the wall, do a triple flip off the other side, punch out every guard and stun the big bad with a boot to the head. And sometimes there's more to life than having the biggest number. If you just want to do cool stunts and punch people, the monk is the way to go. That said, if numbers are what you care about, do I have the frontline fighter for you. The paladin is traditionally a crusader in shining armor, devoted to tirelessly upholding truth and justice, a tradition which is dead. Because functionally speaking, the paladin just draws power from extreme devotion to an oath. Doesn't even have to be from a god. A paladin just has a code and obsession so strong it manifests as divine power. So you don't have to go deus phone. You can be after revenge or trying to protect the forest, or just be so narcissistic you actually got power from it. Like the fighter, they have a high HP with access to all armor and weaponry, and pick a fighting style to specialize in. Unlike the fighter, they have healing and magic by default. They also gain aura abilities, which make all allies around them tougher in a variety of ways. Their spellcasting might not be as strong as a dedicated caster, but they have a panic button called Smite. Whenever they hit an enemy, they can turn a spell slot into a burst of divine energy for an extra boost of damage. And that's not even getting into their actual spells. If you want to stand on the front lines in heavy armor, wrecking foes with bursts of damage and healing yourself if things get rough, the paladin might be for you. Just try not to drag the party along with your shining zeal. But if you'd like to drag them through the wilderness, the ranger might be a perfect match. A ranger is a warrior at home in the wild. Hunters and scouts, wanderers and wardens, those who reject society, and those who protect it from outside threat. With high HP, medium armor, and a fighting style specialization, if you want a wild warrior that can survive off their own power, the ranger is the way to go. The subclass gives you all sorts of amazing abilities as well. Mark your foes for extra damage, sneak through the underbrush, summon a swarm of nature incarnate to take the shape of whatever you like and bend it to your will, and to top it all off, they have a bit of magic as well. I will admit that learning about their abilities can be a little confusing. Basically speaking, the original ranger and especially the beastmaster were just not good. Now people will scream all sorts of ways to fix it at you, but just remember two things. The subclasses outside the PHP fixed most of the issues, and Tasha's Cauldron brewed up fixes for the rest. So if you want to be an awesome warrior of the wood, ignore the hate for the old versions and pick up the ranger. Just, uh, one request? This is one of those classes that really tend to attract the whole lone wolf type. Which is fine, but if you want to be part of an adventuring group, be part of it. Don't try to pull the whole I work alone routine unless you actually want to be alone, because decent people respect that boundary and leave. I understand the appeal of the whole I hate all of you idiots, you'd be lost without me thing, but it just isn't fun in practice. Nobody's here to convince you to do the thing you sat down to do, so expect your next thought to be Wait, where are they going? And this problem isn't inherent to the ranger or anything, it's just one of those classes that tend to attract the archetype as you're naturally suited to living alone. The other main offender of that Sundere act, and often a litany of crime, is the rogue. Look, you don't have to be a thief, it's just always a temptation to steal when you need cash and can get away with it. 
it, but you could be a spy or a scout, an assassin or a pirate. The core of this class is basically just risk versus reward. Mediocre health and light armor, but a big damage boost if you're close and have the upper hand. You're proficient in so many skills and can even double your bonus to a few to make yourself unmatched. But all that extra maneuverability and confidence makes it easy to overextend. Your abilities tilt the odds in your favor or mitigate your failure, but you're still making a gamble. The subclasses also assist in that, either rounding you out with things like magic or specializing even further into movement or damage. It can be a risky business at times, but this class is great for people who like living on that knife's edge. But rogues aren't the only ones to come out of nowhere, so do demands for you to subscribe. So do surges of life-altering magic. A sorcerer is a natural mage, flooded with magic to the core. Maybe your ancestor was blessed or cursed, or you survived exposure to raw energy. Or maybe your mom just found a fae festival, and now you keep setting yourself on fire. However you cut it, you don't use magic, you are magic. And by tapping into your pool of internal power, you can fundamentally warp your magic whenever you cast. Change the size, shape, duration, damage type, hit harder. As long as you have points in your pool, the weave of magic is yours to control. Your power is also affected by your origin, with dragon scales or random effects, or flying on the wind when you cast. If you want to embody magic, not just wield it, the sorcerer is the perfect pick for you. Well, assuming you can, typically that class picks you. Some people just don't have that power, which can lead to a rash decision. There are many who would be happy to provide that power, at least for a price. Be careful if you choose the warlock, and especially where you're getting that power, because the patron you pick will grant you unique powers and spells, but they will always have more to ask. And don't think you're safe just because you didn't make a deal. A fae can bind you without you even knowing, and sometimes knowledge acts as a pact and compulsion itself. If that sort of dangerous magic sounds interesting, Warlock might be your pick. They also have the easiest form of spellcasting. Instead of fiddling around with all those spell slots of different levels, they just cast everything at full power. Sure, they'll run out quickly, but while every other caster needs 8 hours of rest to refill, the Warlock just needs one. Add in infusion powers to improve yourself and your spells, and the Warlock can be an enticing deal for those willing to risk it. Oh, and side note to future Warlocks, if you research them independently, you'll find the running joke is how they always use Eldritch Blast, a powerful signature spell they can use infinitely and modify with infusions. You may even hear about people who get mad or roll their eyes because you use it. I don't get why they care. Oh no, you're using a class feature. The Barbarian stabs every round. Every sorcerer I've met casts Firebolt just as much if not more. You're fine. I've never seen someone care in an actual party, so don't get scared off by the discourse. And that's all of them. Hit that like button and... Ugh. Fine. Wizards are the mages that people think of first. In fact, they're the class most people think of first, so I probably don't need to tell you what they are. Something not lost on the Wizards of the Coast who made these books, because they went all in. They're tied for the most spell slots per day, they have the largest list of spells available to use in those slots by far, and they can keep adding to their spells known as long as they have gold in a reference. This lets rich wizards know more spells than anyone. They're primarily long range and have great utility and burst damage. They have the lowest hit die and can't wear armor, but they do have a spell sword subclass if that piques your interest. They also have the most subclass in the handbook, and are one shy of having the most published overall. The wizard's been given a lot of love over the years, and I'll admit I'm bitter about it, but honestly, there's a reason, and a weird one at that. Okay, follow me here. They aren't actually a class. They're a theme. At level 1 you get your method of casting, and that is all you get. Everything else is just your subclass. Unless you somehow get to level 18, at which point you get more spells. Decently powerful, but thematically nothing, and for the vast majority of people, you will never get more than your level 1 spell casting. Now those subclasses are incredibly varied and powerful, with utility mages, blasters, skirmishers, and can even get around all the low health that people joke about. Unless you take care of the one thing that binds them all together, the spellbook. At which point their casting gets broken with a rusty crowbar. Though to be honest, I've never seen someone target the spellbook. I've been really tempted to, but it just felt petty. And don't get me wrong, I am petty, but not like that. Anyway, I believe that with passion and a willingness to learn, anyone can start with any class. That said, here's what I recommend for a first class. If you're new and don't know any of the mechanics, your top tiers are going to be Barbarian, Monk, and Fighter. They're straightforward and easy to pick up while you learn what's going on. Debate all you want which is easier, but they're all easy. If you want more magic, Paladin and Ranger are great. They get magic a little at a time, so you can get the cool power and theming without being overwhelmed. I especially recommend Paladin. They're hard to kill and you have a panic button in Smite if you get bogged down with options. The next group would be Bard, Rogue, Sorcerer, and Warlock. The Rogue's not that complicated, but they require a bit more tactical thinking and tend to get themselves in trouble that their HP can't back up. As for your casters, they require a lot of choices during setup and level up, but that's also where you can take your time. If you're willing to learn what you can do, read through the spells you have, and do a little extra bookkeeping before session, they're still perfectly fine. Just a a bit more complicated or less forgiving. Finally, we have Cleric, 
druid, wizard, artificer, in that order. They choose which of their spell list or spells known they can cast each day, and are reliant on that magic. The cleric's not actually that bad if you're only trying to heal or only dealing damage, but if you're trying to do both of them well, the balance can get tricky. The druid's wild shape adds extra forms, not too bad for most subclasses, but still just more to remember. The wizard isn't as complicated, but has far less HP for mistakes, and that spell list covers two-thirds of all spells. Artificers like me only have a few spells to keep track of, but we have infusions, and we replicate a massive list of magical items. You can overcome that, but you have to be willing to do the prep work. Still, I only recommend them if you have the time and passion to learn what they can do before you begin. And with that, for real this time, settle in class. Today we're going over the Artificer. From Mecha Magical Might to the Not-So-Humble Witch, Golems and Gadgets and Flamethrowers. If we're talking magic items, we're talking Artificer. Whether we're enchanting items traditionally, or just forcing magic into things and bending them to our will. Making the mundane magic is what we're all about. We're brewing our strongest potion, blasting away with artillery, and attuning to everything we find. The Artificer is about as complicated as a player character gets in 5e, but just bear with me and you'll come out the other side with fresh ideas. We'll start with mechanics, then move into flavor and concept. You ready? Then let's go! Before we get into our different flavors, let's learn what the Artificer is at its core. We're an item-focused mage, only getting spells up to level 5, but getting the most powerful of all. It's called a shotgun, Alaka Blam! Okay, but really, we have the us-only spells of Caustic Brew for lingering acid damage, Intellect Fortress for mental protection, and Summon Golem to just conjure our own little Magibek tech companion. The rest of what we have we share with others, but we have things from all over the map. Divine, Arcane, even spells the others don't usually share, like Rope Trick and Sanctuary. Better yet, we can pick from that full list every time we prepare. One day I might mostly have Cleric spells, and the next be a mini Druid. We're pretty tanky for a spellcaster at 1d8 HP and medium armor and shields. Our saving throws are Intelligence and Constitution, so we keep our focus and wits about us even when we're taking a beating. We start with Thieves' Tools, Tinker's Tools, and an Artisan Tool of our choice. And that actually does matter for us. We use them as our spell focus, so we can cast with anything from a lockpick to a monkey wrench. And I wasn't kidding about that shotgun. We're proficient in firearms and simple weapons. There are a couple benefits that tend to go under the radar, like expertise in tools or adding intelligence to a check or save a few times a day, but one of my favorites is spell storing at level 11. You take a spell you know and put it into a weapon or focus. You don't need to use a spell slot or even have it prepared. And it has double your intelligence modifier and uses. With a good score, you double your spells per day, or just give your fighter scorching ray. Useful for combat, utility, even role-playing if you want to be manipulative. The barbarian might not trust goblins, but if she wants me to give her sword and large in the morning, she's gonna keep her mouth shut. Otherwise, the rogue's getting invisibility instead. I'm not usually that generous, I prefer to have more catapult, but depending on your magic item loadout, you might have the spare slots to make it worth it. And you will have a lot of magic items. Those and infusions are the big draw to the class. Infusions are basically magic items that we make and sustain with our own power. We can only have a few at a time, but summoning magic items through sheer will and wit is no joke. We can replicate a bunch of classic magic items, but we also have unique ones, like building a homunculus or arcane propulsion armor. Eventually, we even start building normal magic items in a fraction of the time and cheaper. And we're not limited by the normal three attuned items either. We get four, five, and eventually even six powerful items at a time. Not only that, but at level 14, we can just ignore requirements like class, race, level, spells known. Who cares if this is an ancient elven secret? It got cracked by a teenage goblin. And at level 20, if you manage to get there somehow, plus one to all saves per attuned item. And we can ditch an infused item to hit 1 HP instead of 0 when taking damage. We are the masters of artifact. But in order to get to that point, you need to pick a specialization. There are four, granting power at level 3, 5, 9, and 15. We'll start with mine, the alchemist. I'm probably supposed to be unbiased despite being one myself, but I tend to reflexively use catapult on anything with my boss's handwriting on it, so I guess we'll never know. Anyway, the Alchemist is a potion brewing extraordinaire. We're wonderful at brewing normal potions and get expertise in it, but even without our tools, we can craft our experimental elixir. We can make a few each day, depending on our level, and the effect is random. Restore HP, increase your AC or speed, let us fly, transform our body, or give a bonus to every attack and save for a minute. At level 9, they start giving temporary HP as well, and of course our potions can be used by anybody, so even stuff that doesn't seem incredibly useful on us, the barbarian or monk might love you for it. Now that's what we can do with our bare hands, but we'll usually have our tools because when used as a focus, we can add our intelligence modifier to healing or even damage, as long as it's acid, fire, poison, or necrotic. We can also use them to cast Nessa Restoration for free a few times a day starting at level 9. At level 15, you can do the same with Greater Restoration or Heal once a day, and we start resisting acid and poison, and we become immune to being poisoned. And don't forget, we have an expanded list of spells that's constantly growing and always prepared. We'll have the expected healing spells like Healing Word and Raise Dead, but also some offense like Flaming Spear and Blight. All of our specializations
organizations get their own spell list. There's also plenty of interesting twists you can do on this past me. What about a junk witch cobbling things together from scratch? A witch with ancient magic passed down from when the gods were young and needed packs to grow in power. Divine in nature, but no worship needed. And what about, oh I don't know, a chaotic cook who blurs the lines between food and potion? Doesn't know the difference between wolfsbane and basil? Don't forget yourself, Phoebe. Though to be fair, all of our subclasses are pretty cool. Speaking of which, our second specialization is alchemist. You don't need others, only alchemist. Just alchemist. Hit that like button and sub for more alchemist. The armorer is mainly focused and primarily gets a mix of blunt offense like shatter and battlefield defense like wall of force. It fits perfectly since your focus is on your amazing magical armor. In fact, you can turn any armor into arcane armor in a matter of seconds. Just have to have your smithing tool. When you're in your arcane armor, you can use the armor itself as a spell focus. You don't need to meet the armor's strength requirements. You can take it on or off as an action and it even replaces missing limbs. If you can't tell by the focus on armor, this one is meant for battle. You even get an extra attack at level 5. Not only that, but at level 9, you get to put different infusions on your head, legs, arm, and chest, basically turning this into a mech suit. On top of all that, you get two extra infusions if you put them on the armor, so you can kit yourself out while still helping your party. Which infusions you want, however, depends on the type of arcane armor you're wearing. There's two, Guardian and Infiltrator. They have a special ability and a special weapon, which use your intelligence modifier instead of your strength or dex. You can choose the type whenever you make the armor, but you can change it on a short rest. With Guardian type, you're going full focus on melee. You can get your level and temporary HP as a bonus action a few times a day, and you get the Thunder Gauntlet. These deal 1d8 thunder damage, count as dual wielding if you don't have a shield, and if you hit your target, they have disadvantage on attacks against anyone but you until your next turn. At level 15, your armor is perfected, and you can pull huge creatures 25 feet towards you as a reaction, and make an attack if that puts them next to you. I'd suggest using the Mind Sharpener infusion to auto-succeed failed constitution saves, but if you prefer a mix of melee and ranged, try the Infiltrator. 5 extra feet of movement, advantage on stealth checks, and you can put a lightning launcher in your hand or chest. 9300 range, about the same as a short bow. It only deals a d6 lightning damage, but you can make that 2d6 once per turn. And you decide after you hit. And the level 15 perfect upgrade is that anything you hit starts to glow, and has disadvantage when attacking you. And the next attack anyone makes against it has advantage. And if that advantage attack hits, they take an extra d6 of lightning damage. So yeah, pretty strong. Strong as my lungs were before I realized my mic output was at 20%, not 80. I had actually forgotten how I used to yell at the mic. Anyway, spice things up here with what the armor is. The class is a bunch of tiny creatures piloting a mech or even just a kobold operating at orc size. You could, however, be a warforged and the armor is your body, basically just rapidly reconstructing and modifying yourself. Go nature-themed with ironwood armor or the iron hide of a nature guardian. Make your spells be vines and lightning and clouds of fungal spores. Maybe you're a junkyard genius and cobbled it together with discarded toys and scrap from the dump. If you really want strength, you'll find your edge in resourcefulness. Of course, as strong as that is, if you're not wanting to be on the front line to begin with, I'd recommend Artillerist. They're exactly what they sound like, magic, fire, and a big boom. Your tool of choice is wood carving tools. Sample size of one, but if a wall of fire appeared behind me while someone ran at me with a ripsaw, I would be terrified. They can use those tools or smithing tools to craft their main weapon, the Eldritch Cannon. It only takes an action to make, and the first per day is free. You see, it only lasts an hour, and you can only have one, but you can restore it with a first level spell slot, and it is incredible value. You can make a flamethrower with 2d8 fire damage in a line, a ballista with 2d8 force damage and knockback, or a heal bot that gives out temporary HP to everyone you want within 10 feet, and it's just your bonus action to make it attack and move. At level 9, they deal more damage and can self-destruct, and at level 15, you can have two. And they start making magic shields that give everyone within 10 feet half cover. Oh yeah, and all of these are small or tiny. You can actually have a flamethrower in your pocket, or just riding on your shoulder. And while that's blasting away, you can use your level 5 arcane firearm for your own damage, because you still have your action. Now it's not a real gun, but it does add 1d8 of damage to all of your spells, which is why their entire extended spell list is walls and AoE spells. I mean, it just makes sense. You have a shrunken war machine, and this is basically just a shrunken war zone. But of course, that mech is how we're getting our flavor. It could be clockwork, or it could be natural. You've grown a wooden body that nature spirits inhabit. Make a tiny Baba Yaga hut, but it's a chicken coop with human legs and a gun. Maybe go more shrine priest, and you carry those spirits' protection and blessing through offerings. Or you could form a symbiotic relationship with another creature. You're carrying a powerful dragon egg who mentally controls a body you've designed for it. It's the ghost of an old friend or companion clinging to life to help protect you. You're basically just the amplifier and host for a bound deity, and this is its vessel. Now, we've mostly been covering offense, but not every artificer is focused on firepower. Some artificers are the alchemist. The battlesmith is 
is so different, it doesn't even start with an A. Which does make sense, as it is the only B in my heavily biased book. Have you loved everything you've heard so far, but thought there were just too few things to keep track of? You thought the artillerist had a good idea with that turret, but they didn't go far enough? Well, in that case, what is wrong with Do I have the subclass for you? The Battlesmith focuses on defense, mostly things like shield and aura of vitality, and they get martial weaponry. Even more important, they attack with their intelligence modifier instead of strength or dex. As long as the weapon is magic, given you're the make magic item class, I believe in you. You get extra attack at level 5, but the big deal for this class is the steel defender. You get a construct with decent bulk, force damage, and can give an adjacent enemy disadvantage as a reaction. It's medium too, so if you're small like me, you can ride it. It's healed through the mending cantrip, but if you need to, you can just build a new one over a long rest. You use your bonus action to command it, otherwise it can only dodge. Unless you're unconscious, then it does whatever it chooses. Wait, chooses? Did you make this thing sentient just to actively override its free will? Um, at level 9 you get a 2d6 heal with 30 foot range, your int modifier per day. Alternatively, you can add that 2d6 as force damage whenever you or your companion hit. That damage or HP doubles at level 15, and your defender gets more AC and starts doing damage when it gives disadvantage. The Battlesmith is a middle ground and can be a little awkward, but nobody else lets you ride a giant robot weasel, or penguin, or mocking recreation of your rival. There's nothing quite like riding into battle on them with googly eyes. Now you could have that possessed body theme I spoke of before, an even greater variety this time, but let's spice things up more. How about making someone who thinks they made a vessel for their loved one to possess, but it's empty. It's just a recreation, and through programming or willpower, it's just acting like them. Nothing but a violent sock puppet full of delusion to hide the pain. Or you could go full mechanic. I used to know this burnout greaser elf had that sort of live fast die young mentality, because apparently it all goes downhill after 300. Of course, instead of a motorcycle, he had a mechanical wyvern. And with that, in a shocking twist, we actually end this alphabetical list with B. You'll notice that puts us at the top of nearly every list, like we deserve. Fine, I'll cut the bias for a moment. The Artificer is about as complex as 5B gets on a player end, juggling items and infusions and magic. It's good for somebody who's played before, but can be tricky if it's your first time. Every subclass is specialized into one role, but we can be pretty good at nearly anything if you give us enough prep time. However, you do need to familiarize yourself with your options, or you might end up underwhelmed. If you put in the effort to learn what we can do, you'll find we have incredible versatility and plenty of unique tricks. It's my favorite class for a reason, and while I know it might not be for everyone, if it sounds fun and you know the system, I'm sure you'll have a blast. But if this doesn't sound like it'll quite scratch the itch or it's a little too complicated, I would suggest the Bard, the Forge Domain Cleric, or... Ugh, do I have to say it? Fine. The Wiz Alchemist. Try it anyway. And settle in class? Looks like you want to learn about the Barbarian. And I'm happy to whip that passion into something fierce. The Unbridled Warrior. The Brick House. Bigger, faster, and stronger too, the first member of our D&D crew. Most of their abilities revolve around hitting hard, hitting harder, and ignoring that they were hit. They're simple, but they're a solid foundation to build on. We'll start with mechanics, move into flavor and concept. Let's go! Barbarians have the highest HP, being the only class to roll a d12. That's compounded by their unarmored defense ability, which adds their dexterity modifier and their constitution modifier to their AC, as long as they aren't wearing armor. They can use the full list of weapons and get a bonus to checks and saves for strength and constitution, two stats whose limit they eventually break. They start with their primary feature, Rage. They enter a state of blinding emotion, getting advantage on strength checks and saves and a bonus to strength-based damage. They also take half damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, which is most weapons. Eventually, Rage will even let them drop to 1 HP instead of 0 when taking a big hit, as long as they pass a con save. You know, that stat that you have a bonus to, and eventually break the limit with? The stronger you get, the more times a day you can rage, eventually becoming unlimited at level 20. As they level, their senses hone, giving cool bonuses like advantage on dex saves from sources they can see, or ignoring surprise with raw anger, or rolling initiative with advantage. The rest of their abilities include hitting more times around, hitting harder and harder on a crit, moving faster, and increasing their chance to hit in exchange for being hit easier. At level 3, 6, 10, and 14, your subclass gives you even more power. I'll throw them on the board as we talk about them, but before we get into that, I'd like to take a look at what we have as a base. The Barbarian is an unbridled monster in melee, absorbing damage and hitting back hard. The class is wonderful if you just want to wade into battle bashing until one side dies. Not much variety in play compared to others, but that's not a bad thing. Sometimes you just want a basic warrior. That said, you can go complex if you want. There are plenty of ways you can take them character-wise, especially if your DM allows for a little reflavoring. Don't get me wrong, a brute full of primal fury with skin like iron works wonders here. I always respect the classic, but you rip off the flavor text and this is just someone who's good at dodging danger and has a superpower mode. There's all sorts of reasons this could happen, but they'll probably depend on your subclass. So let's go ahead and get into them, and I'll try to inspire you with flavor options, okay? 
We'll start with the Ancestral Guardian. Ancestral Guardians call on spirits when they rage, traditionally members of their family or clan. The spirits target whoever you hit first each turn, giving them disadvantage if they attack someone other than you, and giving that not you target resistance. At level 6, they can reduce damage to those you see within 30 feet, the amount increasing with your level, and eventually reflecting back to the attacker. At level 10, you can even ask your spirits a yes or no question about the future like you're casting Augury, or send one out to act as a scout a la clairvoyance. Once per short rest too, it's a pretty good recharge. A big weakness of frontliners in general is that there's nothing stopping an enemy from just ignoring them and going around. But the Ancestral Guardian says, you will not. I will protect my allies just as those who came before me and they're here to make sure of it. Personally, I'd make those spirits to be the true power of your rage. Instead of emotion, you're setting yourself aside so the spirits can guide your body. You could also turn that on its head though. Maybe these aren't your ancestors. You're a gravekeeper whose graveyard was destroyed and you took your tenants with you. Or make it divine, you made an ancient pact with a god of dueling who punishes those who ignore your challenge. Maybe it's not even an outside force. Your soul was fragmented by some horrific accident, and you send out shards to bolster your allies. No matter how you do it, the subclass is perfect for a defender. Now for a more offensive defense, we have the Battle Rager, or as the dwarves call it, the Axe Idiot. Traditionally, it's a religious thing for a dwarven war god, so technically it's restricted to dwarves, but most people ignore that since wearing spiked armor isn't exactly hard to figure out. Yep, that's the subclass. You can use a bonus action to whack people with your spikes for an extra d4 plus strength. You deal 3 damage when you grapple someone, and at level 14, close range attackers also take 3 damage. They'll eventually get their con modifier and temporary HP whenever they use Reckless Attack, and get to dash as a bonus action at 10. Okay, look, let's be real here. This is the only subclass whose official title insults you for picking it. I grade classes based on whether they achieve the goal they're selling. Would someone who picked this fulfill the dream they have for themselves? Almost every subclass on record gets at least a passing grade in my book, but for the person who wants to storm into battle as a whirling ball of death, I'm sorry, but this subclass might be worse than not picking one at all. Because remember, Unarmored defense relies on you being unarmored. I have to mention it, but I can't recommend it without a rework. I don't have alternate rage ideas specifically for the Battle Rager, so I'll take this opportunity to mention that your Barbarian can easily draw power from another emotional overflow. Maybe one who loves bloodshed, becoming so euphoric they don't notice the pain. Or you're bitter and depressed, able to keep going as long as you're sharing your suffering. Or maybe you love your team so much it blinds you to your pain, going full on power of friendship. Fury Beyond Fury definitely works, of course. I'm just saying there are other options. Of course, our next option, the Berserker probably won't use them, because they're the barbarianiest barbarian to ever barbarian. This is the barbarian willing to break their own body just to hurt you a little more, fully giving way to the mindless rage. You eventually gain immunity to being charmed and frightened while raging, can frighten your opponent as an action, and eventually get to use your reaction as a counterattack. And right from the start you get your frenzy, a special type of rage, getting an extra attack every round in exchange for a level of exhaustion at the end of your rage, which basically doubles your damage output at lower levels. Now I worded it like this to bring attention to a common common misconception. Frenzy is a special type of rage and it does not modify your basic rage. So while it does have a downside, you can easily save it for big battles and never have much of an issue. For someone who wants that extra boost when their back is to a wall, to howl with rage and go even further beyond, Berserker is a fine choice. Although this fits rage as anchor more than pretty much any subtype, I'd like to point out that this can easily be a state of thoughtless instinct. Fully in the zone, everything else fading away, moving without thought. You could have it be some sort of hidden technique where you take off your restraints and unlock your body's full power but damage it in the process. Have it be a state of hyper-awareness, or just fully giving in to your do-or-die survival mode, every unnecessary thought removed until the situation is over, then all that stress crashing down in a wave. Now if you want to truly descend into feral fury, the Beast Barbarian is the way to go. Maybe your mom was a druid, or you won a blessing at a satyr drinking contest, or Billy Bob the Astral Bullfrog decided to take a nap in you. Whatever your reason, you can draw on the power of the beast. Forget weapons, you can choose a natural weapon when you rage. A life-draining bite, a flurry of claws, or a tail with reach that lets you increase your AC as a reaction. And you'll want to get used to them, eventually getting hit by them can force a creature to either take psychic damage or attack your choice of their allies as your feral fury grows. Eventually you can even spread your power to the rest of your team, giving them bonus damage and yourself temporary HP. The Beast Barbarian even gets something outside of range. At level 6, you can modify your body to swim or climb or jump when you're taking a short rest. If what you're wanting is an animalistic rage, the Beast Barbarian is head of the pack. And they give so many examples of an origin for your rage, it's kinda hard to add to it. Probably cause they didn't make you choose which animal to emulate. Just keep it in theme and change as you go. Though I can imagine a Warforged not even needing to go with animals, using exposed gears for jaws, or ripping out some wires for a tail, or even a button to like and subscribe. Press please, K thanks. But I really do love that they made a sort of everything like and throw, because I know a lot of people want to be one.
We continue the theme of nature barbarians with the Storm Herald, this time bringing the fury of a literal storm and a swirling ten-foot aura whenever they rage. Not just lightning though, there are three different biomes to choose from. Desert burns everyone around them and can eventually retaliate with fire when hit. The sea calls down a lightning strike and can later knock creatures prone. Tundra barbarians give temporary HP to allies and eventually freeze creatures in place. You also gain resistance to your element at level 6, as well as some neat powers like setting things on fire, gaining a swim speed, and freezing water to ice. Eventually you can share your resistance with with allies as well, especially useful for the desert one. They don't really get to choose who takes that fire damage. You can change which one you are at level up if you're not really liking it, but you're mostly stuck with your decision. For the reflavoring, Demigod. We're part giant, dragon, monstrosity, basically a melee focused sorcerer. Maybe go even further, say your clan infuses you with an elemental at your coming of age ceremony or something. Assuming you're gonna pick one and stick with it at least, which I personally do, but I can understand changing it. I honestly don't have much for this one. It has a lot of variety on its own, but it's pretty clear cut with what you can do with it. You're an embodiment of nature's power, a literal weather person. You probably knew if you wanted to go this route just by the title. Actually, in a similar vein we have the Totem Warrior, but instead of weather we have animals. Again. This time instead of shifting halfway like a lycanthrope, you just channel the abilities of different animals. You can use beast sense and speak with animals as a ritual, as well as commune with nature later. But that's not why you're really here. At level 3, 6, and 14 you can choose between powers based on the bear, eagle, elk, tiger, and wolf. You can mix and match these, which people forget, but I am not listing all 16. 60% of you have already wandered off, I'll just list them on the board, okay? Every set has at least a few really good ones, like giving allies advantage when whacking enemies next to you to simulate pack tactics, or the eagle letting you fly a little, or the bear letting you resist almost all types of damage. This is a good example of how you can approach a similar subject in multiple ways. Overlapping subclass ideas don't necessarily step on each other's toes. My main question is why they have to be those specific animals. Trick question, they don't, or at least they shouldn't. I say to go wild with it. The bear is a warthog, the tiger is a frog, the wolf is a peacock since apparently they get pack tactics? And why leave it there? Give me the wings of a griffin or the charge of a minotaur, the endurance of a demon or an elemental. Make one for a group of people. Make one for a specific people. Who's gonna stop me? I'm bad with power. Sorry, you went a little wild there. Speaking of how to control, wild magic. I used to flavor the barbarian as a sorcerer whose magic went inward to enhance their bodies instead of outward to cast their spells. The wild magic is that concept improved. Whether it's an unrefined bloodline power or they just spent too much time with a fae, these barbarians are surging with raw magical might. Whenever they rage, one of eight beneficial effects happen at random, and these are actually all helpful. Life drain, teleport, summon exploding fey, make your weapon magic, hurt people who hit you, give allies an AC bonus, make the area around you difficult terrain, or hurt and blind people. Later on you can reroll whenever you hit or fail a save, and eventually you roll twice and choose whichever you want. You can also give people a once per turn D3 bonus to any attack or ability check for 10 minutes, or restore a caster's low level spell slot. It's all that zany fun of wild magic without the potentially annoying teammates. And you still have the bulk and power of the barbarian in case you don't get what you want. You can't really reflavor this outside of maybe worshipping a chaos deity, but this subclass flavors itself. If you're wanting to roll with the punches as you dish out your own, wild magic is perfect. Okay, one left, but you probably already know if you want the zealot. They're exactly what they sound like, a barbarian with a cause. They aren't just raging, they have hit a cult-like fervor that would make a paladin worried. And it is divine. Whenever they rage, they do additional necrotic or radiant damage on their first hit per turn. And while others consider dying for the cause to be the ultimate sacrifice, to the zealot, that's the starting line. Because revival spells don't need material components if cast on them. You don't need hundreds in diamond dust. A god already marked them with a get out of death free card. Eventually, death starts struggling to hold them at all staying conscious even when they're at zero and rolling death saves. And if they die, they keep fighting anyway until the rage is over, and will even stay alive if they're healed before they stop. They're pitching such a fit that even death doesn't want them. Honestly, working in customer service, can't blame them. Once per rage, they can reroll a failed saving throw, and even get a battle cry at level 10 that gives your allies advantage on attack rolls and saving throws for a round. The zealot is devotion incarnate. If that sounds good to you, I highly recommend. Honestly, you don't really need to recontextualize this one, as being marked by a god or faith has as much variety as there are faiths to choose, but I'd like to throw out the idea of an eternal holy warrior. Whenever the temple or world is threatened, the clerics will run to the mausoleum, bringing the honored heroes of old to return to their sworn duties. Perhaps you're just that, thousands of years old, risen to rid the land of evil before returning to your tomb, then killed once again to feast with your god until your surface is needed again. And maybe that's why you're level 1 again. You got rusty in the afterlife and started losing abilities. Anyway, believe it or not, Zella is the last alphabetically. The barbarian is a wonderful class that proves how much variety you can have with a simple trope of strong person what hits stuff. And there's plenty more variation just by swapping in different species or feats. I know every dwarf and orc at least considers it, but anyone can be a barbarian. A halfling that's always upset it's not mealtime. Or a gnome working out bits of frustration over their latest invention not working right. Or a goblin in 
Maestro Guardian who bites your ankles and runs out of reach. The ability doesn't end just because he ran away. Have fun with the Spirit of Goblins past, nerd. But I think that's enough of that. Hopefully one of these have piqued your interest, but if not, there's 12 other classes to choose from. I'd recommend looking into Fighter or Ranger if this didn't quite scratch the itch. The Roaming Performer, the Dashing Socialite, the Jack of All Trades, and Master of... Well, honestly, they do often master something. That's the power of the Bard. You have tons of options, supporting everyone and being at least functional in most roles. The subclass you pick at level 3, known as a college, either makes you more versatile or gives you a role to excel at. To further delve into this, we'll start with mechanics that move to flavor and concept. Let's go! Bards have a decent HP with a D8 per level, and getting light armor is pretty good for a spellcaster. They can use simple weapons and a few martial weapons like the longsword. They're proficient in dexterity, charisma, and three skills of their choice. That's good, but it gets better. Your Jack of All Trades ability lets you add half your proficiency to the rest of your skills. And fun fact, that includes initiative. That leaves you with no real weak spot on skills. And plenty of strengths too, because at 3rd and 10th level you get expertise, which lets you double your proficiency bonus on two skills. It makes the bard as overall skilled as they come. Now your level 6 ability, Counter Charm, is barely specialized, giving your allies advantage against fear and charm effects, but everything else follows that generally good and better as you level mold. Your Song of Rest lets you heal more in a short rest, Magical Secrets lets you grab spells from other classes, and their claim to fame of Bardic Inspiration. Not to be confused with the inspiration your DM gives you, Bardic Inspiration lets you give others a bonus die to add to a save, check, or attack of their choice. At first you get a few of these per day, but at level 5 you're filled on a short rest and the number's always growing. Jumping back to that part about stealing spells, the Bard is a full spellcaster, getting access to all levels of spells. Their list of options focuses on crowd control and support, especially enchantment. They even have an exclusive heal at level 9 in Power Word Heal, and three special enchantment spells. Compulsion lets you control enemy movement, Dissonant Whispers damages and scares, and Vicious Mockery is the one you're here for. You can use it infinitely, give the target disadvantage on their next attack, and you're physically hurting them with an insult. Killing someone with sass is something I can only dream of. That's honestly what a bard is to most people. A witty performer. They start with three instruments of their choice, they can use their instrument as a spellcasting focus, and many of their abilities make you perform while you're doing them. I just didn't mention it because no matter how much the handbook harps on, it's not actually required. Sure, they can use it as a spellcasting focus, or they can just use a component pouch. And while the flavor text rambles about a flute or whatever, the only actual restriction is that a few of the effects require some sort of sound in the show. Sing, whistle, ignore the music entirely. Variety is the spice of life, and most DMs are happy to let you reflavor, as long as you aren't changing how it actually functions. Speaking of changing how we function, at level 3, 6, and 14 you get unique college powers. I'll write them on the board as we go to keep track of them, and try to give you some ideas on how to reflavor things. In the beginning, we have creation, and try not to get a god complex as you literally speak things into being, glowing and humming with song. You start out with objects medium size or smaller, but your limit grows as you level. There is a limit on the gold price of each item, but it starts off big and gets removed at level 14, when you can start making multiple things at once. At level 6, you can start to animate objects with animating performance, making some oddly tough minions from anything around you. And again, don't get a god complex when you start breathing life into your figurines. Every bard gets a buff to their inspiration or a new way to use it. In this case, we get extra effects depending on how your ally uses it. Area damage if they use it while attacking, temporary HP if they use it on a save, or rolling the inspiration twice and using the high roll if it's for a check. It's interesting and decent, but not as thematic. Point still stands though, this bard is mastering the magic which gods use to create the world, and using it to form your own if only temporarily. They always have the right tool for the job, and augment their control of the battlefield with a minion. If any of that intrigues you, I highly recommend the creation bard. Honestly, it's one of my favorites. You can be anything from a sage with the words of a god to a busybody mom humming a tune as she whips up breakfast for the party, treating the whole adventure as a family road trip, be a painter showing the world the wonders of imagination. There has to be sound in the performance for most abilities, which does prevent a mime, but not a clown. For all the bad rep they get, they're just another iteration of a traveling entertainer with wit and slapstick. And speaking of wit, eloquence. The eloquence bard is a common pick because it's basically just bard plus. You can use your inspiration on enemies to lower their saving throw, and later your allies can keep their inspiration if they used it and failed anyway. And by the end, you can make the inspiration jump to someone else if they used it and succeeded. Most of their abilities are inspiration focused, but they also start off treating any 9 or lower on a deception or persuasion check as a 10. Throw on expertise and good luck failing. It's made even more useful at level 6, where you can magically make creatures understand you once a day. Eloquence is one of the two subclasses that just focuses on taking what you love about bards and doubling down, in this case on persuasion and inspiration. If that's what you love about bards, then you'll love this one. It covers pretty much anyone who focuses on speech, like a politician or a con artist or a negotiator. Since person who talks good can basically be anything already, I'd like to take a moment to defend the power of talking. Your mileage will vary on anything charisma based, depends on the DM and the campaign, but it's not just for intrigue focused adventures. Remember, to the average town, you're a group of strangers who stomped out of the woods armed to the teeth asking if anyone wants to pay them to kill, and depending on the party, dragging who knows how many monsters or curses around. Someone good at talking can be vital to your survival, especially if your savior act has unintended consequences, or your party tends to anger people. It's still very subject 
to your party playstyle, and thankfully the inspiration manipulation is good by itself, but don't write off the power of talking, even if your party is combat focused. But if skill's not enough for the situation, you can use College of Glamour for manipulation, by which I mean enchantment. Glamour focuses on charm and appearance, especially the appearance part. Using most of these gives you a vague, wondrous appearance. Whatever that means. For instance, you can burn a charge of inspiration to adopt that wondrous look and make your allies gain temporary HP and move on your turn. This works even if they can't see you, so I don't get the point of the Fey eyeliner other than getting attention, I guess. That is the point of most of their abilities. At level 6, they can adopt the appearance and just cast command at will. Foes can try to resist, but only if they aren't already charmed. And you can use your third level ability to charm quite a few people at once, though they do have to watch you dance with sexy fairy magic for a minute, so it's useful but situational. The last thing you get is Unspeakable Majesty, a humbly named ability that can force foes to attack somebody else. Which is good for you, I guess, but they're just gonna punch the wizard instead. And granted, I'm not opposed to that. It's just kind of rude. If you're out here trying to be the flashiest part around, or just focus on fave redirection, point your attention to Glamour. It's not hard, they are trying to force you. After all, they're magicians, dancers, actors. Maybe your world has studios with different rooms to scry in at certain times for entertainment, and you are a game show host looking for new material. Or, and follow me here, maybe we think about a different type of attention-hungry performer. One who's a little less professional. The kind that would put themselves into a dangerous situation just for a later story time. Come on, you know you could draw a crowd with I got attacked by a cult of forbidden knowledge? 3am not bait featuring the wizard. And that's why your adventures keep getting bigger and more deadly. You gotta keep people coming back, so hit that like and sub button and tell me some music artists you've been listening to lately. Comments are great for the youth. For a more traditional storyteller, try College of Lore. They're the kind that actually go to college. Even more addicted to telling stories, but their own tale is often just a byproduct of finding and spreading someone else's. This level of learning comes out by gaining three extra skill proficiencies, with their last ability letting them use inspiration on themselves during skill checks. Right from the start, however, they can use their inspiration charges to rattle enemies, subtracting the roll from the check, attack, or damage roll. This one is the other bard plus, because at level 6 you get another magical secrets, letting you learn even more spells from other classes. This makes them even more customizable, and you'd be surprised how different one can feel just from adding revivify and wall of sand, or fireball and fly, and especially not having to wait to level 10. It gives you a chance to lean even further into your theme, or just shore up some weaknesses. Lore Bard is a wonderful choice if you want to crank that basic bard to its limit, and you can go basically any direction with them, but I personally recommend going against the bard stereotype, nor bards as professors, or researchers, or archaeologists. Ones who aren't here for the glitz and glamour, they're after the legend and knowledge itself. The wizard doesn't have to be the only educated caster, and the ones who are pushing the limit of a field are rarely in the spotlight. It just can't reach the cave they're in searching for an ancient legend, though a more direct way of learning an ancient tale is to just ask the people involved. The spirit bard is an occultist drawing on the power of the dead to bolster the living. Instead of an instrument, you can use all the classic tropes like crystal balls and cards and skulls as a focus, and eventually they add a d6 to the damage or healing of your spell when you do. You also get the guidance cantrip for free, with its range extended to 60 feet, calling on spirits for help. At level 6, your friends can help you channel, letting you temporarily learn a divination or necromancy spell from the ghost you summon. You can even grab spells from the other classes with this, with the spell level available depending on the amount of people helping. And I just have to say that I love how it includes the whole party. I understand why some people hate it, but I love it when the party is interdependent, and the theming is top tier. But you might be wondering where the inspiration ability is. Well, that would be a random chart of stories, each giving you cool effects like fire breath or everyone can teleport. You roll your inspiration dice to see what ghost pops up to tell you its tale, and until your next short rest you have that effect on hand. It's random, but you'll always find a use for most of these effects, and eventually you roll twice and take the better result. If the spirit bard's ghost whispering hasn't drawn you in already, I don't know what to tell you. I love how this one breaks the mold by encouraging you to ditch the loot, and you can make your performances from your base abilities all kinds of occult or esoteric things. But hear me out for a second. A puppet show with your spirits moving them or helping do the voices, or maybe use your candle to do shadow puppets on the wall. Look, I fully support you leaning into the spooky, scary, serious stuff. I just doubt you need to be told how when you're clutching a skull and calling up the dead. But if your campaign is more lighthearted, you can always go as something like a camp counselor telling tall tales, or an author bringing the characters and their head to life. I don't have a good transition to the next two. Swords and Valor are two melee focused parts, with Sword appearing to be a response to the College of Valor. Both have an extra attack at level 6 and proficiency with medium armor. The Sword Bard lets you specifically use scimitars, chooses to focus on single or dual wielding for bonus damage, and can use their weapon as a spell focus. For their inspiration modification, they can do a variety of special maneuvers. They either gain temporary AC, push the opponent, or deal damage to an adjacent target. They can eventually do a weak form of this without spending inspiration. They're meant to be a bard that focuses on martial 
offense. But despite their maneuvers being called a blade flourish, they don't actually require a blade. The sword part is actually better when they start with their bow, then act as a secondary line of defense or tagging in when the front line needs a breather. This sort of self-sufficient savant was apparently more in line with what people were wanting, as it seems to be a direct response to the Valor Bard. The Valor Bard attempts to be more of a warrior poet. While Sword is fully focused on offense and themselves, the Valor Bard keeps it simple. They use shields and any weapon, anyone who uses your inspiration can add it to their AC or damage, and at level 14 they can attack as a bonus action whenever they cast a spell. Simple, but effective, especially that inspiration mutation, which is a lesser version of the shield spell that you can give to an ally. This one is meant to be a more defensive and utility-based counterpart. You're still not going to be the main damage sponge, but you can hold your own as a backup, and being backup for everyone at once is part of a bard's main appeal. Plugging every hole that needs filling is kind of their thing. And don't forget that you've still got a better bow and full casting, so if you're looking for an offensive, more self-sufficient bard, Sword is your answer. If you're looking to keep your support focused but just add some mainly to the mix, Valor might be for you. Now both of these will likely have their hands too full of weaponry for an instrument, but their performance just has to have sound and movement. You could be a tap dancer swinging a sword instead of a cane, or a pole dancer that ripped the pole out of the ground to beat people with, or even a cheerleader because they are way more buff than you think. High level dance requires strength, awareness, and balance, which can make the transition to combat surprisingly smooth, unlike the transition to College of Whispers. But I adore this one, so hear me out. They essentially get a psychic smite, starting with 2d6 but eventually growing to 8d6 of a very rare type of damage. And it's a good thing you get that damage burst too, as your level 6 ability lets you steal someone's shadow as they die and keep it on you. You can use it to turn into the person, and unlike other disguises, this gives you any knowledge they would tell an acquaintance. So not only can you learn the area or the basic life, but you get a bonus to passing yourself off as them because you know about them. Unfortunately, you do need a short rest to refresh it, much like your third level ability, forcing a creature you've talked to for a minute to make a save. If they fail, they're frightened of you or someone else of your choice for an hour. And better yet, if your attempt fails, they don't know you did anything. A lot of mind-affecting spells alert the target that you tried something, but this one doesn't. And your last ability is similar, this time taking an action and charming them for eight hours. They offer you any favors or gifts they would a close friend, obey you as long as they aren't at risk of injury, and only break the effect if you attack them or cast something else on them. And after that eight hours, they forget why they were afraid of you. They don't remember that you can charm them. If they're still useful, just come back tomorrow and do it again. This is one of the best charm effects. Period. Of course, that is the issue. It's a charm, and everything is based on manipulation, which I adore, but it makes the whispers a bit more situational. Specialized for a bard is still more generalist than most, and you still have a giant array of spells and skill, but depending on your group, you might find the psychic burst damage to be the only consistent part. If you don't care and just want to be a social menace, Whisper is great. Go full-on assassin, infiltrating alongside the rogue with a party at your heels. Obviously, spies work wonders here, but I love the idea of running one who isn't actually trying to scare people. He just have a really intense expression, or you can ignore the politics and just have them revel in causing fear. Though honestly, I love the reverse, like a genuinely kind little traveling merchant, struggling because she keeps accidentally using her terror abilities whenever she gets excited. And this is how the list ends, not with a bang, but a whisper. If any of these interested you, a little word of advice. Find a way to indicate that people have inspiration. If you're in person, this could be a set of cheap T6s, or candy that they're not allowed to eat until they use it, or just some household item. After all, the biggest downside to inspiration is that people just forget get they have it. If you're doing this online, talk with your DM. Most VTT programs have some sort of indicator or icon that you can snap on their picture as a reminder. And if Bard sounds cool but you're not sure this is for you, I'd suggest taking a look at the Rogue or Sorcerer next. Oh, but the classes will be quick. You can probably do them in a week. Not like the Cleric is next or anything. <laughs> Great, um, settle in class. Today we'll be talking about the cleric. The ones who picked a god and prayed, then got untold magical blessings and a personal connection. Are you ready for a miracle? Cause gods know I'm gonna need one for this. Let's go. There are 14 types of clerics put into subclasses called domains. Those domains are important. They basically are the class. You get to choose at level one for a reason. But before we get into what divides them, let's figure out what they have in common. They're a divinely mandated magic user. And that's it thematically. The deity in question could give power to a non-believer or an enemy or random chicken, while the figurehead of the church remains mundane. Not how it would normally go, but it can happen, assuming there's even a deity involved. According to Xanathar, it could come from a personal philosophy or a vague concept like being chaotic good. It does include healing magic though, both before and after the patient dies. They're among the best at it, the default, but they don't have to be a healer. There are plenty of other varieties, with battlefield control and buffing and even solid damage spells. They also have more exclusive spells in their cantrip section alone than most have in their entire list. And much 
Watch what's left is exclusive to them and the Paladin or Artificer, Giant Variety, and all 14 of their domains get a set of 10 prepared automatically, potentially even ones they don't normally get. Don't assume anything about a cleric, there are too many ways they can turn out, or even that the same cleric can turn out, because they choose from every spell available when they prepare, so they can completely change how they work overnight. While they may be magic focused and only get simple weapons, they can take a hit pretty well. DA HP and proficiency with medium armor and shields, which is pretty good for a caster. They're proficient with wisdom and charisma, perfect for a priest, but again, you don't need to be one. At level 2, you get something called Channel Divinity. The universal version is called Turn Undead and lets you make undead run away. Starting at once per day, but eventually becoming 3 a day, you get an additional way to use those charges depending on your domain. And starting at level 5, it immediately destroys weak undead. At first, we're talking things like shadows or zombies, but by the end, we're looking at Banshee. Useful for carving up a horde of minions, but pretty situational to say the least, which is why I'll be bringing up an extra version of it with every subclass, which we can now talk about. Yeah, that's basically all they get as a class. The spellcasting and channel just get stronger over time. Well, that and divine intervention at level 10. Pray to your god, your level is the percent chance that they'll care. If they do care, a cleric spell of the DM's choice is cast and you lose this ability for a week. If they don't, you can try again tomorrow. At level 20 it always works, but you do still have to wait. Yay! The meat of this class is the domain abilities gained at levels 1, 2, 6, 8, and 17. The cleric has the most kinds of all classes, as I'm sure you can see by the video length. So let's get cracking. We start off strong with Arcana. Worshippers of knowledge and power, they're the divine version of the wizard. Their spell selection is taken straight from that list, with some great support options like Dispel Magic and Arcane Eye. You also get Arcana proficiency and take two cantrips from the wizard's giant list. I would personally go for utility like Mind Sliver or Prestidigitation, but no shame in grabbing Firebolt for things that resist your sacred flame. Though to be honest, you probably don't need it. Your channel divinity is basically turn undead for anything that resists your radiant damage. Arcane Abjuration. You can turn a Fey, Fiend, Celestial, or Elemental. And at level 5, you can banish them back to their home plane for a minute too. The CR of what's affected increasing like turn undead. So you basically take the one ability and make it affect 5 times as much. Phenomenal. At level 6, you can remove a spell effect when you heal someone. Works great with things like Healing Word. At level 8, you add your Wisdom modifier to Cantrip damage. Pretty cool if you've grabbed an AoE like Acid Splash. And at level 17, huge gap, I know, you get a Wizard spell of level 6, 7, 8, and 9. Automatically prepared. Totally worth the wait. And thematic too. These are your scholars, your priests of arcane knowledge, those who consider magic itself to be divine. For inspiration, I would ditch the whole keepers of sacred text thing and dig deep into mad scientist tropes, adventuring for more test subjects, and to learn untold secrets of a bygone age. Or be a bookworm, meek but wanting to travel to collect more books. Maybe you have a special interest you're adventuring to learn more about, or you discovered a fragment of a secret long ago and you're trying to find the rest of it. Make sure to get with your DM if you go that route. I'm sure them love the free plot hook with easy resolution. Speaking of the dungeon master, if you bonk them on the head and take their guide, you can get the death domain. They're mainly meant to be a head cultist or such, but they're fine to use normally. They've got a great offensive suite of spells like Blight and Cloud Kill. They've also got proficiency with martial weapons and can grab a necromancy cantrip off any list. I would suggest Chill Touch, mainly because if there's two enemies in range and they're next to each other, you can attack them both with the same necromancy cantrip. Situational, but really useful, and especially at level 17, when that applies to all single target spells, fifth level or lower. Double Blight is wild if you can pull it off. Their channel divinity is a burst of necrotic damage, 5 plus twice your level. It's not bad, but not really great for the cost. On the bright side, level 6 lets you ignore resistance to necrotic damage, and at level 8, you can do your best Joe Cat impression and do the spooky slice, adding necrotic damage to your weapon once per turn. All in all, this is a cleric with a clear focus on dealing damage. You can play this straight and go full edgy. Your abilities are all named things like inescapable destruction after all, but you don't have to go that route. They're concerned with death, but you could focus on the doctor angle, taking and giving life on a whim, giving them a god complex or simple morbid curiosity, a doctor who's long lost their medical license, bringing back the dead and making their teammates question if they can really trust their magic. You can go with a mortician or a grave tender, bringing back those that they tend to and adding to their ranks. But if you're wanting the spooky flavor without all the undeath, or you're just looking for a more defensive support, I would suggest the grave domain. While death is focused on causing death and undeath, grave is focused on making sure the dead stay that way. Played straight, these are your vampire hunters, ghost detectives, and grave tenders. You can even detect the undead a few times a day. Their spells are mostly defensive, like Death Ward, but you also get magic to reverse death like Revivify. Furthering that theme, you get Spare the Dying for free and can cast it at a range of 60 feet. Even better, when someone's at 0 HP, you automatically do max healing. That means that sometimes it's a legitimately good strategy to beat your teammate unconscious with a shovel before you heal him. Ah, catharsis. And speaking of attacking, your channel divinity curses a target, making them vulnerable to the next attack. Combine that with a big spell or 
Ice Might, and you can shred a boss, which combos well with your level 17 ability, letting you heal an ally when someone dies. The more hit dice they had, the stronger the heal. At level 6, you turn an enemy crit into a normal hit a few times a day, and at level 8, you add your Wisdom modifier to damage, just like the Arcana domain. You're gonna see that a lot. It's basic, but solid. We basically got a combat medic. They're not here to make you fine and dandy, they're here to keep you alive. It's a small but vital distinction. Now you can play this as a gravekeeper, of course, trying to keep you alive to avoid more paperwork. And again, the unethical doctor works great, especially when you're beating a teammate unconscious for that better heal, of course. Not at all revenge for constantly yelling medic while building a turret on the back line. You could also go a more taskmaster or commander route. You can die when I say you can die. Get up, you have more work to do. Wait, that means you could be that manager. You know the one, the guy who would call you at the hospital to see if you can come in tomorrow. Because yeah, you're on med leave for surgery and like you told me two months ago, but I forgot and scheduled you anyway. I thought you were a team player. Except this one's actually ripping your cop and open to bring you back. Okay, wow, forget about death. I think this one might be the evil one. Um, anyway, we move from the weaknesses of flesh to the strength and certainty of the forge. Their given spells are mostly from other classes, based on the creation and manipulation of items, and also fire. Plenty of fire. You get heavy armor proficiency and smithing tools, so plate mail time. You can also turn one armor or weapon into a plus one magic version whenever you wake for the day. Pretty great for level one. And at level two for your channel divinity, you can make anything you want that's a hundred gold or less, as long as even part of it is metal. Just plonk down the cash in a circle and you can have it in an hour. Better yet, you can also just use scrap metal as long as it's worth enough or you make up the difference with money. Just dump everything metal you don't want to carry in a circle and turn it into a bar of gold or mithril or something. And it doesn't say how big of an area your laid out items count in, so just dump all the furniture and loose gear in a pile and leave no loot behind. Maybe I'm just biased being an artificer, but this is easily my favorite version of Channel Divinity. At level 6, you resist fire and get plus 1 AC from heavy armor. That turns to fire immunity at level 17, with resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing attacks while in heavy Heavy armor, and your level 8 is dealing extra fire damage with weapon attack once per turn. Just like the Death Cleric, this is your other trend for level 8. You're either dealing your Wisdom Mod on cantrips or thematic damage on your weapon. Depends on how much they expect you to be in melee, which you probably will be as a Forge Cleric. That heavy armor lets you be on the front line, dealing damage and throwing out utility and control magic. Now of course the Angry Blacksmith is going to be the go-to for this class, especially for Dwarves, but might I interest you in a Clockmaker? Or a Silversmith? A Jeweler? Anyone who deals with metal works fine in this class. Make a flamboyant artist who smelts down every layer, turning rusted metal and torture implements into sculptures to beautify the world and mark your deeds. An environmentalist could turn weapons of war into habitats, or be an armorer who knows how to use their product. And yeah, the devotion to metal crafting is pretty inherent, but most professions use metal. If nothing else, they're gonna need someone for maintenance, and that knowledge for upkeep and repair can make them a forge cleric. Knowledge in general, however, would make them a knowledge cleric. Basically, the more mundane version of an arcana cleric, they just care about truth, true to their added magic, which is all about getting or hiding info, from identify to non detection. You also learn two languages, choose two from a list of knowledge-based skills, and add double proficiency to those skills. For your channel, you can give yourself proficiency with a tool or skill for 10 minutes, and if that's not enough for you, at level 6 you get another version that lets you try to read a creature's mind and give it a suggestion. Level 8 is going to be exactly what you expect. Add wisdom to your cantrip damage. The pattern holds. However, this class does have one wild card. You're really going to want to know your DM, or at least have a talk with them. Your added spells are mostly divination, which is notoriously up to DM interpretation for their usefulness. And at level 17, you take a few minutes to meditate on the past. You gain important information on the previous owners of an item you're holding, or the area that you're in. Now I know that might sound situational at best, but it actually only goes back a couple days, so it's even worse. At least it's thematic, you are learning about the past, and these clerics are all about that learning, considering knowledge itself to be divine. Everything from librarians, to teachers, to keepers of an ancient tome. I suggest digging deep into the tropes of anyone who cares about truth for its own sake. An archaeologist, scientist, really just how most experts are actually like. Peel back all your notions of academia. Most of them are rapidly fixated on understanding their field to the core. Too focused to notice how reporters are twisting their words and their findings until it's too late. Is your character the type to be strung out on coffee in three days without sleep because they just have to figure out what's going on with this beetle inscription? Are they a noble who spent their fortune on expeditions, their estate only used as a library? Because that is the adventuring knowledge cleric. Someone who wants to know more than the DM themselves, just for the sake of knowing. And you can do that too, with my totally unbiased channel.
channel. Hit that sub button. New video whenever I make a video. And that's a goblin guarantee. But now it's time for the most famous cleric, the best healer, the knife domain. You want to prevent damage? You bet your bottom dollar you can. All of your bonus spells are preventing and undoing damage. Plus you get heavy armor proficiency. Oh, you want healing? You know we got that healing. And back to you heal extra. Add two plus spell level to all your healing spells. Not only that, but at level six, you get that extra healing on yourself as well. And if that's still not enough for you, that same channeling that could repel the undead can heal for five times your level instead. And you can split that healing among anyone within 30 feet. You just can't heal in past half. But wait, there's more. At level 17, you don't roll for healing spells anymore. You just always heal maximum. The only thing they get that isn't healing or preventing damage is their level eight extra radiant damage on weapon attacks. Look, if you chose knife, you knew what you were signing up for. It's entirely healing based. The best healer around. Rare to get something with such a focused theme. The only surprising bit they have is the armor. Most of the flavor is going to be coming from your personality. Why and how you're healing. You could be the classic centaur for disease control or really just play into your race in general and how your culture does healing. A goblin frantically dancing and yelling to attract our god's attention. Or a jaded human handing out medical waivers. Or an elf singing a solemn hymn to remind their god that if they lose, someone might think they aren't superior. Your revival spells are also necromancy, so you can just take that a step further. Play into the whole life manipulation theme as some sort of unnatural subversion of nature. Honestly though, I just play it straight. Double down on that whole light in the darkness and hope to the hopeless angle. Well, metaphorical light. If you want actual light, that's a completely different domain. I mean, technically they're also like truth and renewal and stuff, but their spells are almost entirely arson based. They do also get the night can trip, and a few times a day they can turn themselves into a flashbang. Give disadvantage to an attacker by flashing light in their eyes. And at level 6, you can even do this when people attack your friends. Though I'm not sure why it took 5 levels to figure that one out. For a more potent version, use your channel divinity to cut through magical darkness and deal radiant damage to enemies around you. And to really double down on that anything within 30 feet must die energy? At level 17, you can start emitting bright light. Anything in that light has disadvantage against fire or radiant damage, especially potent because the pattern holds true. And given that the cleric's exclusive spell list includes both radiant damage cantrips, you're probably gonna have that. Between the radiant damage and your focus on killing it with fire, there's honestly very little that resists you. It does make sense, I mean you're probably channeling the sun itself. You're the only cleric who can answer disbelief with God's right there. She'll blind you if you look at her and gave me fireball. But while praise the sun is a very valid option, of of course. There's a lot of things that emit light and heat. An old prospector that worships explosives. A cultist worshipping a volcano. It did mention renewal, so maybe you're a triton that worships those immortal bioluminescent jellyfish. You know, the ones that revert to polyp stage when they're starving or hurt, then mature back into adults when the coast is clear? Get creative with it. Speaking of jellyfish though, next up is nature. You may be thinking, wait a second, they get their power from reverence to nature gods? So do half the druids. What makes this different? Well, you know how some people will get so into a YouTuber or a streamer that they start start caring more about them than the hobby? Yeah, that's the nature cleric. The druid is there for the forest, and they might see the god as an ally or a co-worker, but if push comes to shove, they're gonna choose the forest. Meanwhile, the cleric might love their lake, but they're really just here to champion their green goddess. They get a bunch of animal and plant themed spells, their choice of druid cantrip, and some nature themed skills. They can also wear plate mail. When channeling their god at level 2, they can charm animals and plants within 30 feet. You can't control them though unless you're level 17. They're just charmed and friendly to you. At level 6, you can use your reaction to give resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder. And at level 8, they kind of break the mold. They still get the deal extra damage of a type ability, but this time you choose between cold, fire, or lightning damage every time you use it. That's honestly really useful. Very few things resist all three. Mostly just beans, and you don't run into those too often. If you're trying to play a nature-loving mage and don't want to shapeshift, nature is pretty good. You get cool if sometimes situational utility. Now, of course, I'm going to suggest you play a cleric of Old Man Oak like he's an obsessed Critical Role fan, or a priest of the Mother Guardian of Grove, acting like she's a Twitch streamer he's trying to protect the honor of, treating prayers like donations and gift subs. I don't know about you, but I find that hilarious. I would also suggest making a veterinarian or a rep from the local animal rehab. You can make a pretty interesting character by focusing on natural healing. I mean with plants and divine magic, of course. Though I guess you could make one with salt lamps and healing crystals that actually work. Now, I'm sure there's a good natural order segue in here somewhere, but for the life of me, I cannot find it. So instead, we get a blunt transition to the order domain. Your order cleric is lawful incarnate. I don't even mean that in the alignment way. They are literally just law. Follow the rules, the methods, the recipe, because that is the law. It's what keeps us whole in this chaotic universe. The means justifying the ends somehow. Your spells are themed around restraint and control, your abilities are based around barking orders, and you receive proficiency in intimidation or persuasion. Whenever you cast a spell on an ally, you can command them to attack a particular enemy, and they can follow your order as a reaction. Your channel at 2 lets you try and charm everyone within 30 feet, and order them to drop their weapon as you do. At level 6, you get even better at force compliance, and can cast leveled enchantment spells as a bonus action instead of an action. 
Pokemon. Your level 8 ability is the Take Extra Damage type, this time with Psychic Damage, which is pretty rarely resisted. And at level 17, if an ally hits that same target before the start of your next turn, they take that Psychic Damage a second time. So the obvious character to make is a loving and peaceful one. They're just trying to get along with everyone, and they're just so hard to resist because they're cute. And uh, yeah, that's all I got for Subversion. I have ideas that kind of work, but the Force Compliance and Mind Control kind of nip them in the bud. There's only so many orderly ways I can go with that. Maybe like an overbearing teacher or a boss? But honestly, this one knows exactly what it wants to be and heavily resists stepping out of line. Which is kind of fitting. This is a cop, a drill sergeant, a priest of a dictatorial cult or fascist regime. Everyone from the well-intentioned caretaker who's genuinely trying to make the world a better place by eliminating the improper, to those jerks who follow me through the grocery store ranting about how shameful I am. But enough about why I pick up my groceries under cover of darkness. From your parents to the government, you probably already have more than enough examples in your life. Best I can think of is just ditching the order part entirely. Be some sort of Pied Piper character wandering around and collecting people. Sorry, I'm a chaotic goblin, I'm pretty biased. But I'm confident you can do something interesting with it. Just remember to pump the brakes in the control part when it comes to the party itself. In a very similar vein, we have the Peace Domain, something your DM is not going to have if you choose this. Because bundling enough, the one devoted to love and peace devastates combat with their support. It seems basic at first, you're proficient in a talkie skill and get some peaceful spells, healing and communication, even has the usual wisdom mod to cantrips at level 8. Your channel ability is really neat. You can run around without provoking attacks of opportunity, whacking your friends for a heal as you pass. But what sets the Peace Cleric apart is their bond ability. Level 1, a number of your allies are now bonded for 10 minutes. How many you can choose to be bonded and how many times a day you can bond people is equal to your proficiency modifier. As long as a bonded person is within 30 feet of another bonded person, they can add 1d4 to an attack, save, or check every turn. At level 6, when they're about to take damage, a bonded person who's in range can teleport to them and take the damage instead. And at level 17, that range becomes 60 feet and teleporting people take half damage. I don't like to get deep into mechanics on these, but your big damage dealer is getting an extra 5-20% to chance to hit on top of whatever support spells you want to cast, like Bless to do the same thing again. So they're basically always going to hit at least one attack, and when your tank just teleports to block whoever gets around your control spells, it gets a lot harder for the DM to actually do any lasting damage. In fact, don't even bother teleporting to them. Attack yourself or touch your torch. Your surrounded wizard can just pop over to take that one fire damage. You are a phenomenal support to arbitrate your forced peace. That is what these are apparently for. Watching treaty signings and settling disputes and helping those fight for peace. The question is, who's peace? Because that matters a lot. You could be a freedom fighter, a negotiator, a business person who makes trade deals, a weird merchant whose caravan is impossible to rob, or the royal assassination squad. What? Things get very peaceful indeed when everyone who'd bite you is dead. You can definitely go all love and hope and let's get along. But you can just as easily be about preemptive strikes and thought crimes and compliance. Send your team into strike like a bolt from the blue, as opposed to a bolt from the raging storm that is the Tempest Domain. Finally back in my comfort zone of just cool elemental powers, water, thunder, and lightning spells, you are the storm that is approaching and black clouds encroaching. You wear heavy armor, get martial weapons, and a few times a day you can clap back with thunder or lightning damage when you're hit. All of your lightning damage knocks people back at level 6, you get thunder or lightning damage whenever you attack at level 8, and your channel divinity can be used to maximize damage with thunder or lightning. Oh, and if you do make it to level 17, you can just fly whenever you're outdoors. You're meant to be the storm of destruction, and by Talos are you good at it. Now going to superheroes for inspiration is a given, but consider the other aspects of a storm to emulate. Maybe you're a wistful romantic knight, writing poetry about the calm which comes before and the beauty in its eye. Maybe you are a sailor and seek to sate the gods of the sea, invoking their name before violence to entertain them and spare your fellows. Or maybe Zeus just thinks you're hot and gave you powers as a gift, and you know enough to keep his favor but also watch your back, both for the wrath of another deity and just in case he tries something. Speaking of trickery, there are plenty of liars and pranksters among the gods. The trickery domain spell list focuses on changing your form, illusion, and just generally escaping the consequences of your actions. You can bring an accomplice too, giving an ally advantage on stealth checks for an hour, and you can do that as many times as you want, just not to more than one person at a time. Your channel divinity is among my favorites, letting you make an illusion of yourself. They have to stay in your line of sight and within 120 feet, but you can cast your spells through it, and since it's not real, it can't be hurt. So it can run in freely and use touch spells, or those dangerous area spells centered on the caster, all without you ever being in danger. And if you're in a pinch, you can both run up to a target to get advantage on the attack roll, and at level 17, you get four duplicates, letting you control a huge area. It's what you're going to be using near every channel on. I mean, technically, you do get another option at level 6. You turn invisible for one round, and it goes away if you attack or cast a spell. Woo. Anyway, you get that level 8 ability where you do extra damage with weapons, but this time with poison because you're tricky. Overall, I really like this one. The spells and channel make it really 
really unique. Your wonderful support that excels in all those weird touch spells, and you can actually help the whole party sneak. Being a thief priest is unexpected and fun, but you don't just have to be a magical rogue. You can be an actor, a liberator, a con artist, or a stage magician. Break into places as a form of worship, and if you're not a thief, just enjoy the thrill and turn everything five degrees to the right as a prank. It's great for everyone from freedom fighters to clowns, because of course you can be a priest of the dark carnival. How do these clowns keep getting into every D&D video? Anyway, they aren't the only ones active at night. Twilight Domain is really more of a nighttime class. I guess darkness or moonlight just didn't sound as appealing. This domain is all about protecting those who wander the dark. Your spells are healing, buffs, and debuffs. Some of the best around, too. And nothing is hiding in the darkness from your party. You get dark vision out to 300 feet, and you can share it with others for an hour. You can do it once a day for free. You can spend a spell slot to do it again if you need to, and you'll be able to see in the dark better than the creatures who live there. You'll be bonking them before they even know you exist, because you can give yourself or someone else advantage on initiative. With heavy armor and martial weapons, you'll be blazing out of the dark before they even know what hit them. And I do mean darkness. You can share your dark vision because you don't want light around. You can just fly a few times a day if it's dim light or darker. You get the usual damage at level 8, this time radiant, solid option. But of course, your big thing is your channel divinity. You can make a dimly lit spear, 30 foot radius, and moves to keep you in the center. One minute duration and grants 1d6 plus wisdom of temporary HP to anyone you want who ends their turn there. And at level 17, it also grants half cover, which means plus 2 to AC and plus 2 to deck saves. So yeah, that is good. Providing the entire party or a generating HP shield is amazing, especially with your heals to undo what little gets through. So it's not only my favorite aesthetic, with some of my favorite goddesses like Selune and Enlistrae, it's a pretty powerful domain on its own, which is good. It was gonna be my favorite regardless. You can be a wandering protector, traveling the wilds to guard travelers, or a hunter stalking the night to destroy monsters who live there. You could be part of a sacred order, the truth behind a local legend of those who protect dreams. Be a vigilante fighting for love and justice. In the name of the moon, punish them. Or there's nothing here that really demands you to be good. I would talk to your DM because this is the best cleric for a terror in the dark. Some things don't change. There will be shadow wherever there is light. And speaking of never changing, we finally have war. And yes, finally, number 14. I might make it out of this with a voice, unlike the first two times I had to record this. Now, obviously war works great for your average party. They're worshiping gods of battle and death. They get heavy armor and martial weapons, of course, and their spells are a mix of damage, defense, and combat utility. They can also make an extra attack as a bonus action a few times a day. Good for finishing someone off or hitting an attack that you really need to. At level two, you can hit plus 10 when you're trying to hit, and at six, you can do that to a nearby ally. Great for when your wizard has a spell they just really need to hit. And speaking of hitting, your level eight ability is the deal extra damage type, but it's the same type of damage as whatever type you're holding. And at level 17, you gain resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Basic, but great. Now a war god is pretty easy for a mercenary to worship, so I suggest flavoring it with your background and race. Do you worship by howling and charging in, letting the god flow through you? Or maybe you're a calm and focused teacher, filled with divine wisdom to help you guide your shot. Do you take trophies from your kills to prove your devotion? Or is war a necessary shame where you come from, and you wear a mask and mourner's clothing to hide your deed from the world? And just like with all the other domains, look at the god you're worshipping and how their other domains affect how you act. The worship of a god of war and chivalry will look completely different from one of war and conquest, or devastation, or disease. Try to make the god themselves be incorporated into your action. Line up three clerics of the same domain, and you should be able to tell if their gods are different. Whether you do that or not, though, that is all of them. Is the cleric fun? Uh, yeah, probably. If you like casting and utility magic, they are a great choice, especially for support and control builds. But you can do all kinds of things. Just focus on whatever your domain focuses on, and you can be pretty strong, too. But if nothing here felt quite like what you're after, here's my suggestion. If you want more bonk, go paladin. To focus on magic, go sorcerer or bard. If you're looking for that flavor of getting your power from someone else, look at the warlock. And if you're the DM, use undead, at least occasionally. The class is pretty focused on them, so throw them a bone, especially when they're at high level. I know it's hard to remember when we've just spent all this time on domains, but if you're level 16, all you've gotten for the past eight levels are undead based abilities, better spell casting, or nothing. Except divine intervention, which I know is powerful in some campaigns, but in most campaigns I've been in or run, that in-game week might be multiple levels or out-of-game months. Don't get me wrong, the cleric is powerful, they just don't get much new past level eight. Anyway, like if you liked, sub if you haven't, and if you're particularly generous, you can leave me a tip on my coffee. The donations keep me running and growing. Top supporters this month are Feral Goblin and Sergeant Daniels. Anyway, class dismissed.
Okay, so my big gripe with this class is that the god means nothing. Yeah, you heard me. What's the point? You don't even have to know who the god is. They can't affect you in any way. You get the same spells no matter what. And they use a standard spellcasting structure. So why bother locking it to a religion? Especially given how many people have ditched alignment by this point. Yeah, I know. Hot take. But if you don't give me a limit, what do I have to build or buck against? I want decisions. Consequences for my actions. Restriction can breed creativity. It could even be as simple as having to drop that god and switch to someone more aligned with my goals. My hot fix for this is adding little minor powers that are specific to whatever god you're worshipping, so if you anger them, you'll lose that power. You still keep your domain stuff because you're linked to that general realm and power source, but if you want those minor powers back, you're gonna have to play by that god's rules, or find a new god who aligns with you better. Look, mechanics-wise, I love playing clerics, but flavor-wise, they're just a warlock with a complex. Anyway, my voice is dying, so BB out. See ya! Settle in class, cause today we're covering one of my all-time favorites. Shapeshifting and spellcasting with incredible versatility, the druid is one of the most ancient and powerful of all. Whether we're helping animals grow or decay, reaching for the stars or setting the world ablaze, you're sure to find something that appeals to your particular subclass needs. We'll start with mechanics, then move into flavor. You ready? Let's go! Okay, first things first, what are we even talking about? A druid is someone so in tune with nature that they draw divine power from it. But unlike the nature cleric, they're not just simping for the lady in the lake. They're typically focused on the concept of nature itself. That nets them too Main abilities which grow over time. Now you might be thinking, Phoebe. Hey baby, you said this was one of the more complicated classes. And the really versatile. Only other thing they got is agent slower. And they only got a couple weapons and medium armor without metal. Even Barbarian gets more than that. Well, that's all true, but I wasn't lying. The first power they have is full spell casting. And druids get the kind where their whole spell list is always open. They just choose which spells they want to have on hand for the day. So keep spells like Call Lightning and Conjure Animal on hand. And if someone dies, you just swap them up or reincarnate in the morning. And if you're wondering what those spells are, it's because the druid spell list is actually pretty unique. 19 druid only spells, and 36 unique to them and the ranger. Their primary draw is wonderful battlefield control and unique area of effect options, but they've even got utility and healing. The options they have are great too, but their fantastic magic probably isn't your first thought with a druid. What most people think of is the other ability, wild shape. Twice per short rest, you can shape shift into an animal, gaining all their physical stats but keeping your own mental ones. You don't get legendary or lair actions if the creature has them, but you do have all the other tricks like tripping and trampling, and you can use any of your own abilities that the new form could reasonably do. You also get all of their HP, and when that reaches zero, you just go back to being yourself, alongside the same HP you were at when you shifted. At first, you're restricted to relatively weak things like the elk or boar, and can't fly or swim or even cast spells, so you can maintain ones you cast beforehand. As you grow, you get stronger forms like dire wolf or giant eagle, learn how to fly or swim, and can even cast magic as long as there aren't material components. And at level 20, you can just wild shape infinitely, but most druids use this as utility first and foremost. Your strength doesn't come from being a boar against a dragon, it comes from being an inconspicuous rat sneaking through the sewers, or a normal pigeon that just happens to be in the area when lightning kills someone in broad daylight, with one incredible exception, but we'll get there soon. Just know that this is the other portion adding complexity, being able to grab the form of any animal within a certain power level. I recommend finding the stats for a couple of general animals like cats or wolves and just having them on standby. They also technically have one more ability, Druidic. It's a druid-only language for their secret groups called Circles, which is confusingly also the name for their subclasses, though the druids in the same organizations aren't always the same subclass, and there's usually quite a few non-druids or even non-humanoids in the organization. From here on out, when I say circle, I mean the subclass, or the shape. Circles are your druid's focus, giving them new abilities or amplifying the ones they have at level 2, 6, 10, and 14. To go any further, we'll have to get into those powers directly, beginning with the Circle of Dreams. This is your fey druid, they speak for the trees, and work with its keepers to break both your knees. Okay, not really. They're more healing focused, and get a pool of d6s to temporarily heal people as a bonus action. It's like a temporary healing word, but with a 120 foot range and you can cast spells on the same turn, so honestly just better in a fight. That's what you get from the Summer Court of Fairies and such. But from the Unseelie Fey, you get a dome to protect and hide your campsite while you rest. Yeah, if you haven't caught on, this one's not really a fighter. At level 10, they can teleport themselves or others a few times a day, and at 14, you can finish a short rest by casting Dream, Scrying, or Teleportation Circle. This one's all about utility and healing and such, which goes pretty well with your natural spell list. If you're just looking to heal and spread good vibes, you could definitely do worse. I can't stop imagining this one just sitting in someone's pocket as a mouse, high and passing out heals and good berries. Personally, I would focus on your role as a bridge between the fey and the mundane. Lean into the fickle and whimsical nature of your fey friends. This is a perfect druid for a gnome or elf or fairy. Or, I can't believe I'm saying this, 
this. You don't really need the thing. All your powers are related to healing, travel, and communication. You work great as a messenger or just a general scout. Someone who just lives so closely with the land, they're basically one with it. Though if you're wanting to be in tune with a particular land, that's the next one. Circle of Land is the one devoted to the land. In spellcasting, you pick an extra cantrip, you recover some spell slots during a short rest, and you get an extra list of eight spells that are always prepared. They're based on the land you're devoted to and often not on the druid spell list, like slow or create food and water. You also just have an easier time against a lot of creatures. Non-magical plants can't slow you down, and even magical effects like Entangle struggle to attack you. Eventually, Bay and Elementals can't charm or frighten you, and you can't be poisoned or suffer disease. And by level 14, plants and animals have to make a save to even try and attack you, and they know that in advance, which means they'll probably ignore you and just go bite the wizard instead. The land druid is nice and simple while still maintaining power. Passive effects and immunities with some extra pre-picked spells? It's about as simple as a druid gets. So think about where exactly you got these powers. This one draws from a specific land, but how specific? Could it be one mountain or hill? Does it have to be the actual dirt, or could the concept of the penguins living on it be their power source? Is your power even from this world? You could be an elemental cultist, and I know I was poking fun at the cleric, but there's nothing stopping you from drawing power from the divine realm of a nature god, or even a god themselves. It's mostly down to your relationship. You're not an acolyte, you're a co-worker. A cleric might wake up and worship their god, thanking them for continued favor. The druid might acknowledge them through tradition and such, but it's more of a nod and good morning as you pass by a shift lead. Of course my tools are there when I clock in. They better be if the boss wants the job done competently. Otherwise, I'm just going somewhere else. They need me, not the other way around. I love the idea of just a down-to-earth backwoods tradesman sort of druid, doing honest work for remote communities. Now let's go from the most basic to the most complicated, the ones you've heard tales of, the literal elephant in the room. The moon druid. It laser focuses on one thing, wild shape. Your wild shape goes off the monster manual's challenge rating system, a loose guide to the strength of a monster. Other druids start at a max strength of one quarter and eventually get to CR1. CR1 is where you start, and end at CR6 with creatures like the mammoth. You also shift as a bonus action, so you can easily change during the fight. Multiple giant health bars, healing yourself by expending spell slots, and every ability in the animal kingdom, you don't really leave melee once you go in. Before long, your tax count as magic appears through resistances, and it doesn't stop at animals. At level 10, you can turn into basic elementals for two uses of wild shape, and at level 14, your shifting goes subtle, letting you use alter self infinitely. So even when you're out of wild shape, you're still getting gills and claws and horns and turning into other people. This thematically incredible ability is great for saving your spell slots and utility wild shapes. Most classes would love to have this, but the moon is so incredibly strong that people get disappointed by it. The moon druid doesn't add new abilities so much as crack open the one you already have and turn it into a behemoth, but it's also one of the most complicated due to how many full-on forms you now have access to. Other druids can just grab a few at the start and be mostly done, and with it being utility, they can mostly just improv it. You, however, will be waiting into combat with it whenever possible. You'll be updating that list seven times on your own, and add those elementals at level 10. Overall, you get 20 to 60 extra forms, depending on which books your DM lets you pull from. And all of those abilities are on top of your spell casting, which is just as strong as a normal pull caster. I'm going on about this because people forget they have a great spell list then think they're lagging behind. If your old forms aren't hitting as hard as you need and you don't get new ones until next level, just use your spells. Cone of Cold still hits just as hard, and you still have all that HP and utility when you need it. It's a lot to keep up with. I don't blame people for getting overwhelmed. But when used to its full potential, the Lunar Druid fully eclipses its competition. At least you don't have to think too much about what you want to be, because it's really hard to reflavor this druid. For something that's constantly changing its form, it really knows what it wants to be. So I recommend you look at why you're shapeshifting. A zookeeper might want to understand the needs of her animals better, or a conservationist might be living among them, a warden that can terrify poachers, knowing that every animal might just get mad when you shoot it in reverse gravity. Or maybe you're a warforged reassembling yourself into whatever form is best suited for the situation. Or a demigod, and instead of Zeus's strength or lightning, you got his penchant for turning into animals and clouds. Put that bard stereotype to shame by summoning every furry in town, quicker than I keep summoning new subscribers. Hit that like button and tell me your favorite animal name, or favorite name for an animal, like Princess Monster Truck, or Jorts, or Snurt. And speaking of animals and summoning, we got the Shepherd Druid. They're focused on animals and fae, though mainly just the little fae that can't protect themselves. They can speak the fae's language, and can even hold full conversations with animals. They're focused on protection, summoning totems to do things like give temporary HP, heal everyone around you when you cast healing spells, or give someone's attack roll advantage. By level 10, it also automatically heals summoned animals and fae in its radius. And you're gonna want to have summons. That's the main deal with this circle. At level 6, your summons get extra HP and count as magic for piercing defenses, and at level 14, they appear on their own if you're incapacitated. Conjure animals at max level for free if you're unwillingly knocked out, and you get to choose the animal. Pretty useful. And if all this sounds a little basic, especially after the moon druid's madness, there's a reason. Summoning was already very strong on its own, and shepherds shoring up their weaknesses keeps them around and useful far longer than you'd expect. Nobody's prepared for a sudden stampede of 32 walruses. Just make sure you're the exception or you're gonna kill the pace of combat. Now when it comes to play 
However, here's the issue. Thematically speaking, the Shepherd and Moon Druid are twins, often looking the same even when doing different things. Most things I have, like Zookeeper or Warden, work just as well for both. If you picked Shepherd, you probably either like the Moon Druid but don't want melee, or you just want to be the best summoner and are fine if that means you're a Druid. I'm sure you're tempted to be raised by wolves or whatever and make everything themed around one animal, but unless your DM's cool with you just saying everything you summon is a weird looking crab, good luck, because your summons are so buried and you'll keep upgrading to better versions, especially since Druids get some nearly unique summons. You can still do some original concepts with them of course, but you have to dig and often need to work with your DM for approval. A monster trainer sort of character works great here, or a classic fairy tale princess gone hostile, maybe flavored as a toy maker summoning wooden or plush animals, or a hunter reviving the spirits of the creatures he's killed to fight for him. Although my favorite is the incredibly drunk actual shepherd gone rogue. They think everything they conjure is a weird looking sheep, but it is very much a normal bear, or velociraptor, or hag. I would suggest making some sort of messed up chef that summons animals to kill and eat, but summons aren't actually killed. They're just sent back to wherever they came from, because dead animals, or dead most things, is the realm of the spore druid. Spore druids are fungus based, all about decay. They get an aura of spores that can hurt someone within 10 feet as a reaction, damage increasing as you level. They can also use a wild shape charge to flood that aura with magic, doubling the damage it deals and giving them necrotic damage with melee attacks for 10 minutes. Also heals you for 4 HP per druid level. What makes it weird is that their list of always prepared bonus spells has enemy dead on it. The flavor text says that they see undeath as just different life, as long as they aren't trying to kill all life or extend their life unnaturally. I really struggle to think of an undead that isn't trying to kill all life it sees or extend their life. Even ones like the Revenant are trying to extend their life until their task is done, so I guess they're just okay with undead tools that disappear quickly. Like their level 6 ability, which converts small and medium sized beasts and humanoids that die within 10 feet into 1 HP zombies for an hour. Fungal zombies, which means these aren't proper zombies. These are cordyceps hijacking the nervous system, like what happens in nature on all sorts of creatures. So they like undeath, as long as they aren't on the list of reasons that cover all undead, or they're not really undead. But they have a will of the wells friend, I'm sure. Anyway, <laughs> whenever your spores are in that wild shape overdrive, you can throw your aura onto a 10 foot cube and set it to attack everything. And at level 14, your own spores have changed you. You're immune to being deafened, blinded, frightened, or poisoned. And as long as you're not incapacitated, you can't be critically hit. Don't mistake my ridicule of Watsy's weird wording as complaint about the class itself. I honestly adore the theming on this. A weird bog druid that remembers decomposers are incredibly important to all life. The spores are both thematically perfect and mechanically powerful. And I gotta love how they made the wild shape into something new. Now personally, I would just play this one straight, but if you don't want to, I would ditch the mushroom entirely. Go full on Grim Reaper, the spore cloud becoming a straight up aura of unlife. Weak minions hobbling up on their own from the raw amount of negative energy coming off of you. That same energy that rips the life out of everything around you. And speaking of energy, you could go full fallout on this. Replace that mushroom with a mushroom cloud. Your necrotic aura is nuclear fallout, bringing people back as radioactive barrel ghouls. Speaking of nuclear power, we have the star domain. Though we aren't bringing down solar fire on those who squish ladybugs. We're turning into constellations. Okay, I can accept that. Your new wild shape turns you into a cloud of night sky, with your choice of constellation to adorn yourself with. The archer constellation gets a spell attack with radiant damage, the dragon stops you from rolling under 10 on your concentration checks, and the chalice gives you a bonus heal on yourself or others whenever you cast healing magic. At level 10, these become stronger, increasing the damage and the healing. Also, the dragon can fly and you can switch your forms at the beginning of every round. There's that versatility I know and love. At level 14, you get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage while transformed. And that didn't specify non-magical. Wow. Of course, you don't have to wait for high levels for the good stuff. At low levels, you get your star chart. Could be an actual map or one of those clear balls with the dots on them that project the stars in your bedroom, or even binoculars with little slideshows on them. As long as that's your spell focus, you get the cleric's guiding bolt and guidance spells, and get a few free castings a day. And at level 6, you can use it to read the stars and tell the future. Depending on the roll, you can either add or subtract a d6 from someone's attack, save, or check a few times a day. And I know you're just using the chart, but I like to think of it as looking at your wild-shaped self and making your own thing. I gotta admit though, I'm impressed. I didn't expect something so cool out of the astrology domain. I'm kidding of course, but you know how I feel about Watsi's take on space. But you can honestly do some really cool things with this. What culture doesn't have a vast network of belief and myths set around the stars? Constellations are as old as the eyes we view them with. Talk to your DM, change yours. As long as the mechanics stay the same, who cares if your chalice is above? Be a wispy diviner channeling the heavens. An engineer factoring in the stars for maximum light and stability during rituals. A witch who knows what herbs are best when picked under the current star sign. Or maybe you're a prince driven mad by thoughts from a cosmic god. First to map and form constellations that were drunkenly destroyed in times long forgotten. Or you could be like our local Duragar star druid, who's using the stars to chart a course and sail off the side of the map, trying to fall off the world with the right timing to land on the moon, where he can then mine it to nothing and fly 
high to the ground, having rid all lycanthropes of their power. But we do not have time for that story. Finally, the Wildfire Druid. I bought the books only for this. A self-proclaimed brush by your druid back in Pathfinder 1E is what really cemented this as something I wanted to do all my life. And I gotta admit, I was surprised but pleased. A Wildfire Druid knows that fire is needed to wipe out old brush and make way for the new. Because of this, they get 5 spells that bring life and 5 spells that burn to ash. At level 10, that healing fire thing continues by making creatures who die within 30 feet erupt into spectral flame. They can make that fire hurt or heal those who touch it a few times a day. The other half of this circle's power is the Wildfire Companion. Instead of wild shaping, you can summon a fiery spirit for an hour. It can fly, it has a range attack and a bunch of condition immunities. It can teleport and take everyone beside it with it, leaving a burst of fire in its wake. You do need to use your bonus action to command it, but if you go down, it's free to do whatever it wants. At level 6, you can have your spells come from it instead of you, and as long as it's here, your fire and healing spells get an extra D8. And at level 14, you don't need to worry about what the spirit does when you're down. If you go unconscious, you can rise from the spirit's ashes like a messed up phoenix. As long as it's within 120 feet, you can have it burn up to restore half your HP. It's only once a long rest, but I adore it. Take the elemental adept feet to cut through fire resistance, and you will burn higher, burn brighter, fight fire with fire. I'm just glad this turned out so wonderfully. Thematic, powerful. It does have a weakness in fire immune things, but that's what the rest of your spell list is for. And besides, I like having a weakness. Reminds me why I'm bothering with a party. And as for flavor, this is your forestry department doing control burns to refresh the soil and stop trees from choking out the forest. Look, I want to give ideas for whoever isn't pumped full of them just from the concept, but I can't. Someone who changed my life, how I see myself and act, was basically this. My mind's eye can't see past the monolith of Fi. Fresh Fire Druid. He's the Pathfinder equivalent of a Moon Druid Fire Genasi, searching for his lost god of the circle of life and death, and in the meantime, making sure that will was done. Because by his willpower incarnate, oh, the tales I could tell. Like sneaking away from the party to burn the forest, or trying to start a plague in a major city, but accidentally targeting one of the big bads exclusively. But this isn't the place for giant flaming dinosaurs screeching through walls and armies. This is the place where the circles come full circle. If there's one thing I hope I got across, it's that there's no bad druid. Although they tend to be complex, you really can't go wrong with any of these. Wonderful themes that let you explore nearly every concept you'd want to, with abilities as thematic as they are strong. The worst mechanically is probably Dream, and they're still a great healer. All of the druids are good, maybe not moon druid good, but few things are and we're better for it. If you're willing to put in the time and digging through options and possibilities excites you, the druid is amazing. But if you're looking at this and don't want something so complicated, that's fair. I'd recommend the ranger or the nature domain for something with the same feel, or the bard for versatility. I'd also recommend that you settle in class. Today we're covering the fighter, the, well, I know I always do these little descriptions, but is it really necessary this time? I mean, it's in the name. Person what does that fighting thing. It used to literally be called Fighting Man. Oh, I know. I could spice it up with some cosplay. No, you're good. You sure? You're taking up too much screen. Fine. Honestly, they don't really need the help. Everyone mocks them for being basic, but they have plenty of exciting subtypes to spice things up. Samurai, Mage Knight, Giantkin, Psychic Warrior. If you're looking for something with armor and a weapon, you can probably find a good fit. So let's hop to it. You ready? Let's go. As far as the stats go, they're about what you'd expect. Second highest hit die with a D10, good with strength and constitution, and they can use all armor and weaponry. And that's a trend you'll notice. The fighter is a generalist warrior with options for specialization. They get an extra action once per short rest at level 4, and twice at level 17. At level 5, you can attack twice per action, three times at level 11, and four at level 20. At level 9, you can re-roll a saving throw once per long rest, or twice at 13, and three times at 17. Basic as a brick, but just as useful. Though your one bit of class-wide specialization is chosen right at the beginning. Level 1, fighting style. Archery, dueling, and throwing weapons style will give you more accuracy with a weapon, while unarmed, two weapon, and great weapon will give you more damage. We got defense for more AC, interception to reduce damage on a friend, and protection to help them avoid the attack altogether. Your odd ones out are blind fighting to fight in the dark and foil invisible creatures, and superior technique to get a maneuver and die from the battlemaster, the battlemaster being one of the fighter's subclasses, known as archetypes. These are specializations, granting them more power at level 3, 7, 10, 15, and 18. Between that and the bonus feats, they really can get a lot, so let's dive in. Battlemasters are fighters that decided they weren't generally enough and spread their base even further. They study from many masters, learn from many fields, and now have all sorts of tricks to bring down their foe. These tricks are called maneuvers, used by expending your four superiority die, a set of d8s that you get back on a short rest. As you level, these dice will grow in size and number, capping out at 6d12. But what are these tricks? Well, pretty much anything mundane
game you can think of. Increasing damage or accuracy, tripping, parrying. I'm not gonna list all 23, they're on the board. You start with three, eventually learn up to nine, and honestly, you'll want most of them, which is good because that's about all that you're gonna be able to do. I mean, eventually you can stare at something for a full minute to find out their HP or level or something, and at level 15, you get one superiority dice if you start combat while empty, but those aren't really the most impactful things. But that doesn't really matter because the amount of maneuvers you get really make up for it. You basically get to build your own fighter here, especially if you double down with that superior technique fighting style. And speaking of that build your own fighter concept, this is exactly why the fighter is not the boring stereotype everyone paints it out to be. They're a blank canvas, and you have the brush. If the character is dull, my sister and Sarah and Ray, you built the character. Why are they fighting? How are they fighting? Are they using a family weapon or anything that they can find? Are they a former town guard? Why former? Were they fired or lost the town or couldn't stand the corruption? Maybe they just thought this adventuring business should be done by someone who actually cares about the surrounding area. And who is the person underneath all that armor? Because a character is more than a job, and if they aren't, lean into it. Make a fighter who's a general maintenance worker or janitor. They take that act and do pretty much anything that needs doing mindset and bring it into their fighting. Knowing a trick or having a tool for pretty much anything. Might not be pretty, but it'll work. And you move to fighting monsters because somebody has to. Being knee deep in monster guts isn't glamorous, but someone's got to do it to keep this place running. Look, I know I got a thing for making adventures into blue collared workers, but that and customer service are just kind of what I know. And speaking of sticking to what you know, they definitely lean more on the media stereotype for the samurai. Still, I gotta admit they're pretty cool, blending courtly nobility alongside their fighting. They get an extra language or proficiency in history, insight, performance, or persuasion. I would double down into persuasion, as level 7 lets them add their wisdom modifier to persuasion checks, and they get proficiency in wisdom saving throws. On the actual fighting side, three times per day they get a temporary tiny heal and advantage on attack rolls. At level 10 they get one of those uses back at the start of combat if they're out, and at level 15 they can trade advantage on an attack for another extra attack once per round. And once a day at level 18 when you hit 0 HP, you interrupt the current turn to take your own full turn before you fall unconscious. Which is wonderful! The player for persuasion makes it work well for any militant nobility, but honestly they kinda seem more like an anime protagonist to me. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying that flurries of attacks while fighting on through determination and making persuasion checks does seem pretty anime. You can also start stepping on other classes' toes. Maybe you're the arbiter for a god of redemption, a villain's last chance. You try to talk them down, but will fight to the bitter end if projected. Or be an armored barbarian just too angry to die. This class works really well with anyone who'd take a knife to the gut and say, you're gonna have to try a little harder than that. Of course, with all that said, people tend to only pick this if they specifically want a samurai. If you do go that route, then pick a clear concept like Orcish Ronin or a noble protector of a particular person and commit to the bit to make it crystal clear. It's a pretty nice class, and you can do a lot with it. Though to be honest, if I wanted to make an actual samurai, this wouldn't be my first pick. But we'll get to that one later. For now, it's Eldric Nighttime. These decided to add some magic into the mix, spread the diversity into the arcane. You start just knowing three first level spells, but eventually learn 13 with spell slots up to level 4. Most of them have to be abjuration or evocation, but those are the protect yourself and hurt people domains, so you are probably already going in that direction. You can also summon your weapon to your hand as a bonus action, and cannot be disarmed while conscious. Not gonna come up every campaign, but it's pretty great for swapping weapons on the fly or sneaking them where they shouldn't be. And despite the common misconception, when going gets rough, you can use an action surge to cast two spells in one turn, or attack with your weapon and a spell at the same time. It's great to have so many options, but starting at level 7, you don't have to choose. You can attack with your weapon as a bonus action whenever you cast a cantrip. At level 10, hitting someone with your weapon gives them disadvantage when trying to resist your spell's save. And at level 15, you can teleport whenever you action surge. You can do it after or even between the actions, so if you beat one creature, you can warp to the next and keep going. Now let's get the elephant out of the room. This was one of the original two builds people tried to use to toss a coin to the Witcher, or their Skyrim character, or any of the other spell sword tropes. The base concept is someone who picked up a couple of spells they could commit to memory because magic is useful on the battlefield. It works well for anyone in a fighting profession, but they offer you a twist of going in reverse. Maybe you wanted to be a wizard, but your mentor was killed so you switched to fighting while studying on the side. Or maybe you're inherently magical like a sorcerer but don't really care and just want to hit stuff. Or maybe you're an enthusiast. You're not formally trained and have to fight as a day job but you're just really into magical theory in your off time, it's just super neat. Or maybe you really aren't trying to learn magic, but you have a short attention span and just default to weapons because you can't focus. Give yourself a spell book and say you spend an hour studying it like a wizard, but you only end up learning three spells because you just keep getting distracted. Spell swords are pretty common, inspiration is pretty much anywhere there's magic, although Eldritch Knights aren't the only one with magic and weaponry, and some fighters don't keep them separate. Arcane Archers are, well, the name kinda says it all. Seriously, they only have like three abilities. At level 7, they can use their bonus action to draw direct a missed attack towards a new target. At level 3, they get a cantrip that does your laundry, and a selection of magical arrows. You get to pick 2 out of the 8 options, and use them twice per short rest. So at level 15, you do regain 1 use when combat starts if you're completely out. Every other level up is getting one more option available until you eventually have 6 out of 8. They're all based on different spell schools,
tools with a little extra damage and an effect like homing in on people or slowing them down. You really do have a lot of fun arrow options here, and for most options you don't have to choose whether you activate the magic arrow until after it hits. And what even are these arrows? Maybe your quiver is made with the height of monsters, imbuing them with their traits. Or the heads are covered in runes, activating in a whispered word of power. Or maybe they're just a magically conductive crystal, letting you cast your normally weak magic directly into the opponent's body. Also, how did you even get this power? The original arcing archers learned from nature spirits, but maybe you're cosplaying as a cleric and Artemis imbues you with power when you call her name. Or you could just go full artificer and coat your arrows with thermite. Though I gotta admit, I really wish you got to use it more. It's acting like five of your abilities, but you'll see it like three times a day. Unless you're level 15 and survey says you probably aren't. At least the arrow redirection is pretty cool, and your arrows do count as magic so you can still shoot a ghost. But as cool as magic weaponry is, the fighters got a lot more than that. The Rune Knight carves giant magic into everything they have. I mean, the magic is coming from giants. It's why you know the giant language and have smithing tools. I'm not sure the magic itself is especially big. You start out knowing two runes and eventually learn five out of six, because fighters just love leaving you so close to completion. When you're carrying or wearing an item with a rune carved into it, they give you a variety of powers, like how the hill giant rune gives you advantage on saves to be poisoned, resistance to poison damage, and once for short rest lets you resist all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for one minute. Each rune can be activated once per short rest. Moving on to level 7, I lied, we're not even done with 3 yet. You can also activate giant mode, where you get advantage on strength checks and saves, do an extra d6 of damage once per turn, and become large. You can do this your proficiency modifier in times per day. Now at level 7 for real, you can force any attack made within 60 feet to reroll. Once again, your proficiency times per day. At level 10, you grow a little and do more damage in giant mode. At 15, you can invoke your rune powers twice, and at 18, you grow huge when in giant mode. Being huge lets you move faster and deal a d10 of damage. This is the sort of magic items I like. The runes give you passive effects alongside your active ones, and when you get new runes, you still get other abilities as well. This is great, though a little bit limiting in ways you can twist it. My first idea is to tie the runes to other things. Make them invoke dragons or elementals or gods. Maybe these are the true names of demons or fae, and they lend you strength when you invoke their name. And how did you even learn these runes? Did you win them in a game of dice or study an abandoned city? Or maybe your ancestors saved a giant who taught them power as thanks, and your family has passed this secret down for centuries. But what if your magic isn't actually magic? You just tap into an invisible force to shield you or attack people or cast telekinesis. More specifically, the Psy Warrior has a pool of d6s as energy. You can reduce the damage someone takes, lift things, deal extra force damage, or draw a tiny object to your hand, all with a range of 30 feet. At level 7, you can also fly for a round, and your psychic strike pushes people. At 15, you can shield yourself and your allies with half cover. First time for long rest is free, just like your level 18 telekinesis. It's the normal spell without components, so you can make an extra attack as a bonus action while you're concentrating. Oh, and at level 10, you're resistant to psychic damage and can remove the frightened or charmed conditions with the power of your brain. What a powerful force, or just any old force. This is a Jedi. Let's just get that out of the way. Snap on some pull plate and throw people around, maybe adding in a menacing maneuver or great weapon fighting. But just like the samurai, it can be more than that. The atrophied old master moving their body through mental might, or a bulky brute with a club that preys on people who underestimate his wit. You could be the experiment of a mind player or a wizard, or just reflavor your powers as magic and be some sort of sorcerer version of the war wizard. And I know everyone goes longsword, but what weapon you use isn't specified, just that your target is within 30 feet. Be a true hero with spears, or an archer launching people to remove their cover. And if your GM allows them, be a psychic with a shotgun. Anyway, we're starting to get a little silly with all this mystical power and things calling themselves a knight when they don't even have a mount. Let's see, uh, there's purple dragon knight. Oh boy. Whenever you use your second wind feature to heal, you can add three other creatures per your level in HP. At level 7, you gain double proficiency in persuasion, and at 10, your action surge lets another ally make an attack as a reaction, or two allies at level 18. And at 15, you can let an ally re-roll a saving throw whenever you use your indomitable feature on wisdom, intelligence, or charisma saving throws. Or in much shorter terms, you're letting others take a fraction of your feature whenever you choose to use them. It's thematically kinda neat, and you know I value theming highly, but... Eh, you're not really getting anything new, and it only helps your allies if they're close and also need that thing at the same time. At least you can twist the abilities well. Maybe you're giving a power of friendship speech to inspire those around you, or your menacing aura intimidates others into continuing the fight. Your determination could be billowing off you in a wave of magical power. And speaking of magic, maybe you're using time magic, letting other people take an extra shot at their save, or undoing the damage they took. Or you could go the druidic route, hijacking your allies' survival instincts to get those extra swings and saves. And that's even without... Dude. 
Wait, they don't get a mount? What kind of Mandela effect is this? I could have swore they rode a baby dragon. Where are the horses? Right, the cavalier. Now that is a knight. You can hop on or off your mount for five feet of movement. It's hard to knock you off. And you even land on your feet if the fall's ten feet or less. You can also mark a creature that you hit, giving them disadvantage if they're within five feet and attack anyone other than you. And regardless of their distance, if they hurt someone else, you can attack them with advantage and have your level and extra damage as a bonus action on your next turn. You can only do the attack part a few times a day, but you can always mark people for disadvantage. Helps keep damage off your allies and mount. Just like your level 7 ability, where you add a d8 to the AC of an ally within 5 feet. And if the attack hits anyway, you give the person resistance, shaving off half the damage. At level 10, you can make an opportunity attack on anyone who moves while within your reach as a reaction, stopping them from moving if it lands. And at level 18, you're allowed to take an opportunity attack every turn. Nothing's getting around you. Oh, and when you do move at level 15, you can knock an enemy prone, so they can't even escape. Now that is a mounted warrior. And I know that you're thinking how you can't take a horse into a dungeon, but the only ability requiring a mount is the one that lets you hop on your mount. You can use the rest whenever. This is an amazing defender. So for flavor, why? Why are you so obsessed with people only attacking you? Do you just love your friends so much you can't stand to see them hurt? Or is it blinding self-importance and how dare they think you aren't the biggest threat? Maybe you're looking for a good death in battle and everyone else can wait their turn. Or maybe it's just masochism. This is also a great place to lean into your species. Are you a little gnome riding a dog or a centaur acting as their own mount? Or maybe you're on foot as an angry little goblin or kobold, taking out the kneecaps of anyone who underestimates them. Oh, and I don't know if this is a hot take or a cold take. If you take the archery fighting style, you're a more accurate samurai than the samurai. They were armored mounted archers that could definitely rip you apart at close range, but preferred harassing you from horseback. Anyway, it's good to finally have a classic knight, but let's get back to basics. And note that basic does not mean bad. The champion is essentially fighter plus. You already hit hard and often, and now you score a crit on a 20 or 19, and later 18 as well. You're already good at most things physical, but at level 7 you can add half your proficiency to strength, dex, and con checks if you didn't already. You like those fighting styles? Have another. And I know you can already heal as an action, but at level 18 you start automatically healing if you're below half health. You're a fighter without anything else to worry about. No psychic powers or fancy tricks, just a person who fights well, simple and clean. And here's where I kick back a little against what I said before. The framework of person with weapon leaves the fighter feeling free, endless possibilities. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with just basic. I love spicing things up, but your staples are there for a reason. This is your basic hero, your generic protagonist, or even just yourself with a stick. You can play it straight and I'm not gonna shame you because honestly that can shake things up the most. And you can always add on over time. Give yourself room to grow. Can I share a story? My favorite champion fighter is a man named Dave. He's a human in basic, ragged gear, already old enough to start fading into folk legend. He's covered in scars and weary determination, always seeming to show up just in the nick of time. But before your monster's body stops stops twitching, he's already dragging himself away. Nothing but a sigh and a call for vigilance. He's a hero, a real one, driving out darkness not for country or creed, but because he must, like he needs to breathe. Age is making both of those start to weigh on him. He understands the futility of his task, yet axe in hand he still trudges into the night. For as long as darkness haunts the world, so will he. Or so the legend goes. I could embellish, but he's just a generic pure-hearted fantasy hero that got old but never stopped being himself. He's not jaded or weary from the world, just determined and weary from his joints. While for me, that's a refreshing break from the bazaar, for others he's a favorite to play repeatedly and slowly improve on. Maybe your table's Dave is called Maria or Ali. I hope you'll treat them with kindness, because we all play for different reasons. Standard and safe might just be what that player needs. And speaking of kindness, settle in class, today we're talking about the Monk, masterful martial artist that can snatch arrows out of the air and run up walls and punch all their problems away. People like to dunk on them because they're unrealistic. No way could they fight someone with a sword and armor, let alone a dragon. Well, these monks are faster than a tiger and stronger than a gorilla. Those things that can break iron without the extra speed and force. Dragon scale doesn't stand a chance. You ready to learn? Let's go! The monks are a bit odd for close quarter skirmishers. They only get proficiency in simple weapons and short swords, and have to stick to a shorter list of melee monk weapons for most abilities, keeping them pretty close range. Yet despite that, they get no armor proficiency, and a d8 hit die means you can't take too many hits. So what makes them work? Well, who needs weapons when you have the rest of your body? Your unarmed strike starts at 1d4 and eventually rises up to 1d10. And these strikes aren't just punches, they're kicks and elbows and headbutts. You'll be using them often, as you make one as a bonus action whenever you attack with your monk weapon or strike. And as for your lack of armor, you add dex and wisdom to your AC. You'll be wanting dex anyway, because you use it instead of your strength.
strength for punches and monk weapons, and you'll already be wanting wisdom to boost the saves of your main feature, key at level 2. Your key is basically magic points that you can use to do cool things. The amount you have is equal to your level, and they come back on a short rest. You can spend them on plenty of fun tricks like dashing and dodging and disengaging. Later on, you can do things like launching the arrows you caught right back at him, or re-rolling saving throws. But there are two options that stand out amongst the crowd. At level 2, you can get two extra punches called a flurry of blows, and at level 5, you can attempt to stun people. Doing those at the same time is a combo that helps them get their reputation. If you look around, you'll find most people think they're either really weak or really strong. That's because they are custom built to counter everything a new DM knows. That stunning flurry combo can wreck a solo big monster, which is every newbie's crutch, but look at that crazy amount of other abilities. You move faster as you level up, so with the dash ability, nothing can catch you, especially when you start running up walls and across water. And if they do, just jump off the wall and ignore five times your level in fall damage. You also start ignoring damage on any save you pass, and only take half even if you fail. And if they start trying to use conditions instead, you become immune to disease and poison and can break out of charms and fear. And then you become proficient in all saving throws and just stop failing in general. You'll eventually speak and understand all languages so they can't rely on miscommunication problems, and they couldn't even disarm you if they literally took your arms. So taking away your stuff doesn't even really hurt. You block everything a young DM knows how to do, then backflip off the villain's tower to stun lock them. However, as they mature, they learn how to counter it, and a jack-of-all-trades character like a monk can feel weak compared to a specialist. Don't let that get you down though, even with a veteran DM, their abilities offer things that no one else can. The rest of those abilities come from their subclasses at level 3, 6, 11, and 17, though they already have so many. Name another level 2 character that can hit 3 things in 6 seconds. I mean, it's taken you how long just to hit 2? Yeah, that's right, I put the part where I ask you to like and subscribe where you least expect it, just like the way of a shadow monk. Believe it or not, they're basically a ninja. They get the minor illusion cantrip to cause distractions and such, and can use their key to cast darkness, dark vision, pass without a trace, or silence. And that darkness is important, because at level 6 they can teleport between areas with dim light and darkness, as long as they can see the exit. They even get advantage on the first punch as you burst out from behind, all the more reason to stay in the shadows. Because at 11 you can just turn invisible. It breaks if you leave the darkness or cast magic or attack, but there's no limit on uses or time. Now level 17 is kind of basic, making an opportunity attack when someone else hits a target, but more punches per round is always nice to have. I don't know what else to say, this one's pretty dead set on the theme. You're naturally suited for infiltration, and remember that silence is great utility. Everyone uses it to shut up casters, but it's perfect for making sure no one hears you fighting guards or tearing down doors. And I know you can't pick a lock, but you can look through keyholes and cracks under doors to teleport past them. Just bring a little drill or something and you can get past anything, especially thanks to Pass Without a Trace and Infinite Invisibility. In my humble opinion, you're one of the best scouts possible, and I'd be even more flattering if I placed less value on my life. And you do still have other flavor options. I love the idea of a stagehand who's just really good at set changes and fixing little mistakes without people noticing. You could be some sort of back alley thief or a smuggler or a poacher, but stealth is pretty much inescapable with this one. By the way, um, DMs? Favor for me? Let them see in their own darkness. It's not gonna break anything. Even some of the other monks do it. It was just the first book and they undershot the balance. Speaking of begging your DM for mercy, that's all gonna flip when you roll up the way of the mercy. A monk with a plague doctor flavor of all things. It can look like anything, but the first option is the classic bird beak. You get proficiency with insight, medicine, and an herbalism kit to go with it. The theme is simple. Merciful healing and mercy kill. At level 3, you get your hand of healing, which lets your punch heal instead of hurt. One key to use, but the first one is free when you use your flurry of Blows. On the flip side, Hand of Harm lets you deal extra necrotic damage for just one key per turn. At level 6, the Harming Hand also poisons people. Not with a save, they're just poisoned. Meanwhile, your Healing Hand cures disease, being poisoned, blinded, deafened, stunned, or paralyzed. At level 11, when you use your Flurry of Blows, you can make your hits be healing or hurting without spending any key. And at level 17, for one action, you can bring back the dead. They have to have died within a day, and you have to long rest between uses, but that is still really useful. And honestly, the whole class is. A healer that doesn't lose their attack when they heal, and feels at home on the front line. And the poison makes it hard for their foes to even hit anyone to begin with. My main question is exactly how you lost that medical license. Are you a combat medic, providing healing while knowing where best to hurt? Or maybe a mad doctor, only knowing how to heal because it keeps your test subjects in life for longer? A torturer would work well from that angle. Gotta know how to remove those conditions and keep them conscious. Maybe you were the on-site doctor for a gladiator pit or a boxing ring. So you know some basic first aid, but also how to defend yourself. And what's up with that mask anyway? Are you just trying to hide from malpractice? law? Or is it a symbolic thing? A sign of your order, the mark of your god? Or a really messed up sense of humor? Someone half-conscious sees the skull mask and thinks they're dying, and you just find that hilarious. But if you're really wanting to focus on that death part, the way of the long death is for you. The logic behind long death is that you know how to do it, because frankly you're kind of obsessed with it. At third level, you suck the life out of fallen creatures, gaining temporary HP. At six, you go full Naruto villain and terrify everyone with your raw 
block healing intent. Item 11, if you run out of HP, you can use one key to bring yourself back to one. Because who needs armor when you just refuse to die? But the enemy doesn't have that option, because at level 17 you get Touch of Long Death. 2d10 of necrotic damage for every point you put into it. And unlike most monk abilities that tap out at 3, the maximum key you can use on this one is 10. So just casually blast them for up to 200 damage. 110 on average. Now there's obvious ways to go with this, like an Order of Assassins or Cultists Worshipping Death, but while we love a serial killer terrifying everyone with euphoric frenzy, here's my pitch for Way of Long Death. You're not even trained in fighting. You're just a mad scientist. You don't know how to use a club, but you know the fracture points of their bone. You're terrifying everyone with your emotionless efficiency, and anyone could run a few steps across water if they just understood surface tension and worked on their sprint. And as for your key, you aren't tapping into magic to push beyond your normal limits. Those techniques are your baseline, you just get tired easy. When you're out of key, you're just running on fumes and aren't used to your test subjects fighting back. And no matter what you go with, I would recommend thinking more about that key. Is that divine power from a god you worship? Or raw power siphoned from your soul? Or maybe it's time magic and you're borrowing from that moment you spent meditating. And speaking of time, how is this death long? You instantly exploded their heart with the force of a meteor storm. Way of the Open Hand should have taken that name. Your level 17 ability is Save or Die, except that death isn't instant. At any time over your level and days, you can make that person die as an action. Unless they make the save, then they take 10d10 necrotic damage instead. It only costs 3 key to use, but you do need a separate action to activate it, so it kinda balances out. And I know that save or die sounds really strong, but spellcasters have Wish and Meteor Storm at this point. It's fine. Lower levels are what matter most, and they are much more restrained. At level 11, you get the effect of a Sanctuary spell at the end of a long rest, which makes no one want to hit you until you draw first blood. At 6, you can heal yourself once per long rest, and at level 3, you start with the Open Hand Technique. Open Hand Technique is a buff to your flurry of blows, giving every successful hit an additional effect. You can try to knock them over or push them 15 feet, or just take their reactions away. Flurry of Blows was already your monk's bread and butter. Open Hand specializes in just making it even better. Flurry, stun, then throw them off a cliff. Knock them over and take the reaction. Honestly, this monk would make a good schoolyard bully. Some sort of blue-blooded brat that got private karate lessons. Wait a second. Karate doll directly translates to Way of the Empty Hand. I think this is actually just karate. What level of black belt do you learn to make people's hearts stop? Uh, anyway, this makes for a great non-violent martial artist. You'll kill them if you have to, but you'd rather just drive them off. From masters looking to humble opponents to those who use any tactic it takes to win. Every class has at least one path that doubles down on the stereotype, and half of that is open hand. The kensei is the other half, the weapon master. They use their weapon as deftly as a calligraphy pen or a paintbrush, which you're now proficient with. The path of the kensei has you choose two weapons, one ranged and one melee, so you'll get to pick five by the end. And these can be martial weapons as well, as long as they don't have the heavy property like the battle axe. While using the melee weapon, you can add two to your AC any round you've made an attack. If you have a ranged weapon, you can spend your bonus action adding 1d4 to the damage of a shot. It's not that much, but never say no to free damage. And if you want even more pain, at level 6 you can spend a key to add your martial arts die to an attack. Not only is that basically a second attack landing, it's multiplied on a crit and you decide to use it after you roll. You can always double crit. Your weapons also start counting as magic, useful if your DM is light on the magic weapons. Level 11 is good for that too, letting you spend up to 3 key for an attack and damage boost equal to that amount for 1 minute. This has helped even more at level 17, where you can reroll an attack once per turn. So you're probably gonna hit, and more rolls means more possible crits to boost. I love seeing abilities feed into one another. Now I personally don't really get the hype with Kensei, but uh, word to the wise, let them use heavy weapons. Slave-like weapons are traditional, and one or two extra damage isn't gonna break anything. And besides, have you seen Tasha's Cauldron? They gave an optional rule that basically gives every monk Kensei weapons that they can change in a long rest. Let them have something. And speaking of that something, consider that precious weapon when making a character. Were you trained in the axe and longbow as a defender of the forest? Are you from a coastal monastery trained in tridents for underwater skirmishes? And the book says you're fine to reskin weapons as other things. Maybe you made it from the melted trophies of great bows and it grows larger over time. You're a wrestler with a steel chair great club, a clown with a squeaky hammer, or a chef with a giant's cleaver as a sword. And does your personality match the weapon type? Like someone who's standoffish and cold using whips and bows. I've said this before, but I think that matching personality with a mismatched body type is just peak design. Big weapon, small and cute, preferably pink. I will die on this hill. But let's broaden our focus a bit. Instead of a weapon, let's control the elements. Do you want to master water, earth, 
fire, air, then disappear when the party needs you, while the Four Elements monk gets a giant list of ability options and keep choosing new ones per their subclass feature, everyone gets the elemental attunement option for free, giving you a bunch of minor elemental tricks. Forming an element into a rough shape, chilling or warming things, snuffing out torches, that sort of stuff. But to truly master the elements of Earth, Wind, Fire in September, you must first choose one of the other options from the list. Most of these are just spells, but there's some pretty good options in here, especially the ones with level restrictions like Wall of Stone. And don't worry, whenever you get a new ability, you can also change a previous one, so you won't be stuck with the early game stuff forever. I personally recommend either Water Whip or Unbroken Air to start with, because knocking people out of the air or repositioning them can be really useful. It's a little tricky to build if you're only wanting to focus on one element, but elemental warriors are as old as the dirt they embody, so let me take this moment to ask how the heck you got those powers. Training and stuff, I know, but what did that even look like? Maybe you're a sorcerer, and instead of sending your magic outward through spells and such, you absorb it back into your body for a boost. Or maybe you're touched by Fae and channeling the power of seasons instead of elements. There's precedent for it, just look at the Eladrin. Maybe you made a pact with elemental lords, or you're the ultimate genasi and have a bit of everything in you. Hell, if we're gonna have an elemental inside us, go all the way. Your training was actually to become a thoughtless vessel, allowing spirits of nature and to rampage in your stead. Why learn magic when you can let someone else do it for you? Just think about it, because that theme is most of what this class has. It drains your key incredibly quick. But if you're just after the elemental damage in flight, there's a new subclass that's got you covered. You know they had to make a dragon warrior, it's a classic. At level 3, you learn Draconic, reroll a persuasion or intimidation check once a long rest, and can make your unarmed attacks deal acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. You can also breathe one of those elements in a 20-foot cone or a 30-foot line, dealing two of your martial arts die. You can use it your proficiency bonus times per day, but if you're out, you can spend two key points instead. And Dragonborn can eat their heart out because you don't have to choose an element. You breathe them all whenever you want. At level 6, you can sprout wings when you use your dash or disengage bonus action, letting you fly for your proficiency times per day. At level 11, once per day, you get a 10-foot aura. You can either try to frighten a nearby creature, or give yourself and your allies resistance to one of your usual elements. First time spree, then it costs three key. Oh, and your breath does three damage dice now. Finally, at level 17, you get another set of three powers. Your breath weapon can now be charged for one key to do 4d10 with triple the range. Your aura now does 3d10 damage in a 10-foot radius around you, and you now have a 10-foot radius special blind sight that lets you see invisible creatures. Wait, wouldn't I normally be wrapping up around now? Why is the monk of all things making me talk so much? Anyway, outside of a recommendation to let the monks just fly when they use their dash, because they're already using a key, I honestly really like the dragon monk. About everything I could ask for outside psionic variants. These are disciples of dragons, often literally, sometimes even chosen by a god. But these don't have to just be inspired martial arts. Arts, you can play for yourself as half dragon, or a dragon who got stuck while transformed, or maybe you're some sort of dragon fanatic, and your feral fan obsession had you take horrific steps towards becoming one, like grafting their flesh to your own, or consuming a wormling in its lair and taking it as your home, because that's basically what this subclass is, becoming a dragon. You could always give it a totem barbarian spin and take aspects of different monsters, and I doubt people would call you out if you called yourself a demonologist instead, but dragons really are unique, no other type of creature has this type of ability. Then again, this is D&D, we aren't here to be a dragon, so let's rock the the dragon with Sun Soul. This is a Dragon Ball character, let's just get that out of the way. You're more of a Krillin or a Yamcha than you are a Piccolo, but that's not too bad in the D&D world. Level 3 starts off with a Radiant Sunbolt. You can now replace any unarmed strike with an Energy Blast, doing Radiant damage with a 30-foot range. A lack of range was one of the monk's biggest weaknesses. Whenever you get low on HP, just stay at a range and blast away. 30 feet isn't huge, but your speed really makes it hard for foes to close the gap. And if they do, at level 6 you cast Burning Hands. Kinda weird that it's not Radiant damage, but it's not a bad AoE. And at level 11 you get a much bigger one. Searing Sunburst is a 20 foot radius blast of light with a range of 150 feet. 2d6 isn't much, but it doesn't cost key. Unless you want to bump the damage up, 2d6 per key. At this point, very few things can catch you or outrange you, so you're always in control of how the fight flows. You might not do quite as much damage as other ranged units, but with evasion and arrow catching, they aren't hurting you much either. And when one of you decides to come in close instead of harassing at a range, level 17 gives you Sun Shield. You can turn on a glowing aura of power, a state that very few can reach. As long as as you're in this super state, which lasts as long as you want, you can basically make a special opportunity attack when people hit you in melee. It automatically hits and deals flat damage. 5 plus wisdom modifier. It's not my absolute favorite, but I am a big defender of the Sun Soul. Most classes struggle with key consumption or directly competing with stunning strike. This one's abilities are mostly free and designed for times when stunning strike isn't viable. The monk's biggest problems are low health and lack of range, and this one gets around both. I think that people are just thrown off by the theming and horde of Dragon Ball fans. And I get it, you just played Xenoverse or rewatched Season 3 of Dragon Ball Z a bridge, and now you want to mock and call Sapo on Owlbear. But there's other ways to go with this. Radiant damage is often holy, so praise the sun and use it to blast your enemies. Maybe it's even part of your heritage. You have enough angel blood to release divine power, or replace that angel blood with solar or crystal dragon, breathing beams of light, or maybe you're solar powered, spending your morning soaking in sunlight to release
release it later. You could even say you're part Darkling Bay and have to release Absorb Night or you burn up from the inside. And there's plenty of constructs with radiant energy in their weapons. Maybe you're like an artificer grafting ray guns into their body. But it's useless, useless trying to put this off any longer. No matter what you think about the way of the astral self, good luck being heard over the people arguing if this is a Naruto or a JoJo's reference. Buckle in, this is a big one. The way of the astral self bites by creating a spectral reflection of your soul, then using it to beat the crap out of people. Level 3, for one key you summon your astral arms, attacking everyone you want within 10 feet for twice your martial arts die. They stick around for 10 minutes, letting you attack with an extra 5 feet of range and dealing force damage. They can use wisdom for strength checks and saves, as well as dex or strength based attacks. And since they're making unarmed strikes, you can flurry with them. And apparently this is controversial, but grappling is a strength check. You can use these arms to grapple. That does not leave them unable to attack either. There's no limit on the number of arms, and having your hands full doesn't stop you from unarmed attacking anyway. Anyway, at level 6 you can spend a point to summon the head. You can use the same bonus action as the arms if you like. It lets you see in darkness and magical darkness. You get advantage on insight and intimidation, and can either speak into someone's mind or blast your voice out 600 feet. That's twice as loud as most thunder spells. At 11, the body shows up for free whenever the arms and head are there. This lets you deal an extra die of unarmed damage once per turn, like a weaker but more consistent extra attack. Also, do you remember that thing where monks can deflect ranged attacks like arrows? Well, now you get that for any form of acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, or force damage. And if you get to level 17, the entire spirit comes out to play. 5 key nets you everything from before, but with plus 2 AC and an extra attack per round if you're only using your fist. So 3 attacks per round, 5 including flurry, extra damage on one of them, and who knows how many double dice hits on round 1. And yeah, it's 5 key, but at that point you have 17 per short rest. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this one, but 1, it's probably my favorite, 2, I keep hearing people say it's bad and I don't get why, because 3, unlike most people, I've actually played it. I just don't get why people keep looking at it saying it's bad and walking away. It's better than most monks. But before you go naming yourself after a cover band, I need to mention that there's no limit on what this can look like. Maybe you're a chef calling on things you've cooked in the past to serve you once more, or a long gone loved one protects you always. Perhaps in a past life you were the greatest of heroes, and in times of need that self comes back. If you worship a god or a demon or cosmic horror, they might start reaching through the void when you call. You're a vessel for sealed spirits, or a fey takes over, or even the soul of the planet manifesting in rage. Maybe a demon of desire lets your dream self manifest, but tightens her grip ever stronger as you grow. Maybe psionic experimentation lets a god start to form around you, manifesting from your fear before starving from lack of faith. You could change your form with every battle, mocking or scaring them with a fearsome avatar. You could even have a little marionette and control a big version you create. You have a second character design with no limitations. Go wild! By the way, longtime viewers, you want to hear a secret? Whenever I run Gruff the Buff, this is what he is. Astro Monk with a werebear ghost, training more of his kind. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, before I accidentally stuck myself into these class videos for some reason, I mainly did encounter in monster videos. I do want to get back into them after these next couple classes, but I'll probably do that even quicker through streaming, making little dungeons, or trying to make encounters out of monsters y'all feed me. We'll figure out something, so keep an eye on your sub feed for planned dates, and follow my Twitch if you want some casual gaming. At least, once I have the time and motivation again. You know how it goes, you stretch yourself thin because you want to improve and grow, then a little bit of bad luck puts you on the back foot eternally. I know, I should have given myself more room for life issues and failure, but instead I got burnt out before even starting. I'm reining myself in and should be back at it soon. Goblin guarantee. Honestly, I don't have a choice. The last few months about turned me into a drunken master. That's right, I've saved the best for last, and I'm doing this one authentic. Wait, what are you doing? I thought that was coffee. Sometimes. I use all the cups for a reason. Anyway, drunken master time. Because they don't know what you're gonna do if you don't. You're all nimble and stuff, so you stumble through enemy range without getting hit, and you move faster doing it. And at 6, you can get up from prone for nearly free, and when people miss, you can spend a key to make them hit someone else. At 11, you get to spend 2 to get rid of disadvantage, and at 17, you just hit everyone. Like, you three more, you get 3 more blows in your flurry, just gotta be against different people, but you already move out of range and get extra speed, so you just hit everyone. Oh, and, and the best part is you get extra performance at the start, because it's all pretend. You still got your full wits about you. Oh, God. You really think I get drunk at work? I'm professional, and I'm not a lightweight. Come on. Anyway, that's also my takeaway for ideas. I know we all want to show our youthful spirit and go on a drunken rampage, and you do get the brewing kit to do that, but the core of this is just making sure your enemies can't predict your movement. You're going from Bruce Lee to Jackie Chan. You could be a jester, and the simple chaos of your footwork is just too fast and clever for pros to keep up with. Maybe you're an actor or a stagehand or even a cheerleader. Tumbling and fainting and fake balling. Boxers work great as well, bobbing and weaving through anything thrown at them. Maybe you're seeing a few seconds into the future and dodging their most likely attack. Or you're just really lucky or clumsy. Personally, I'd go for dancer. Actual dance fighting is thematic and great, but I'd opt for something like ballroom dancing.
dancing, rolling to a rhythm that only you can hear, to a dance that only you know. Though I guess from that angle, you could also be Fortnite dancing through the battlefield, zipping around on a caffeine high knowing that anyone old enough to be a threat probably hasn't seen your TikTok feed. I sure haven't, and neither of the rest of the monks. Speaking of which, everyone likes to dunk on them, but I love them. They're great for new players, they train new DMs, they don't have the strength of the paladin or the power of the wizard, but I have never regretted playing a monk. And if I hear one more demand that our world's monks follow your world's rules, I'm gonna roll a d20 to see if your realistic knight actually died of cholera by age 14 and never disgraced my table. I love realism, but if we can accept literal magic and blatant violations of the square cube law, we can accept that someone stronger than a gorilla can hit as hard as your stick, okay? But if the monk just isn't quite what you're looking for, I would suggest rogue for similar skirmishing. And if you'd rather be a frontliner with more bulk, try barbarian or fighter. I'd also like to settle in class. Today we find divinity through stubbornness and devotion. The paladin is a durable combatant who can turn spell slots to raw damage when they hit. They're among the most stereotyped classes, sometimes for a good reason, but they can be incredibly fun to play, especially for new players. Today we'll cover how they work, what their different oaths look like, and some fun ideas for new ways to view them without mechanically changing a thing. You ready? Let's go! So usually I would start with telling you how they have the second highest HP and get all armor and weapons, but this time let's get the preconceptions out of the way. If there's one thing you know about paladins, it's probably their lawful stupid reputation. This comes from previous editions, where you weren't allowed to play a paladin unless you were lawful good, to the point that your god would remove your power if you repeatedly acted out of line, or disrespected authority, lied, used poison, or associated with people you knew were consistently offending your morals. If you have a great DM and group, the restriction could create phenomenal characters in roleplaying. One of my favorite adventures had four of us trying to figure out how to operate within different alignment requirements, and dealing with the fallout when half of us willingly broke them for the cause. That said, most groups don't have that golden combination, especially with new players or teenagers, hence the reputation. However, none of that is required in this edition, so don't worry about the stereotype. All of that flavor text might try to claim you're good, but without mechanical backing, their opinion can be ignored this time. Well, more easily ignored. Not like we let them always get in our way before. People would always get around it by just having low intelligence and letting the party trick them. And speaking of tricks, you get a surprising amount. At level 1 you get in Leon Hands, a pool of daily healing points. You can spend them as an action to heal anyone you touch for however much you want, as long as you have the points. For 5, you can even cure poison or disease. Incredibly handy for touching people up or keeping yourself on the front lines where you belong. I always recommend keeping a few of these in reserve to bring up someone unconscious. You also get Divine Sense. A few times a day, you can locate all Celestials, Fiends, and Undead within 60 feet. Pretty situational, but if your DM likes using shape-shifting and invisibility, it can be nice. Most abilities they have follow that same sort of design, either targeting one nearby creature or everyone in the area. Cleansing Touch at level 14 lets you touch someone and remove spell effects, and you'll be collecting abilities that do something to everyone within 10 feet, increased to 30 at level 18. Or Protection lets you and your allies add charisma to saving throws, Courage makes them immune to fear, and you'll get another one at level 7 based on your subclass. The main time you get a power that breaks this mold is level 2, easily their best shared level. First, you get a fighting style. Your options are a bonus to AC, reducing hits or damage on your ally, more damage on your melee weapon, gaining blindsight, or learning two cleric cantrips. I like the last one as it gives you spells you can always use, unlike the rest of your magic, because you also get magic. You pick a small number of spells off a tiny spell list, but you can change them every day and have 13 exclusive ones. I personally love Compelled Duel to force foes to bite you, but most of them are smite spells. Cast the spell as a bonus action to do more damage on your attacks, usually with an added effect like blinding them. If you just want raw power, however, turn to your third level 2 ability, Divine Smite. Burn a spell slot to add 2d8 radiant damage to an attack. You choose to do this after the attack lands, and it increases with your spells not burned. And yes, this can stack with a smite spell. Eventually, it never fully turns off, letting you add a d8 on every attack. The paladin doesn't get much magic, but when they need to, they can rip people apart. Now, attentive viewers might notice that I never mentioned a level 20 capstone feature. That's because they're the only class that doesn't share their final ability. Most paladins end up with a minute-long transformation, but not always, and they do different things. What transformation you get is determined by your oath, a fancy word for your subclass. Your oath is the source of your power, and your devotion to its tenets is what gives you divine strength, both in the general class-wide sense and specialized abilities at level 3, 7, 15, and 20. This is also the last holdover from previous editions, as your DM is advised to hold you to those tenets. Not nearly as harshly as previous editions, but they are able to force you to abandon this class or switch your oath if you keep willfully breaking it or unrepentantly cross it. It's like a warlock with their patron if the contract actually mattered. So let's take a look at what paths you have to choose from. Ancients Paladins are your nature subclass, devoted to life in the world. Rekindle hope through mercy and kindness, defend love and beauty, keep laughter and song in your heart, and be a beacon of joy for all. To facilitate this, all subclasses start with bonus spell options and two channel divinity options. Channel divinity is a once per short rest ability. In the Ancients case, you can bind someone with spectral vines to restrain them, or force all fey and fiends within 30 feet to be turned. Not like spin around, they have to run as far away from you as they can, using 
their action and losing their reaction. It also breaks illusions and shape-shifting. For the extra spells, you get things like Ensnaring Strike, Misty Step, Plant Growth, it's mostly nature stuff. Your level 7 aura grants resistance to damage from spells, which is wonderful. At 15, you can cause a hit to drop you to 1 HP instead of 0 once per day, and can't be magically aged. I forgot there were things that could even still magically age you in this version. Anyway, finally, at level 20, you become the Elder Champion. It's supposed to be a once per day thing, but all recent subclasses have added the ability to recharge this for a 5th level spell slot. For 1 minute, you have 10 regeneration, enemies within 10 feet have disadvantage against your spells and channel, and you can choose to cast these spells as a bonus action instead of an action. That 10 healing around doesn't stop when unconscious, so nothing's ever gonna keep you down. It also gives you a nature aesthetic, like antlers or bark skin, or acquiring moss, consume- Wait a second, this is supposed to be the Green Knight Paladin who cares about life, not honor. It literally says that they don't believe in the principle of courage, but the tenet says that you have to be a beacon of courage. Well, if they're not gonna play by the theme, then neither will we. Be a magical girl, dropping moonbeams and resisting spells through friendship. Your ancient words that terrify fiends are your transformation catchphrase. Be an alarmingly muscular artist trying to spread your work to the world. Painting ropes to bind or walls to ward. And I mean you're satisfying your oath as long as you're making people happy and it fills your heart up with sunshine to see them smile, so be an extremely well-armored pole dancer. Though you could always lean more into that guardian of natural beauty. One of Goblin University's resident paladins is Dale of the Dell. A guardian whose grove was overtaken by ghost plant and became a green drinking Dompier himself thanks to his bond with the forest. He still follows the tenets of the protector, but I feel like it's secretly because so many monsters are green. He scares me. And now ancients have an ability that's oddly anti fey but the Watcher Paladin wants all creatures from all other planes to go home. Bay, angels, demons, the army of people staring into our world right now, and every other time I talk about adventuring, how do you send them home when most of them are already home? Are you okay? Depends on if they like the video. Anyway, doesn't matter. Watchers are all about people keeping to themselves. Stay alert, be loyal to your friends and your duty, and do not trust gifts from fiends. Or fey, I know that one's not on the list, but trust me. That whole staying alert thing flavors their spells. Things like alarm, see invisibility, counterspell, divination, and abjuration. Acquire knowledge and defend yourself from what you find. Your channel can give a few people advantage on all mental saving throws for a minute, which are some of the worst effects, so incredibly useful. And remember that turning fey and fiends thing that the Oath of Ancients had? Same thing, but add in aberrations, celestials, and elementals. Your aura lets everyone add your proficiency to initiative, and at level 15 you can bully wizards. If anyone around you succeeds in intelligence, wisdom, or charisma saving throw, you can do 2d8 plus charisma to whoever made them make that check. If you break into a wizard's home and set off a ward, you can smite them from another plane of existence for daring to lock their front door. There's no range, it doesn't even say that you have to be on the same plane of existence. He might be dead and you just killed his imp self 500 years later. That is just petty. <laughs> anyway, your max level form is Mortal Bulwark. Through side 120 feet, advantage to hit all those monster types you can turn, and every hit counts as a banished spell if they aren't native to this plane. Forget the Ancient's Elder Champion. This is the Old Man build. This is Get Off My Lawn Incarnate. This ultimate introvert draws godlike power from wanting people to go away, and its tenets are basically just be an adventurer. So have fun with why you're like this. Are you a farmer with a woodcutting axe and a holy book trying to send these devils back to hell? An introverted goth kid from a magical forest who learned to ward to keep things out of your room? Be the sort of person who gets wrapped up in a Lovecraftian plotline by knowing too much, and now you're paranoid and constantly gathering more info on these creatures. If you're ever wanting to be a paranormal investigator, this is it. Of course, if you don't want to harass creatures for existing, maybe redemption is more your speed. For them, violence is a weapon of last resort. Evil is learning and circumstance, so reach out to these creatures and convince them to change. Follow up with them, set them example for others to live by. And most importantly, if you've decided a creature is hopeless, execute without mercy or hesitation. All of your spells fall along this line. Things to calm or hold down your phone. Your divinity gives you plus 5 persuasion or hit an enemy with the force of their last attack in radiant damage. If the enemy wizard uses disintegrate, you can do the same right back. Who needs counter spell when you have counter smite? Trick question, you do, because you also have counter spell. Your aura lets you take the damage of an attack against an ally, and at level 15 you automatically heal whenever you're below half health and conscious. And of course, 20. The Emissary of Redemption. You resist all damage and deal half of it back to the attacker, except this isn't a one minute transformation. It's permanent until you attack someone, in which case it drops for that person. And reflecting damage doesn't count as an attack. If you're focused on taking hits and protecting allies and don't care too much about direct damage, this subclass is perfect for you. And I don't just mean as a paladin, this might be one of your favorite subclasses overall. Of course, this all assumes that you don't want to hurt people, but I gotta wonder why. Are you just too nice and don't want anyone getting hurt? Or do you think fighting's beneath you and everyone needs to learn their place? Are you flavored like a bard or jester, dancing and taunting?
taunting while throwing beguiling spells? Cause let's be real here, holding someone down for your friends to beat up makes you just as much of a killer as the one who took the shot. There's a good chance that you're punishing them for defending themselves. Go full gas night on your enemy, I guess. Or just own up to it. Beating them down and talking is a valid strategy. Work for Naruto? Anyway, back to harassing things for existing in your line of sight. Devotion is the most bog-standard paladin you can find. Honesty, courage, duty, Honor, protecting the weak and those entrusted to you. Obey those with authority over you. Become the most romanticized knight possible, for that is the Devotion Paladin. They know spells like Beacon of Hope, Guardian of Faith, and Sanctuary. Their channel ability makes their weapon magical, glowing, and hit better. You can also channel to turn fiends and the undead. Your aura stops you from being charmed. Your level 15 gives you a permanent protection from good and evil. And finally, you get the, the Holy Nimbus. Nimbus. For one minute, you praise the sun, which shines upon you in a large beam of light. Enemies within the bright light take 10 radiant damage around, and you get advantage on saves from spells cast by fiends and undead. I don't know what else to say, the flavor text calls them white knights and holy warriors. These and the next paladin are the most deep old crusader you can get. These are your shining knights and perfect paladins of old. Pick a god and pray, but they won't hear you over the charging pally yelling Dallas <laughs> yelling Dallas <laughs> yelling Deus Volt. You probably already know what you want to play, because you can't turn around in fantasy without tripping over one of these. Therefore, my advice to you is to remember where you are. You're a tanky mage with big damage and healing and the power of god and anime on your side. It's really easy to believe your own hype, but remember that there are others at this table. It's fine to get excited, great to love your character, you should do cool things and have fun. But try not to dominate every conversation, make every choice, and sign everyone up for every mission. You are a main character, not the main character. So don't hog all the screen time. And sorry if I've been getting preachy this episode, but we are talking about a punchity priest, and that goes double if you play Oath of Glory. Pretty simple, they believe that they and their friends are destined for glory and heroics. Glory through action, for challenges or tests to be overcome with jolly cooperation. So hone your body and overcome failure, rise again for victory. They learn spells like heroism and haste, with channel divinity into channeling athleticism. 10 minutes of improved athletics or acrobatics, lifting twice as much and jumping better. Or you can throw temporary HP at your friends when you land a smite. Your aura makes everyone move faster, and your level 15 is a parry. Bonus AC is a reaction, and if they miss, you can strike back. Eventually, you get Moving Magic. Another one of those minute forms where you become the perfection you're hyped up to be. You get advantage on charisma checks, you can reroll a saving throw every round, and once per turn when you miss an attack, you can rewrite your legend to say you hit. And I love how it mentions that even at level 20, your legends might be exaggerated. Of course, the obvious angle is the bumbling but enthusiastic knight. From Don Quixote to Solaire, it's a tried and true knight for a reason. Maybe you're just a really nice gym bro, the kind that's really enthusiastic about helping everyone be the best they can be. Maybe you're a thrill seeker, an adrenaline junkie, or a hunter always after better prey. Come to think of it, what is the legend that you're seeking? Are you wanting to be known for liberation or fighting or helping others? Do you have a different reputation you're trying to overcome, like a dark past or previous failure? Maybe you have some sort of cool title you're trying to shake because of a secret embarrassing history. You're known as Burning Justice because you were serving tables and launched hot soup at a politician when you tripped. But you were covered in food and ripped your pants and everyone knows it was an accident. This was mockery. Or maybe you're the beauty of the lake because after a fight they found you passed out on a park bench with half your lunch strewn all over. Someone made a painting, it wasn't flattering, it, it's a whole thing. However, you can avoid that if the glory isn't for yourself. The crown is about the glories of civilization, law above all else except loyalty, which is above law and even oaths. That seems counterproductive as an oath. Courage, though, doing what needs to be done and taking responsibility for your actions. Yes, civilization. Your channel can turn the tide and heal everyone around you, or stops your enemies from moving more than 30 feet away. Your spells are similar, things like Compel Duel and Spirit Guardians and Aura of Vitality. Breaking the mold, however, you don't get an aura. Instead, you can take damage for adjacent creatures, for none shall be hurt on your watch. Level 15 gives you advantage against paralysis and stun, and eventually you become the Exalted Champion. Champion. You resist bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons, and an aura of advantage on both wisdom and death saves. That's where your aura went, and to make up for lost time, it goes on for a full hour. Look at this hippopotamus! Oath of Crown and Queen and Country? Yes, I- what has gotten into me with this voice? Look, I know some of the Oath of Crown stuff might look a little weak, but it's still a blast. One of my buddies was a fantastic Triton one, with a fun fish out of water interplay of him learning that things are different on land and getting to make up packs from down below. Let your background and species take a leading role here. There's plenty of customization just comparing a paragon of goblin law to one of dwarven or elven law. Now throw in your background, cause how does that affect you? Maybe you struggle to uphold the law with urchins because you were one. I know it's theft, but just let them have the bread. Or maybe you're an artist focused on punishing theft and plagiarism. You could take the archaeologist background to be an amateur historian who thinks the ancients had some great ideas and you're learning to resurrect them. Or you could ditch the whole cop theme and become the leader of a war band. After all, inspiration is the real theme of these abilities. Maybe you're the rare and mythical folk hero. Or you're just a decent shift lead. Same thing. No matter how you 
you cut it, Crown is great at empowering and protecting your allies. You don't have to go full imperialist. That's the next one. Conquest paladins are all about subjugation. Mere order isn't enough. Apparently one of their biggest enemies is other conquest paladins who turn to hell because they're about law, not morality. This is apparently too far? Did the others not read their own tenets? Because they can just look down, they're burned into their flesh. That was the flame of hope so their will is shattered and they are left too terrified to disobey. Rule with an iron fist, your word is law and those who defy shall be made into an example. Strength above all, might makes right and the strongest alone should rule. That seems pretty straightforward to me. I don't know why talking to a Marinlith is suddenly way too far. Your spells are things like command, fear, and dominate person. Your channel can give you a plus 10 to hit or frighten enemies within 30 feet. And that's better than it sounds because your aura ability damages all frightened creatures and stops them from moving. At 15, you deal psychic damage to anything that hits you and your ultimate form gives you a transformation, the Invincible Conqueror. You resist all damage, make an extra attack, and crit on a 19 or 20. Good luck to anything opposing you. Conquest Paladins are perfect for pure evil. Now some of the best adventurers I know have been evil, but it's one of those things where the player really has to know what they're doing and be acting in good faith or it's going to be bad for everyone. I completely understand just not wanting to mess with it. If someone's wanting to be evil, they really have to earn my trust first. Anyway, if general domination's not your thing, you can always try to be an overbearing parent who thinks they know best, or an ignorant noble who legitimately thinks that they're doing good thanks to how sheltered they were. Keep it small, be some crazed teenager trying to collect and display all the world like a pile of plushies. But honestly, the best way to make this not evil is to just change the tenets. Unless you're an adventurers league, most teams will be fine if you change them as long as they fit the theme. Instead of subjugation, lean into spreading fear and be a horror monster. Change your fear to sadness, you're just so depressed it spreads to your enemies like a plague, making them give up and run or just freeze and cry. I can't get the thought of Eeyore the Conqueror out of my head. It's inside out, but sadness is actually out and grabbed a claymore. <laughs> look, if you're wanting to go with the bad methods but actually a good person thing, maybe you should look at vengeance instead. Oh wow, they're literally called a dark knight. This is the vigilante paladin, the anti-hero. Fight your sworn foes without mercy by any means necessary. You'll prioritize the greater evil and help people recover when you fail to stop them, but this is the paladin that's dripping an edge. You get spells like Hunter's Mark and Banishment and nearly anything else a pally would want for killing. It's a loaded list. Whenever you channel, you can either frighten a foe or gain advantage on attacks against them for one minute. You don't get an aura since I guess you work alone or something, but instead you can move half your speed whenever you hit an attack of opportunity. You can't let your villain of the week get away after all. At level 15, your soul of vengeance lets you use your reaction on your turn for an extra attack, as long as they're under that advantage version of your channel divinity. And finally, you transform into the Avenging Angel. You grow wings and frighten things within 30 feet. You also have advantage when attacking frightened enemies. Obviously, this is the Paladin Vigilante. Even the book admits you might not be lawful. And if you want that, feel free. Running a superhero is great. There's hardly anything that more perfectly matches with I get my power for my drive and moral code, which is why I will now recommend taking that away. Traditionally, these oaths weren't just to yourself or the concept of existence. They were oaths made to a god like a contract. When you think about it, the paladin was the first warlock. Bring that back. You made an oath to a devil to get your revenge. You gathered eldritch power and your oath is just self-made rules to keep yourself from dwelling on your knowledge and going mad. You made an oath to Nemesis and she holds you to it if you want to continue channeling her power. And this works for any paladin, but I find it especially good for vengeance. Otherwise, I feel like we'd have legions of these things running around, hunting down every dragon and bandit. Eventually, the families of the villains would become them, and then the whole world would be nothing but a field of vengeance eating itself, which does make sense, but including a cost keeps things in check. Now, as much as other paladins fear vengeance or hate conquest, at least they still stick to the plan, one the universe seems to think is fine. Oathbreakers do not. These are in the DM guide because they're typically evil and meant to be a villain, but you can still use it with DM approval. Your spells are themed on hell, madness, pain, etc. Your channel can either frighten those around you or completely dominate an undead for 24 hours. At 15, you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons, and at 20, you get a special 30-foot aura once per day. It reduces light, damages all frightened enemies, gives disadvantage on all foes who need to see, and can deal necrotic damage to an enemy as a bonus action. All of these options are pretty dang strong, and you've got a nice idea for a theme here. But here's the weird part. Your level 7 aura of hate gives extra damage to all undead and fiends. It doesn't let you choose, it's all of them, including the enemies, and you can't turn this off. I mean, it's a DM option, it wasn't really supposed to be an issue. But conceptually speaking, there's even more issues. The book says that you broke your oath to pursue evil or dark ambition. The lights burning in your heart are finally extinguished. That's why your subclass features are replaced with these ones. But tenants make the paladin, and you don't have to have good ones. You've seen the conquest paladin. The books got rid of the lawful good requirement, then made you have distinct and usually good laws that can turn you into this if you break them too much. You still have to be lawful because your laws are what give you power. And you might be thinking, oh, they're personal laws, but the gold dragon, bone devil, and judge of all cosmos are all lawful. But they are definitely not the same laws. The point 
point is order, and you are literally drawing your power from self-imposed order. Which makes it even weirder that this has none. Where is that power coming from? Look, the obvious customization question is why you broke the oath, I don't have to tell you that. So my question is what sustains your power in the aftermath? Is your own will so strong that it formed a spark of divinity, turned you into something like a demigod? Are you just so used to siphoning off otherworldly power that when heaven casts you out, you reflexively turn to hell? Maybe your spoken oath is just training wheels, and being true to yourself is what does it. I like to think of an oathbreaker as having latched onto their power as it was stripped away, and the struggle twisted it into what it is now. Anyway, speaking on the paladin as a whole, I think it's a really fun class, one of my favorites. It's powerful, flavorful, and for an experienced player, the oath provides an interesting base to build around. Meanwhile, for a new player, it's one of the most friendly casters. Their spellcasting symbol can be changed at any time, and can be turned into smites if you don't like your options. They're tough enough to handle any mistake you made, their abilities are usually pretty simple, and just existing on the front lines is already a good help. If you're wanting to lean more into magic, you can always try the cleric, or try the ranger or fighter for a similar feel with a different theme. That theme is both their strength and their weakness. They're intertwined with an alignment system that 5e has pretty much removed. Yeah, they talk about it a lot, but they ripped it out of everything. Even protection from good and evil just cares about your creature type, not your alignment. I like alignment, but even I think they should have grown a backbone and put it out of everyone's misery. Pick a lane. It is bizarre that a cleric can be removed from their alignment and gone, but not the paladin, because effectively it is still stuck with alignment, just using worse words. But to be fair, it did kind of have to be. A paladin without a code is like a mage without magic or a vertebrate without a spine. You might be something cool, but you aren't that because those words have meaning. I think it's really cool that the class has a narrative aspect, and the point of the paladin is to strive towards an ideal. You might stumble, you're not perfect, but the drive towards that ideal gives you power. It's like a better narrative counterpart to the wizard's spellbook. Your words are just written in your heart. The shattering of your belief being the equivalent of burning your spellbook just makes sense. Because of that, my advice is that the DM and the player should work out their own core tenets for the character they have in mind. Feel free to reflavor your subclass, but make sure it fits with the oath you build. As long as they're striving towards those goals, they're a paladin. If they start faltering, they have visions or dreams or messengers of a god, warning them that they are falling with increasing desperation. They feel in their soul that their power is slipping. Given that chance, the player might change and repent, or they could swear a new set of oaths fitting who they are now. If they go that route, make them go through a trial to prove their devotion. Or they could lose their blessing, twisting into an oath breaker should they refuse to return the power. And if you don't want to play with any of that, just remove the whole oath thing altogether. There's not really much of a point if it doesn't have teeth. It's like a cleric's god or a warlock patron. Make them matter or why bother? Wait, hold up. I forgot to mention. Level 3, all paladins are immune to disease. I've seen people get disease twice in over a decade, and that was in Pathfinder, and I caused it. Contagion, my love, we lost you in the addition change. Nothing will fill the hole in my heart. You will be missed. Because you are gone, unlike my coffee supporters who are by my side helping me buy things for the show. Barrel Goblin and Modern Masquerade, thank you so much as always for the support of my coffee. And hey, if you stopped or you couldn't begin with or you just didn't want to perfectly valid, I still remember and appreciate you. And as much as I do love it when you like and comment and sub, it really is worth it just to know that you watched. Anyway, I am definitely rambling. All together, people. Happy Happy holidays. Class dismissed. I'm not sure about this one. It's fine. Welcome to the Rogue episode, everyone, full of sneaky freaks and thieves and hitmen. And anyone else who likes to be unnoticed. As the president rogues, we can film near anywhere. We're masters of avoiding notice and weaponry. Nobody gets the drop on us once we get some XP, and we're here to prove it. And I don't approve, but need rent. Well, if she's not good for a sneak attack, she's hanging with the wrong crowd. You ready? Let's, Let's go! go. Stop Why screaming and pick up the camera! No, 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 you don't turn that off. I'm professional. I'm always ready. You're really gonna be like this, huh? <clears throat> Okay. Settle in, class. Today we're learning about the rogue. Originally called thief, but they can be more than that. Only a D8 for HP, pretty low for someone without magic, and the fact that they only get light armor and some pretty weak weaponry doesn't help either. What does help is that they're very good at not getting hit to begin with. Proficiency in dexterity, intelligence, and eventually wisdom, with plenty of skills to choose from like deception and stealth. You also basically have proficiency with proficiency, getting double to some of those bonuses. Your level 2 ability lets you take some extra actions to run, disengage, or hide. At level 5, it's a reaction to have the damage that that hits you, and at 7 you take half damage from anything with a dex save, fully cancelling the damage if you pass. At 11 you can't roll under 10 on a skill check, and at 18 attacks can't have advantage on you unless you're incapacitated. Your level 20 capstone is that once per short rest, if your attack misses you can choose to hit anyway, or roll a 20 on any ability check. And speaking of hitting, you might wonder how those hits keep up with everyone else on damage. Things like poison can help, but the main thing you get from the start is sneak attack. If you have advantage on an attack or an allies within 5 feet of the target, deal an increasingly large pile of extra damage on the attack. Just make 
make sure it's a finesse or ranged weapon like a dagger and that you don't have disadvantage from something else. This is the bread and butter of the rogue, making them really feast or famine. You're either stabbing someone with cutlery for like 4 damage, or you're casually rolling more dice in one hit than the barbarian might all fight. It makes them great with a group, though out of all the classes, the rogue ends up on their own the most. Proficiency in thieves tools, great stealth with plenty of skills to capitalize on it, damage output designed around blitzing someone that didn't see you, makes us perfect for getting in and out quick, or getting yourself into trouble with nobody to help. Don't split the party as a rule for a reason. You can break the rules when you're good enough to get around the danger, but before you do, you gotta know why it's there. And every rogue has a special toolkit to do that, given by their subclass at level 3, 9, 13, and 17. Let's start with a basic one, Assassin. You can poison, disguise yourself, and eventually even create false identities or mimic another person perfectly, which is cool and all, but we're really here for your other main ability, Assassinate. If you attack someone before they take their first turn, you have advantage on the roll, and if they're surprised, you automatically critical hit. Given that your sneak attack damage is doubled on a crit, you might be starting combat by taking out a third or more of their health, taken to an extreme at level 17, with double damage or even instant death. How good the rest of your stuff is depends on how social your game is, but Assassinate alone can carry you pretty well in any campaign. Now I know you hear Assassin and you want to be a fantasy Italian from a time long gone, leaping from high above to instantly kill your foes, and I will admit that Mario is a great way to play it, but he's not the only concept. Maybe you're a little old lady who learned poison from gardening and disguises from helping her community theater. The sneak attacks are from her self-defense classes on the weekends. Maybe you're a surgeon gone rogue, or a method actor taking things way too far, or even that clown I keep trying to get you to play for some reason. It's not my fault, y'all have put that Killer Clowns video as one of my top three played for the week every week since it was released. Blame yourselves. Anyway, I wouldn't use any of those. Slinging poison while changing your look, high persuasion despite low charisma, casually dealing irreparable harm to those around you. You just sound like an average beauty blogger to me. But if you're loving that social aspect, consider the mastermind. Not so many improvements on stabbing, but you learn disguising, forgery, gambling, two languages, and can mimic other people's accents to sound like you're native to the area. You're actually pretty utility focused, getting to use the help action as a bonus action and from 30 feet away if they're attacking. Everyone's gonna like you if you're constantly giving them advantage on their attacks, which is a very good thing, because at 13 you can duck behind people to make them take an attack for you. Try to use it on enemies if you can. At 17 you can't be affected by mind reading without consent, can try to bluff people you do allow to read your mind, or even bluff magic itself by making spells like Zone of Truth always say you're being truthful. Probably won't be used, but it's cool. Oh, and uh, at level 9 you can observe a creature for a minute to tell if it's smarter, wiser, charisma -er, or higher level than you. Only two at a time though, let's not get overzealous here. Look, if you're playing this, just make sure you're in an intrigue heavy game or a short one. Nobody mentions this, but if you're only playing until level 8, you only get your level 3 ability. So while the Mastermind's later abilities can be situational at best, if you're playing a low to mid level campaign, you're not really going to be that behind or ahead with most of these. I like using these for the unassuming character. Your darling Southern Bell socialite who can still strike like a viper. A halfling posing as a human child to gather and sell info. Distracting foes by yelling out secrets. An unassuming accountant forging numbers and trying to flee his mafia ties. Okay, I've got to admit that one's a little bit tame. I expected the mastermind to have a lot more intelligence abilities. Honestly, my money's on the inquisitive for cleverness. You can't roll lower than an 8 when using insight to tell if someone's lying, and you can also make an insight check to sneak attack someone without advantage. Eventually, you'll even start to do more damage if you sneak attack people that way. Looking for hidden things or deciphering clues is also a bonus action, which is pretty niche but can really help with some kinds of puzzles. Speaking of which, level 9 gives you advantage on perception and investigation if you're only moving at half speed. And if that's somehow still not enough, level 13 lets you sense all shapeshifters, illusions, and any other magic trying to trick you within 30 feet. You don't know all the specifics and you can only do it a few times a day, but it's still pretty useful if your DM's tricky. And honestly, that's the main reason you would use an Inquisitive to begin with. It's another social-based rogue, even more than the Mastermind. It really focuses on the utility and skill-based side of the rogue. Now obviously this is supposed to be an investigator of some kind, but from detectives to superheroes to a party of teenagers and their pet, that still leaves you plenty of space to work in. Why are you so perceptive? Are you a prodigy or is it years of training? Are you a massive nerd who read too many novels and learned all the tropes? Or an ancient criminal come out of retirement who knows all the tricks because they came up with most of them? Maybe all your guesses are right for the wrong reasons. Or you notice things by just happening to trip into them. Maybe your vague feelings are the constant whispering of swirling spirits. And speaking about spirits, what about the phantom? It's basically an elevation of that last concept. You walk the line of life and death so much that you're attuned to it. Ear to the wall, hearing the whispers of the dead. Those whispers let you swap out one of your proficiencies on a short rest. They can also turn into soul rending screams when you sneak attack someone a few times a day, letting you roll half of those dice again to attack someone else with necrotic damage. At 17, you can do that to two people, letting it tear through minions while fighting the boss. At level 9, those you see die join your chorus, trapped inside a small trinket. You can actually have a few saved up, and just having one on you gives you advantage on con saves and death saves. You can also shatter one to use that stab and a half feature without using a charge, or you can break it to ask the soul inside a question, but they're allowed to lie, so there's usually not much point. You can also shatter it to recharge your once per day ghost walk 
ability. This allows you to basically turn into a ghost. You can slowly fly, walk through walls, attacks against you have disadvantage, and it can last for 10 minutes. It is perfect for scouting. Come to think of it, it really does make sense that the rogue subclasses are so hit or miss. Time to the rogue's whole deal. And this one is a fantastic hit. I know, I'm a sucker for the whole grave collar edge, but it's just so cool. But if this isn't your aesthetic for some reason, the big question is what else is helping you? You can switch the undead influence with fiends and most people wouldn't even notice, but what about the earth itself? The spirit of the land whispers to you, binding foes in wicker effigy and making them wither around you as you drive wooden daggers into them. Go for more of a homely route with the extra attacks as smites, ripping the life from foes as you forcibly wrench their souls from their body and into the afterlife. And of course there's plenty of evil pay to draw upon, or just go with a sort of psychic rogue, saving imperfect copies of your foe's mind, and dealing necrotic damage by just physically ripping the blood from their body with your brain. Though I admit that is a bit of a stretch. The true psychic rogue already exists with soul knife. Okay, so you have psychic powers, shown by a pool of dice, you spend them to use your abilities, and can regain one per short rest, but it takes a long rest to get them all back. For example, if you fail at a skill you're proficient in, you can roll one of these dice and add the number to the check, only spending the dice if you succeed. That is their other main trick. Most of these don't make you spend the dice unless it actually worked, though some just can't fail, like Psychic Whispers. It lets you connect a few creatures together mentally, and you can just talk freely as long as you're within a mile. But your main feature is Psychic Blades. You make a knife out of mental energy. It's throwable, it deals psychic damage, and you can summon a second weaker one if you have a free hand, so you're never unarmed. At level 9, you can roll one of your dice and add that number to the attack roll, and as a bonus action, you can throw a blade and teleport to it. At 13, you can turn invisible, and at 17, you can stun someone by jamming your blades into their brain. You can only do it once per long rest, but you can spend three dice to recharge it early. And I am sorry that was a long one. But basically anything involving psionics seems to be so much wordier than its magical counterpart. On the bright side, we finally have a throwing weapons rogue. Of course, the issue on my end is that this one really knows what it is. Psychic damage is very specific about its sources. Maybe you could go an Eldritch Horrors route, turn the knives into grasping tentacles appearing below them, warping through cracks in reality. But I find the more fruitful way to customize is to explain how it's doing the damage. Are you giving them many PTSD attacks, blasting all of their traumas at once? Because those knives leave no physical wounds, it's all going to the brain and soul. Maybe you're spiking them with beer to stop their heart, or overloading their spine, or racking their nerves with phantom pain. An Eldritch one could overwhelm their mind with horror and impossible knowledge, or you could just make them so happy they die. A much more extreme version of what happens when you leave me a comment, hit that sub button, or give me a thumbs up. Ha ha, very funny, I meant the button. Ring that bell so it'll be more likely to show up on your recommended bar, since you might just accidentally overlook my thumbnail in the sub feed. No hard feelings, I know it happens, especially if you're like me and have 520 subscriptions. Why? Why? Well, excuse me for liking things. I still run out of videos all the time. Most of them only upload every few weeks or months, or just disappeared. Besides, a lot of classic people on here. And speaking of classic, the Swashbuckler. Probably not the first to come to mind, but it's about as traditional as you can get for the concept of a rogue. Flamboyant fencers, pirates, the classic hidden heart of gold who might break yours on the cover of a romance novel. Their fancy footwork means that creatures they attack can't counter with an opportunity attack, letting them dance in and out of range without consequence. Eventually, they even get advantage on athletics and acrobatics with their elegant maneuvering. Their spicy suaveness lets them add charisma to their initiative, and they can always sneak attack in a close quarters duel, as long as they don't have disadvantage. At level 9, you can make a persuasion check to taunt them into that duel, making it hard for their foes to look away. You can also use this on people who aren't hostile to you to charm them, except unlike most other methods of charming, there's no limitation and they aren't aware you charm them. I mean, it just makes sense because there's no tricks or magic. You're just that suave, no one can hate you. Oh, and their last thing lets them re-roll a missed attack with advantage once per short rest. Depending on how often you stop, that can be pretty good. Just like everything else, I mean you have a rogue who can talk their way out of nearly anything and is great in a duel when that fails. Mechanically wonderful and thematically, I mean this is Zoro, Captain Jack, Puss in Boots, Inigo Montoya, the list goes on. I know I'm supposed to be giving weird takes in this section, but the swashbuckler is already a weird take. It's a rogue encouraging you to be loud and boastful and charming. And yeah, I mean you're able to ignore it, turn it into a sort of laser focused secret agent slipping through combat with unerring skill. You could make it some sort of weird psionic charming ability, psychically warding things off and physically turning people's heads towards you, and of course the naturalistic take, slipping around with bestial instinct and charming people through pheromones. But you can have fun with that. After all, why miss your chance to be boisterous? If you don't like to be that sort of mold breaker, however, we'll just go back to basics with the most classic of all, the thief. You can do things like opening locks, using items, or use sleight of hand as a bonus action, letting you tear through an enemy mansion in a moment. And that's assuming you even bothered to use a door instead of using your climb speed to clamber through a window. Eventually you gain advantage on stealth when creeping around, and can ignore most magic item requirements to make sure that loot is always worth it. Everything they get is great for stealth work, though it takes a bit of a turn at level 17. It's a beautifully simple ability. On the first round of combat, you take an extra turn. Either get a head start that few can hope to match, or just draw 
drop 22d6 on their head before they can move. But aside from that late game power jump, the thief is basically what people think of when they think rogue. You're an infiltration specialist, a spy, a ninja. This is your classic rogue from the dungeon crawl days, except a 2e thief player would have killed for half of these abilities. But what this rogue especially highlights is something that's true for all rogues. Items are your friend. Cow chops and ball bearings stop pursuers and put distance between you and an enemy. If someone gets downed, you're great with a potion or even a healer's kit if you got it. Oils and poisons are amazing for someone relying on one big attack, and this all goes double for a thief who can do this as a bonus action while running to or from a fight. And that's not even mentioning how your high dexterity makes you great with thrown weapons like acid and knives. Look at all your skills, you are a mundane person keeping up with mages and divine warriors and whatever the hell the barbarian's on. You're the person with a backup plan who understands a calculated risk. There are so many consumables and tools, use them. But if you're after a similar feel or playstyle with different abilities that you just don't want to think about items, we need to talk about the scout. The scout is like if you removed the love of nature from a ranger, which would make a lot more sense if y'all didn't cut in line. Surprise! Making the ranger sad is not a surprise. Anyway, forget the ranger. This is the scout. The lookout who runs through the wilderness ahead of the party. Or the solo hunter eliminating targets on the road. You're double proficient in nature and survival, and specialize in movement. You can use your reaction to move half your speed without opportunity attacks if someone steps close. You also get 10 extra feet of movement, as well as swim or climb if you already can. You're also almost always gonna move first, because at level 13 you have advantage on initiative, and if you land a hit, everyone gets advantage on attacks against that target for one round. And finally, at level 17 you can make an attack as a bonus action, and it can even sneak attack if it's not against the same person. Now the flavor text isn't wrong, they do great running alongside barbarians and rangers and such, but they can sprint through town and bonk you just as well. You're the smash and grab counterpart to the thieves calm burglary. Sure, you're probably a bounty hunter or whatever, but you could just as easily be some sort of messed up boy scout with a horrific game of tag. You could even make a good assassin who just assumes they'll eventually trip the alarm. Or you could just be panicking, freak out, rush in, stab something with everything you got while cackling in fear, then get out before any survivors even know what hit them. Hey, it works! I know, longest live scout in your tribe. Point is that the reason behind your abilities can tell a story. Your nature knowledge might come from the wilderness, or from studying poison and practical skills for ruthless assassination. Your movement might come from your former life as an athlete, and your reaction times from paranoid twitching instead of honed skill. Maybe your sneak attacks are just luck, and you're unreadable because you're only half conscious from panic. You're masters of ambush and creeping through the undergrowth. And good at hunting. You'll never escape a scout. Or catch one once you run after the first round. <laughs> oh, don't think you're off the hook. Let's see what kind of arcane tricks your kind stir up. Seems like the arcane trickster's main thing is mage hand. You can also make it invisible, pick locks or pockets, plant items on people, disarm traps while far away, and you can even use sleight of hand to do it sneakily. It's also only a bonus action to control it. Eventually it even becomes a flanking buddy, giving you advantage while it taps them on the shoulder or tickles them or whatever, and it's not even your only spell. You get two and eventually three more cantrips, as well as actual spells. Most of them have to be illusion or enchantment, but as a rogue that's most of what you'd want anyway so it's not too bad. Especially because you have magical ambush. Anyone you cast a spell on has disadvantage on the saving throw if you're hidden when you cast, which means you could be better at enchantment spells than the enchantment wizard. And let's not forget level 17, spell thief. Is it always useful? Absolutely not. But is pickpocketing the wizard's brain amazing? Absolutely. You even negate the spell's effect on you while you rip the knowledge out of their head. You can be a wizard with their own spell that they no longer know for eight hours. I am glad most rogues don't have magic. They are terrifying when they do. The arcane trickster just doubles down on everything the rogue's good at, but with magical enhancements. Pickpocket a weapon or potion from an enemy before the battle. Unlock a door and open it for a distraction. And let's not forget that you're a rogue with spells like Hold Person, Invisibility, Sleep, and Silvery Barbs. Arcane tricksters can tend to be a little one note, but it's a really good note. You can flavor your power as psionic, or a little summoned creature doing all the work. But the mage hand focus really does pitch and hold their flavoring, so instead focus on how you got that power. Did you run out of tuition money for wizard school and turn to a life of crime? Is this some sort of pact you made with a tricky little fang? Are you an explorer who just focused on practical magic? Or a noble learning espionage to plant forgeries on rifles? Or a farmer who specialized in dangerous plants and got used to sneaking because it's your best defense as a commoner? Or maybe... <sighs> Fine, keep your secrets. Overall, the rogue subclasses are pretty nice. If you want that all or nothing playstyle for a gambler's thrill, what could be better? Now, if your issue is the theme, you might want to try monk. And if your issue is the frailty, you might want to try ranger. And of course, if you truly want that gambling feel in a mage, try wizard. No gagging this time. Look, I'll lean into my anti-wizard agenda at work, but it's really just the constant elitism that I care about. And Amelia proves that they aren't all bad. Speaking of which, she is almost here, so let's wrap this up. Thanks to Modern Masquerade and Pharaoh Goblin as always, your support lets me buy things for the show. If you want to join him, the link to my coffee is in the description. Anyway, class dismissed.
So we done? Cause my voice is shot and I got a new kind of Moscato I am dying to try. So you knew we were here early. I'm a goblin witch living alone in the woods with magical hallucinations of arguable reality. You think I let anything get near here without me knowing? Besides, I make enemies just by existing. And even more when I open my mouth. Then why are you in a towel? Because we're filming and the boss gets weird about me wearing things for modesty instead of just practicality and fashion, hypocrite. How was that weird? Cause we're kobolds and goblinoids? <laughs> what, were you raised by dwarves or something? Human actually. Oh, then I'm glad you finally showed up to a drinking night. Turn that off and grab a drink. I'll teach you something. And I'll put on clothes if it makes you feel more comfortable. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, Guck, can you go tell Amelia to cover up? But she's a halfling. If you're fine with necromancy but not with nudity, we really need to get your priorities straight. Settle in, class. Time for a heartwarming story of a widely disliked class turning into one of the better ones. That's right, I actually like a lot of what they've got going on now. You're not gonna think I do in the intro, but trust me when I say that I do recommend this class if it's interesting. Hopefully the new version, but honestly the old one wasn't that terrible. It was just frustrating for the wasted potential of a core concept. Anyway, this one has a lot to cover, so let's skip the intro gag and dive straight in. You ready? Let's go. First off, what's a ranger? We've been trying to figure that one out for decades. They're a martial, magical, wilderness jack of all trades. Too many adjectives. The stereotype has them as wilderness archers, but they can be a lot more. They've got the second highest HP, wield all weapons, and use all but the heaviest of armor. They've got good strength and dex, and they get magic at half rate. Tap rate magic isn't entirely accurate, however, as most of it's rare and unusually powerful. 26 of their spells are exclusive to them in Druid, and 9 of them are unique to the Ranger. Barrages of arrows, tangling bows, making traps, it's all really cool and won't matter for most. First elephant in the room, Hunter's Mark. It's a first level spell that makes you do extra damage to a chosen target, and when they die, you just choose the next target. It lasts 1 to 24 hours depending on the spell slot, and that right there is our problem. You can only have one concentration spell active, and what's going to be better than extra damage on every attack all day? And yeah, you're not forced to use this spell, but the biggest complaint with Ranger is that if you aren't using this spell, you know you're doing much worse than you should, especially after level 5 where you get an extra attack. This is a third attack's worth of damage you're leaving, maybe more, especially weird because it's basically a replacement for your old favored enemy feature. But we'll get there. First, let's look at the positives. Fighting as a bonus action or sensing invisible creatures. And at level 2, you get a fighting style like the fighter or paladin. Choose a benefit like higher AC, better attacks with ranged or dual wielding or one-handed. If you have Tasha's Cauldron, you can also choose thrown weapons or extra spells or seeing with your eyes closed. Either way though, you're gonna want Tasha's Cauldron. It's full of fun optional features for all the classes, but for the ranger they're more of a balance patch. She even added a subclass change. Ranger is this rare case where they've tried reworking it repeatedly over the years, and this is the result. Level 3, for example, would normally let you spend a very limited spell slot to know if a category of monster exists. Not where, or what, or how many, just that there is at least one fey somewhere within a 6 mile radius. Thank you, Ranger, that narrows it down to 113 square miles. And is that a pixie, or a coven of elder hags, or Tasha the Witch Queen herself, who says no. You gain the first of 5 spells, and you can cast them without a spell slot once per day. Normally level 10 lets you hide very well if you have an entire minute's prep time and don't move after. Tasha says you can turn invisible for a few seconds a few times a day, and that you gain temporary hit points occasionally and heal from exhaustion much faster, as opposed to one more favored terrain. And here we see why this is the biggest intro. Oh, what I could say about favored enemy and terrain. They're cool in theory. Favored enemy lets you choose a type of creature or two species of humanoids. You speak their language, you track them down better, you know all about them, and you gain two more as you level. And at level 20, you can even add your wisdom modifier to hit or damage them. Not both, just fun. Others become invincible, you sometimes get plus 5 damage if any creatures even exist at your power level. Nobody really plays level 20 anyway, but it shows you how much they cared. Tasha fixes this with favored foe. You pick a monster a few times a day and deal extra damage. It's like a mini hunter's mark. As for favored terrain, pick a natural terrain. You get bonuses to learning about it, you can't be lost in it unless there's magic involved, you can travel stealthily more quickly if you're alone, you're twice as good at foraging for rations, and other equally useful things, assuming you're traveling for at least an hour. Good luck finding a table that even engages with all that, and if you do, you better hope the adventure never leaves that biome, or goes to a city, or a dungeon. Now, granted, you also get more terrains as you level, but they don't get better. Tasha says that your core adventure features shouldn't shut off because you adventured. Instead, you learn two more languages. You double your proficiency in a skill. You become faster. Get a climb and swim speed. You become more resilient. They're still relatively minor things, but they'll actually be used. These are features that bake in so much roleplay 
role-playing, really marry you to your backstory. I love that, but what are your options here? Choose based on your backstory and half your features might be useless. Choose based on your campaign and you're really limited in backstory options or get weird conflicts. And however you do it, you're putting pressure on your DM for where they can go and what they can use. And the worst part is that both favored features are tame even without the restriction. Favored enemy was restricted in previous editions because it gave you extra damage or chance to hit. They made that your level 20 ability but kept the limit anyway. And as for terrain, did they just take that from Pathfinder 1e? Because I'm not seeing it in other editions. If they did, it was a minor bonus feature among many others for a reason. This was a great concept, weak execution, and one of the rare cases of Watsi admitting it. Not sweeping it under the rug, or hiring mercenaries, or smashing random bits of design and claiming the wreckage is fixed. They saw the problem, they tried to patch it. But honestly, even before that, the ranger was worth playing. And how can I say that after dragging it through the mud? The ranger is one of the many classes where the subclass makes or breaks it. Level 3, 7, 11, and 15 get you cool features we can now finally talk about. The ranger is primarily known for one particular class. One where you work alongside a creature, it gets stronger as you do, and all of your features revolve around it. That's right, the Drake War, the Beastmaster, which at launch was arguably the worst subclass of fulfilling its fantasy. Now if I was smart, I'd commit to that fake out and string you along to make you watch longer, but I think we're gonna take this book by buck for once. The Beastmaster fell prey to that reoccurring theme of good idea, flawed execution. At level 3, you gain an animal companion of your choice. At 7, you can have a dash, disengage, or help as a bonus action. At 11, it can take multiple attacks or use its multi-attack action. And at 15, your self-target spells also affect the beast. Sounds great, but the issue is the animal. It can never be more than CR 1 quarter, so at best it's a frog or a bird, maybe a dairy cow? It adds your proficiency to its attacks and AC, and its HP is four times your level of its last. But at the very best, this is a farm animal that you could have beaten solo at level 1, which you're now sending to fight some abomination in your stead. Yeah, that's right, it takes your entire action to have it fight. You're a Pokemon trainer, except your bunny isn't magic, you monster. And you know what happens when it dies because you just threw a house spider at a giant robot? You can spend eight hours finding a new one. Everyone else's familiars just get resummoned or reformed, but yours is dead. And a lot of DMs make you stick to animals in that area. These animals aren't companions, you're just chucking a random fish you found at someone. You'd be better off just using Tasha's summon animal spell. Or at least you would be if Tasha didn't save us one more time. In the new version, your companion is one of three set stat blocks that gets stronger as you level and can take the form of any animal you like. You can bring it back from the dead with a spell slot, grab a different form on a long rest, and can make it take any action other than attack as a bonus action. And while I personally crave the variety of having all the beast stat blocks, I have to acknowledge that most people prefer the simplicity anyway. And really, even I'll take it because your animal companion can stay with you. It can be an actual friend, not dinner with benefits. So now you're a real Pokemon trainer or whatever monster friend analog you want to use. Everyone's on Pal World right now, but I like Monster Sanctuary. Anyway, even ignoring the biggest multimedia franchise ever, this is a classic. The person in the woods raised by animals and now riding with them, or made a pact with nature and now it comes to their aid. You might have enchanted animal hides that fill with life and help you, but the concept of having animal companions predates written history. I don't think I need to explain a concept that's older than the species I'm talking to, so let me take a moment and say that I know I've been harsh so far. I actually really like the ranger, but that's the problem. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't care, but I want the things I like to succeed. I love finding the potential in things and what the designers are going for. Cool ideas and the heart behind it matter so much to me. It's why I keep following in love with so many things that are bad. I mean, come on, one of my oldest fandoms was Sonic the Hedgehog, thanks to Sonic Adventure 1 and Sonic X. But when I look past the flaws, I do still need to see something, and having this be the only bonded creature that can die was just too far. Thankfully, they did fix it, and before half you click away because the bad one's gone, do me a favor and hit that like button, or subscribe. I could really use the algorithm smiling on me right now. Anyway, the original counterpart to Beastmaster was a surprising instance of actually getting it right. A hunter is a person what can kill things good, but what and how do you hunt? That's actually a question you're getting asked every level. At 3, you can choose between extra damage on wounded targets for hunting hardy prey, an instant counterattack against large creatures for giant slaying, or an extra attack on a second creature to take out the whole flock. At 7, it's defensive, either fighting off fear, getting extra AC when a creature hits you, or evading attacks when you retreat. 11 lets you attack a bunch of creatures with either melee or ranged, and at 15, you can divert attacks that miss you to hit other enemies, or you can steal either evasion or uncanny dodge from the rogue, reducing dex save damage or using a reaction to cut normal attack damage in half. That is a lot of choices. But the choices matter, and they're all useful, so if you're taking one to tie into your backstory, it's gonna be fine. This is the sort of customization that favored enemy and terrain were going for, but done better. And I know that everyone says this should be part of the base class, but let me tell you a little secret. The Hunter is a this but more subclass, or as I like to call it, class plus. And every time, people say the same thing. One option being better or more common doesn't make everything else a trap. Extra damage on wounded targets is more reliable, but a counterattack against large creatures is still useful. You're going to be basing those. So for characterization, we look at 
what and why you hunt. Are you a simple backwoods hunter used to hunting geese but now shooting methods? A soldier trained to fight giants on the outskirts? Are you fighting to protect others or collect research samples or just eat? Maybe you're not a hunter. You're a drummer learning that hitting seven things in quick succession is great for fighting hordes. You're a panicked noble whose fear turns into speedy retreats and quick shots. A disgraced fencer stumbling out from under a bridge to repost attacks and take their pocket money. Or maybe you're a monk traveling the world to learn from everyone you meet. That's why you're hard to hit a second time and do more against damaged targets. You learn to read him quick. But even if you're just stalking prey, animals aren't the only things you can hunt. A monster slayer as I just described it. Dragons, ghouls, liches, CEOs. The unnatural kind of horror. You gain spells to ward off or banish. You can learn their weaknesses a few times a day. And do you remember that alternate option for your favorite enemy? At level 3, you pick a creature and do extra damage. It's a little different, but it's the second class book and you can already see them figuring out things for the rework. Anyway, as you level, it gets easier to resist saves from your targeted foe. You learn a once per rest counter spell that also works in teleportation and can't be counterspelled. And finally, when you need to make a save against an attack, you can preemptive strike. And if that attack lands, you automatically pass the save. The hunter is the king of called shots. You point at the board, yo this clown in particular and just shut him down. The hunter probably started out catching game in the woods, while the slayer is your dedicated hunter of supernatural dangers. It's Van Helsing, a witcher, a monster hunter. Your town was overrun by undead as a kid and now you want revenge. You grew up obsessed with a type of monster and you know them inside out. You studied local history and started preparing because you know the animated armor invasion of 1387 will happen again. They always come back. But if an edgy noble with favored foe humanoid just isn't your cup of tea, get weird with it. Maybe you're a scholar or a wildlife researcher and you know about these because you love them. Maybe it hurts because you're fighting the thing you love. Or maybe the party is breaking out and trying to stop you from butchering them. Or given the options listed, maybe you're more of a spicy monster researcher. Have I ever mentioned I actually have a project far more popular than this? It's called D&D Smash Your Pass Versus. Smash your pass for the qualifiers then put them in a tournament. Gonna change it to TTRPG Versus eventually when Pathfinder finally wins a poll for the next book, but um... Some of us do a lot of research into the sentience and abilities of monsters for all sorts of reasons. That's a really judgmental look for someone in catapult range. Anyway, on a similar vein, the Horizon Walker. Monster Slayer focused on all sorts of threats, but Horizon Walker is focused on extra planar ones. You can sense the direction of planar portals once per day. You can change your damage to force damage with extra damage on top, and you gain spells to protect or enhance yourself. Really good ones too, like Misty Step and Haste. Also notice a trend with these classes, extra spells. And guess what got added to the main ranger class later on at the same level? Cool, right? We're getting to watch them work out their design. At level 7, you can step into the ethereal plane for a turn, walking through walls and traps. At 11, you can teleport before every attack and get an extra attack if they're against different creatures. Teleport away while shooting and run. Teleport through trees while fighting. And if you're melee, warp through the whole line of minions. Especially at level 15, where you clip out of reality for a second to resist an attack's damage. This is a ranger that knows all about the different planes of reality and is using the monster's own power to keep him there. Or are you? You could be a ghost hunter who learned their tricks, or maybe you're a revived ghost who's only mostly bad. Maybe you're keeping the bay in their world and learning to teleport to keep up, or maybe you're letting out your own fey blood. Maybe your powers are a boon from a god or another monster to hunt down their kin. And maybe they weren't learned or given, they were stolen. After a series of successful hunts, the leader of your order invoked a blood ritual to give you the power of your prey. And are these abilities even on purpose? Or as you hunt, are you slowly infused with planar power? The magic of the realms corrupting you through extended exposure. The deeper you delve into the hunt, the more monstrous you become yourself. One day your order might be after you, good hunter. Or maybe you became that corruption intentionally. There are plenty of creatures that go bump in the night and you'll become one yourself if need be. That is the Gloomstalker, hunting the monsters where they dwell before they can become a threat. Your spells let you hide, disguise, spread fear, your foe's own tactics. Not only do you have dark vision, you are invisible to others' dark vision, which means that while you're in the dark, you'll usually have advantage on all attacks and they'll have disadvantage to hit you. You're also a master of ambushing, gaining extra initiative with more speed and damage on your first turn. At 7 you gain wisdom proficiency, at 11 you gain an extra attack if you miss, and at 15 you can use a reaction to force disadvantage on any attack that doesn't have advantage. You make a lot of monsters advantage into a sudden weakness. And that's not to mention how much utility you have and how incredibly sneaky you are. Greater invisibility is one of the best spells. And not only do you have it, you basically get an infinite version as long as you're in darkness, which isn't hard to get in a dungeon. This might be the best assassin build. I'm sorry, rogues, but this is a deceptive terror. The monsters look under their bed for you at night. You can go with the classic options, of course. Inquisitor, bounty hunter, drow in general, and don't forget the edgy backstory. Your village was burned by a dragon, so now you're gonna be their nightmare. You're from the plane of 
shadow so the darkness treats you as its own. Or you can get fun with it. You sold your shadow to a hag and now you can take its place in the darkness. Or maybe you are a shadow that escaped and gained form. Or just be a minotaur or something. The bigger and flashier the better. Make your enemies wonder how you even got in here. I mean heck, you're invisible. Go big. Be a cheerleader, a mariachi player. Put on something bold and flashy and fun. Wearing bright orange makes disappearing even more impressive. The sneakiest person wearing sparkles and streamers is always a wonderful juxtaposition. But now let's move on to the next era of design. From Xanathar's to Tasha. So what did they come up with now that they know what they wanted to be? Combining those last two ideas. You're a horrifying teleporting extra pioneer monster who's great at fighting their kin. That's right, you're a fae. You scar people's mind with psychic damage when you hit them, you get charms and teleportation magic, and you add your wisdom to charisma checks. As you grow stronger, you resist fear and charms and can bounce bail charms back at other people. And it doesn't have to be against you or even your own sign. If someone resists your charm, you can just bounce it to someone else. You can also summon fae once a day for free and eventually get an even better Misty Step. It's fun, it's flavorful, it's not going to distract me. What, did you expect me to have fun ideas? Oh, look at the pay you can emulate, be a hag spawn or a fairy messing with minds and warping away. Maybe even make an Overwatch joke about being Tracer with all the teleportation and natural charm. But I know what this is. I could never forget. This is just a Shadar Kai. Can't hide your special elves from me, Watsy. Not anymore. Did you know that Shadar Kai didn't used to be elves? They were fae but got reworked because Watsy wants everything to be special edgy elves. Oh, did you think my rant about the 33 types of elves was all I had? Never. Oh, but there's a line that gives you fun cottagecore flavor. It just wants you to be an Aladrin. But I saw that dancing shadow bit. They just put this here to make your elf more elf and tempt you into darkness. No, 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 no. I love teleportation, but let's warp out to some real nature spirits. So you might think the Swarm Keeper is just for making Dr. Bees, but come on, they never make a mundane animal if they can make a bear spirit pretend to be one. They went against that instinct only once, and we got the original Beastmaster from it. No, this is a swarm of nature spirits pretending to be tiny creatures. Birds, bees, tooth fairies, winged raccoons, you name it. It even says to incorporate them as flavor on your spells. Explode into a cloud of bats like a vampire. I always recommend that anyway, but I'm glad to see I don't have to. You also get Mage Hand in the form of your swarm, and the swarm can help you in a fight. It can move you, lift you, move your opponents, knock them over, add extra damage as they start biting or teleport you to personally dodge an attack. Now, I don't know why they limited the fly speed to 10 feet, but this thing's in the upper echelon of built-in creativity. Be protected by your plushies, or treat with schools of sharks even on land. You're a demonologist swarming with imps, an author whose words buzz around them, an archaeologist with tiny clay statues come to life. Maybe it's more solid with dirt or water bending to your whim. Maybe you're a tired and desperate teacher cursed to a lifetime field trip from hell. Like a less happy version of Zipper from her cleaning crew. A goblin built like Saxon Hale with the mental stability of a feral raccoon. She was the protector of their tribe's nursery and also their biggest danger because she used them as ammunition. She figured they were expendable. These other pansies taking months for a few kids just weren't putting in enough hustle. She could replace the whole nursery in a night if she wanted. No one was really brave enough to argue with her and it went about as well as you could expect for their long-term survival. But while she wandered the wilderness fighting bears with her teeth, some really messed up fae decided they just loved her style. Now she's always surrounded by goblin whelps, flying by just flapping their arms really hard. Tough enough to survive her training and they always come back, her dream come true. Anyway, this puzzle has one more piece, something released after seeing our reaction to these changes. One more try to Beastmaster, the Drake Warden. You learn Draconic, though the Thaumaturgy cantrip is all the magic you're getting. Instead, your magic is focused on your Drake. You have a companion Drake that works like the new Beastmaster, but Dragon. Instead of air, sea, or sky, you choose the color and damage. It also doesn't die, just disappears until you resummon it. It's their usual spirit in the shape of a thing. It starts off small, but as you level, it gets bigger, better, learns to fly, becomes a mount, even gets a breath weapon. And at level 15, you can reduce the damage against it or yourself. Didn't have a good way of working that one in there, kinda random. But what an idea! A common one, to be honest, you're a dragon rider. You can speed through the process of raising one since birth, a trope so well-known it's hard for me to say ideas that aren't just famous stories already. And I mean, you could subvert this by turning it into something else, like a magnum opus construct with parts summoned from the void or an elemental of your own design, but what about exploring that growth cycle? Maybe this is an ancient dragon spirit, but its powers are limited by the body you're able to summon. Maybe it's a normal bonded drake, but what are the effects of aging it years in a matter of weeks? The lore options mention infusing yourself with the magic power of a dragon. What if this is their spirit? A draconic patron controls it while they dream, or a draconic parent is reborn with roles reversed. Maybe it's a dragon that you killed, now in begrudging servitude. It could even be a willing wormling, happily serving to skip its most dangerous years. However you do it, I'm glad that in the end we got some good companion classes. For some, it's all about those companions. For others, the flavor of a wild loner. And for others, just the mechanical blend. Rogue and Fighter and Druid all together. Those are also my recommendations if I didn't quite convince you. Fighter for combat style, Rogue for creeping around, and Druid for more of that magic and animal power. But hopefully you saw that despite the early hate thrown their way, at this point they are a sterling class. It's time for the oldest magic of them all. At least I assume we learned how to mix bloodlines before potions. Sorcerers are unique in that they don't use magic, they are magic.
magic. I was arguing these should be counted as magical beasts back when that category existed because this is monster magic. It's true divinity, nature's wrath. You aren't learning how to bend the laws of reality on a whim. You're a natural anomaly learning about yourself. Improvement in your magic is self-improvement and actualization, personal growth. And let's get the stereotype out of the way right now. You're not just a magical Nepo baby being born with something that everyone else had to work for. You're someone who suddenly started bursting everything you love into flames and had to work equally hard not to constantly kill everyone you love. If anyone's privileged here, it's the person dropping 50 gold per spell level of each spell, plus the tuition that got you there. If anyone's got it easy, it's the one who can casually drop the price of a house to learn Snimlock Snowball Swarm, which is a fun spell, but some of us can't afford a mortgage. But sorry, I'm not even a sorcerer. I'm an artificer. I just hate that stereotype. It's still a skill they worked hard to hone, like drawing or writing or singing. A natural inclination doesn't make it any less effort, and at least learning magic was a choice for you. But before we dive into the eight types of bloodline you can refine into power, let's look at their similarities. You ready? Then let's go to the like and sub button. You know, you'll forget if you don't do it now. Anyway, first off, magic. You can cast spells a certain amount of times per day from the ones you know. It's the easiest one to keep track of, no choosing from your whole spell list every day. You know X, you cast Y times. Easy. You also have by far the most cantrips. Weak but free spells you can cast infinitely. Most casters who even get them learn 2 to eventually 4, but you learn 4 to 6. You also have the second highest amount of spell options at 223 choices. But here's the elephant in the room. You're tied for the full caster with the least amount of spells known, a problem large enough that all the later subclasses try to patch it. Furthermore, all but 7 of your options are shared by the wizard, and the sorcerer's only exclusive spell, Chaos Bolt, came as part of an expansion. They were originally the only spellcaster without exclusive spells. Shout out to Waterwalk and Daylight, which, wait, Amelia's not here, right? Shout out for being exclusive to basically everyone other than the wizard, because they involve being cool and seeing the light of day. The wizard sorcerer befriends deep, and I am all for inciting more drama. Being a magical creature does give you perks to magic, primarily getting to mess with it. You gain a special power called sorcery points, basically an internal pool of raw magic. You can use them to cast more spells, or activate your class powers. You sacrifice spell slots for more, and they restore daily on your long rest, so at 20, some will come back on the short. Tasha lets you use them to re-roll failed saves at level 5, but the primary use comes with meta magic. At level 3, 10, and 17, you get options to modify your spells. Spend that power to protect a friend in the middle of your fireball, do more damage, work as a bonus action, cast without words or movement, double the range. For some, you can even try double casting, extending the duration, or forcing disadvantage on the same. Tasha even lets you re-roll a spell attack or change your damage type. You also have proficiency with charisma, your casting stat, and constitution, which makes it so much easier to keep your concentration spells. So while others might know all of your spells, no one can cast them quite like you. Not even other sorcerers, because different bloodlines tend to pick up different spells to complement the benefits of their powers. At least that's how it worked on Naruto. At levels 1, 1, 6, 14, and 18, those powers manifest in a wild spectrum of magical variety, bursting with possibilities. Just like the exact opposite of the Clockwork Soul. Oh come on, that was too good of a setup to not subvert. The Clockwork Soul is one of the newest ones, and it's not chronomancy like you might expect. It's order, law, everything working as smooth as clockwork. To this end, you get up to 10 extra spells prepared. Protection, restoration, dispelling, things to set the world straight and guard against anomalies. And even better, you can swap those spells for other abjuration and transmutation spells. Even steal from the warlock and wizard because Dasha's options are just cracked. Anyway, also at level 1, you can remove advantage or disadvantage from someone a few times a day, bring everything back to an even playing field. At 6, you can create a war to prevent damage. At 14, you can enter a minute-long trance, preventing advantage against you and treating low rolls as a 10. And at 18, you basically just revert everything within 30 feet to how it used to be. Wipe away spell effects, fix anything broken, and 100 points of healing to spend however you want. Those last two were once a day, but were chargeable with sorcery points. The general idea is just preventing change. HP change, dice change, the world's running fine and people need to stop changing things. Now this one's probably the weakest thematically, but it's trying to invoke the clockwork plane of pure neutral law, Mechanis. And don't get me wrong, this one can work great if you want to take it in that clockworky steampunk direction, be a warforged and go wild, or tweak it into a robot direction. But prevention and wards and restoration of the norm is something we can work with. Be the magical crime scene cleanup, covering up things that would scare the populace. Maybe you're working for a guild or a crime family sent out to prevent and revert damage that could trace things back to them. Or maybe you're just a freelancer removing Fae or anything outside of our plane. Go full SCP or Warehouse 13 and make your character around capturing artifacts and creatures. You can go full into law and order or just natural law. You're a science teacher sick of people stomping on laws of physics, trying to restore the world to its proper form. On that note, you could go full Call of Cthulhu and be an aberration investigator. Anyway, let's smash that clock and set up our dichotomy with the one, the only, wild magic. Known by all, loved and hated, when I say sorcerer, you're probably thinking of this. Wild magic is one of the originals and deals with randomness. You get advantage on a roll once per day, and at six you can use sorcery points to apply penalties to others' rolls. But what we're here for is the wild magic surge. Whenever you cast magic, the DM can tell you to roll a d20. If you roll a one, you can use this amazing charm. Cast extra spells, become invincible, change size, talk by screen, 
screaming, turn into a plant, all sorts of things. Yeah, there's a few negative ones on there, but it heavily favors the good and neutral. At level 14, you can even roll twice and choose the result. Level 18 sidetracks a bit by letting you re-roll spell damage dice that roll maximum damage, but it does let your damage explode with some luck. And luck's the name of the game for this one. This is the source of gamblers, pickle fang, and fate twisters. You can lean into it or be oblivious. This is just how magic works. But whether this is by chance or a gift or it's you struggling for control, we need to talk about the system. First of all, that level 6 ability is just a guidance cantrip as a reaction. There is no reason it should be two sorcery points or anything. Just make it proficiency times a day. More importantly though, those surges need a tweak because I love them. They're so close to being great, but they're really not there. Personally, my system is to roll a d20 and add the spell level. 20 or more, you wild magic. It's the inverse of the current system because wild magic is a good thing. It's why we chose the class. There's other systems too, like rolling your spell save DC as a charisma check or keeping it at one but using different dice for different levels. Maybe keep it simple and use the spell level as the DC, but I highly recommend a change. Having your main mechanic be DM only is just not good. It's bad for the DM having yet another thing to track and it feels horrible when you can't even try for it. I can't even remember inspiration. You think I'm going to remember your surge at the busiest time of the game? And even then, it's only a 1 in 20. You'll go entire sessions before seeing your main mechanic. No, you chose a wild magic sorcerer for the chaos, so let them try chaos. Either have them roll every time or let the player choose. I also recommend using or even making an expanded chart. There's plenty around. I made my own with some personal ideas and some stolen ones. One of my favorites is you and the strongest creature within a mile are momentarily aware of each other. It happened to a wild sorceress I know while she was preparing to leave Waterdeep. Discounting the ones who would definitely be guarding against it, she got Xanathar. Suddenly got a panic message later to not come back to the city. Apparently the thieves guild were going on a rampage against every magic user in the city for unknown reasons. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm actually named after her youngest daughter. That's not a joke. It's not my first name, but it is actually true. That barbarian example I show sometimes is another one of her daughters. But enough about that. What if you want your sorcerer's name associated with a different kind of flawless being? In that case, the divine soul is for you. Once per rest, you can add 2d4 to a missed roll and you get a free first level bonus spell. It's one out of five options depending on your alignment, but DMs, I am begging you, let them pick any spell. It says you can swap it for another cleric spell, so come on. They've already got most of the spells anyway, let it be thematic. And I really do mean nearly all of them, because Divine also gets the cleric spell list. That's a level of customization I can't really touch on here, but clerics have some amazing spells, and you get to add meta magic. Heal from farther, twin healing word, make spirit guardians last for hours. You're also just generally great at healing, getting to spend a sorcery point to reroll dice at level 6. You can even do it for an ally's roll, so when you're by their side, everyone heals better. At 14, you can sprout wings whenever you want, and at 18, you can restore half your health once per day. Choosing spells for this sorcerer is either a dream or a nightmare. They already had the second highest number of spell options at 223, but once you add in almost all the divine spells, they've got the second highest number of spell options at 326. Sorry, bud, they're not called the sorcerers of the shore after all. Now, as for what to do with these, demigods are a dime a dozen. They're so common in some pantheons, we literally have one on staff, Catherine. She's a bubbly, happy, dumb as nails sorceress. Child of a nature deity, bastard cursed to be a Medusa. She doesn't even know that Medusa are feared. Everyone just thinks she's a dryad. If you don't want to go the obvious route, maybe this isn't how you were born. You were a cleric or a druid who bonded with something divine. My wild magic friend could have been divine soul. She was fused with a fey god who lived on through her bloodline. With her being the last one, he fully lived inside her, giving her power to ensure she survived. Maybe you were changed by fallout from an angelic battlefield. You traveled to Mount Celestia in a dream, or made out with an angel in disguise, or ate a celestial being. You could be the result of an experiment to fuse angel and demon energy into one being, like my friend's Lucetine Bittery. Come to think of it, I know a lot of magical people. But if your mom knew some of the most magical people, you might be a draconic sorcerer. You could be part dragon, it could be a pact, but either way, your ancestor connected with the dragon and now you get power. You get permanent mage armor and bonus HP in the form of having scales, learn draconic, and get a bonus when talking to dragons of your color. At 6, you do more damage with your dragon's type and can get resistance for one hour. At 14, you get dragon wings you can toggle on and off, and at 18, you can make like a dragon and charm or terrify everyone within 60 feet. Real dragons can only terrify, but I guess you're special. Make sure you pick up the dragon's breath spell to complete the look. Triple down as a half dragon, dragonborn dragon sorcerer. Now, as we all know, I tend to struggle with thinking of new options for the dragon ones. There's not really anything else like them, and you probably pick them up specifically for the dragons. So I suggest spicing things up with your backstory instead of just reflavoring. Where does your power come from? And don't say a one night stand with a bard. My Smasher Past the Monster Manual blog had six out of the top ten as dragons. Everyone likes dragons, it's not weird. Maybe your parent was a powerful barbarian who charmed them with beats of strength, or a paladin whose pure heart impressed their shapeshifted sensei. Plenty of dragonic creatures are made from rituals involving their parts or horde. Maybe you're the child of a cultist who absorbed the ambient power of the lair. You could even be the kid of a dragon slayer infused from your mom being drenched in blood while she didn't know she was pregnant. Is that draconic taint why you were cast out? I mean, you're probably traveling with mercenaries after all. Maybe your mom was a rare yellow dragon who orphaned you to stay hidden. Or you're from a noble bloodline 
Nine on a pilgrimage to prove your strength. You might be the youngest, but you can still become the heir if the dragons pick you to reinfuse the Bud Nine. And again, maybe this isn't something you were born with and you're adventuring as an agent of the master who gave you their blood. Were your parents repressed by the dragon spirits they act as shrine keepers for? I know that 5e doesn't do long dragons, so maybe go with bronze for the connections to storm and water. Though honestly, your eastern dragons might be better off as storm sorcerers. The storm sorcerer brings the power of the raging sky. You can speak the language of elementals and can fly before or after casting a leveled spell. You don't provoke opportunity attacks either, so it's great for escape. At level 6, if that spelled out thunder or lightning damage, you can also damage whoever you want within 10 feet. It's only half your level in lightning, but AoE damage never hurts. You also get resistance to lightning and thunder and a bunch of cool weather effects. Change the wind direction, make brain not fall on you and your friends. It's probably not useful, but at least it's fun. At 14, if people hit you, they get zapped and thrown 20 feet. And at 18, you're entirely immune to lightning and thunder damage. You can also make the entire party fly once per short rest. That is incredibly good. Where was that the rest of the subclass? I'm half kidding. I care more about flavor than numbers, but especially nowadays, this one's a bit weak. DMs, I recommend that you let them fly with cantrips too. It's only 10 feet. Most characters can jump that far, but it really helps a sorcerer that wants to be in the enemy's face like this one. And they need all the help they can get. They only have a d6 hit die and no armor. And as for you, the player, just remember not to go all in on lightning or you're gonna get walled. At least take the elemental death feed or transmuted spell meta magic. After all, you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? Not much. Most of them resist it. Now as for how you got this power, let's ignore the obvious ones. Not because there's anything wrong with jokes about Zeus, but because you don't need me to tell you them. Maybe you were infused by nature into literally being the storm that is approaching. You're a bad omen incarnate. Might be something silly like having your picnic rained on one too many times, or you survived a hurricane and got infused with power in its eye. Or other storms like monsoons or sandstorms. Maybe you're a cowboy from Tornado Alley. Nobody expects Henry from Nebraska who's watched a hundred twisters. And on that survival front, the thunderbolt and lightning might be from your job. Fixing power lines or clockwork creatures, sailing, even mail delivery. I mean hell, I almost got struck by lightning while screaming soliloquy at a storm in my jammies. Few feet to the left and those oak cleaving thunderbolts would have singed my red head. Sometimes I gotta tell the gods, do it you won't you coward. Or other creatures like giants or kraken that can give the power directly. And speaking of giants, what about Bahir? Bahir are these electric crocodile dragon centipede things that giants made to hunt dragons. And yeah, you could be part Bahir, but what if you're the newest experiment by an ambitious giant? Bahir aren't working as well anymore, so they made a sexy lightning mage to lure in and slay. How else are you going to get rid of the friendly ones the humanoids are protecting? Prepare the world for a storm of war, usher in a new age of giants. But first, let's darken the sky even further with the shadow sorcerer. Shadow in D&D usually means undeath, but thankfully it sticks to actual shadows for mechanics. You have double the usual dark vision length, can cast magical darkness and see through it with sorcery points, and you can make a save to drop to 1 HP instead of zero. It's only one success per day, but you can try again later if you fail. And don't underestimate that darkness either. Being able to hit people while they struggle to hit you is good on anyone, but especially a caster. At level 6, you can summon a walking bad omen, a spectral direwolf that can't be hidden from and gives disadvantage on saving throws. At level 14, you can teleport through shadows, a shadow class classic, and at 18, you can spend points to turn into a shadow creature. You're resistant to almost all damage and walk through walls for a minute, like a barbarian's rage, but better. It's honestly a pretty fantastic use of the shadow class theme. And the church grim is a nice touch. But again, why do you have this? I do like sticking with shadow powers, and these can work great as ghost powers, but I'd like to go more esoteric with this one. Maybe you're manifesting a desire to be unseen. It's your own pure and terror manifest with your magic. The wolf basically being your soul, lashing out in panic survival instinct while your body short circuits. You were lost in the woods and the darkness consumed you, but you came back out alive. You were an orphan, and only in shadow were you ever truly hidden and safe. But this one, it might not even be a blood power, it's just your clan's hidden technique. Like the magical version of a shadow monk. Be the duplicitous diplomat to their assassin. Trained in the art of killing in plain sight and escaping into the night. Be the sort of person the party is sure will end up as an evil advisor someday or the head of a secret police. But if we're going into mental warfare darkness, probably best to stick with aberrant mind because another type of supernatural power you're born with is psionic power. This of course comes with telepathy. It only lasts a few minutes but you can stretch it for a mile and recast it infinitely. Even better is that this came out in Tasha's like Clockwork Soul which means you get 11 free changeable stolen spells. And at 6 you can even cast them silently without most component costs by spending points. You see why I said Divine Soul should get to steal their spell from whatever is appropriate? Nowadays this is just how it goes. These are all about telepathy, telekinesis, messing with minds and tentacles. It's aberration flavor at this one, so Lovecraftian nightmares mostly. Because of that, you're resistant to psychic damage and have advantage against charms and fear. At 14, that can come out as temporary transformations to the cost of sorcery points. Swim and breathe underwater, squeeze through one-inch gaps and restraints, see the invisible with eyes beyond eyes, or fly. And as your final power, you can teleport and leave a mini black hole. Sucks in people within 30 feet and does a bit of force damage. Great for setting up area of effect spells. So calling this a psionic class is a bit of a stretch to be honest. Psionic things usually let you cast silently by default, you're casting by thinking. You can still do that with your special spells by spending sorcery points, so I guess the magic's just something you do on top of being psychic? Whatever, sounds like this has flavor, so let's change it more. Turn this into fungi, warp and pass information through mycelium networks and spores. Or nature in general, your telepathy is whispers carried on the wind, your tentacles are 
vines and you grow wings to fly. Maybe everything is psychic and you're just ADHD. You're not saying magic words, you're trying to keep focus by making hand gestures and muttering the thing you're trying to do. Maybe you're haunted or an exorcist who keeps befriending ghosts. Honestly though, most roots involve horror, especially bloodline wise. It's hard to find something psionic that's not tied to mind flayers. There are a few, like gym dragons and star horrors, but even the exceptions are usually tied to Lovecraft or the Far Realm. So my solution is to go for real terror. Lean into the lol random of years past, peer into the abyss and find nothing but a lawless wasteland of glomps and uwu and icon as cheeseburger. Fill the table with true dread, either cringing at old culture or how long it's been. Forget that though, no more feeling embarrassed about the past. Embrace it and revel in it, make it our strength. Deal your psychic damage with genuine enjoyment of old cringe. Aberrant mind, more like welcome to my twisted mind. Make him go bananas. On the moon! Which is the transition to Lunar Bloodline that like three people will get. Good, if you haven't noticed by now, I communicate through old Flash animations. Anyway, Lunar Bloodline. This is the newest one and I am a huge fan. First, you get Moonfire, which is a free sacred flame cantrip that jumps to an adjacent creature. And speaking of spells, you get 5 to 15 extra spells known, depending on how you count it. You get different sets of spells depending on what lunar phase you're embodying. Bow Moon is defensive and utility magic, New Moon is cursing and offensive magic, and Crescent Moon has utility and offense. This might be one of my favorite abilities ever. I would personally always sync my cycle around the actual moon because it sounds like an amazing thing to work around, but I get that this is better thanks to short time frames or spell jammer or planar travel. But it's not over yet because as we level, this glorious mechanic continues. At level 6, you can reduce the cost of your metamagic a few times per day for spells depending on your moon phase. You can also switch your phase for a sorcery point. You don't have to wait for a rest anymore. And you'll have plenty of those sorcery points because you're not only saving on metamagic, you can cast one of your phase spells for free once a day. And all of that was just level 6 too. Thankfully for my dying voice, the rest are more restrained. At level 14, you either give everyone advantage on investigation and perception by glowing, have advantage on stealth and grant disadvantage on attacks against you while in shadow, or get resistance to necrotic and radiant damage for crescent. Finally, whenever you switch phases, you can blind or heal people with a flash of light, become invisible while dealing necrotic damage and reducing speed to zero, or teleport with a friend while granting you both resistance. Every resistance. Where do I even start in this testament to change in power creep? I mean, if you like power, then dear on this tree, but I adore this flavor. I mean, first of all, do I even need to mention where creatures because there are so many stories of shape-shifting under the full moon. You could even play a shifter for extra effect. But beyond that, this works great as a hag bloodline. The moon phases work perfectly for their ancient rituals under different moons. You're an agent of the fates and the alignment of the planets and moon has a profound effect on you. I guess this is a good alternate one if you want to go for a bloodline from space or maybe a lunar deity and again it doesn't have to be an ancestry. You could have been experimented on or the gods chosen or drawn in the beauty of a moonlit night like a druid does the forest. A moon tear dropped on your house or you were imprisoned on the moon via magic. You're a fell omen born during a full eclipse, or you just hate the sun that much. Or the moon. Maybe you worship the stars and praise the new moon hoping it goes the f away already. Maybe your personality changes with the phases, or your body shifts alongside it. Maybe your character loves how it changes, or maybe you only like one phase and get depressed for the rest. Like a sailor or a cartographer loving the full moon and mourning when it fades. Or you're just nocturnal like me and adore the night for what it is. I've been forced into a morning shift schedule this year and I have not been happy. But oh well. The sorcerer is a wonderful spellcaster with so many cool tricks under their belt. They have one of the easiest magic systems to follow, but their skill ceiling is super high. Plus, you're basically a magical creature, so much cool flavor you can't get anywhere else. If you do want to go elsewhere though, a few recommendations. Warlock for magic that's easy to track, Bard for staying charismatic with similar but varied magic, and of course the wizard if you just want to go full in on knowing everything. Note however that while sorcerer and warlock are easier ones to learn, full casters are still the hardest classes. You still can as a beginner, but be aware that you have a bit more reading to do up front. Magic. Some are born with it, wielding themselves as a tool. Some learn the old ways over time or use wealth and intelligence to buy in. Others are not so lucky. Devotion to a deity or concept might grant you some of its power, but not all have the luxury of time and knowledge. Most aren't chosen even if they do. However, when you're on your last leg, there's always people with power and a need. Settle in class, today we're making me regret using copy instead of Patreon, because the warlock joke just writes itself. The warlock is a practitioner of pact magic, making a deal with a patron in exchange for power. Fey, demons, eldritch creatures, that sort of stuff. It changes the way you cast in a really neat way. Actually, let's just go ahead and get into that. You ready? Let's go! As a warlock, you're a full spellcaster. A little bulkier than most with a d8 hit die, light armor, and simple weapons. But what you're really here for is magic unlike anyone else's, because it's not technically yours. You're not a tap of arcane power with controlled flow into spell slots. You are a light switch, full power or nothing. You only have one to four spell slots depending on your level, but each of these is cast at your maximum level. And even better, since you aren't casting from your own power, they come back on a short rest. This means that how you play heavily depends on your party. 
party. If your party's full of people like monks and fighters, you're one of the best magic users around. But if your party doesn't care about short rests, you're gonna have to be more careful. And don't get too excited because your spells technically only go up to level 5. They use this Mystic Arcanum feature to give you the other 4 spell levels while restricting it to 1 each. It's also like that because at level 20, you're able to refill your spell slots with a minute rest once per day. I know that can sound like a lot, but it's actually really simple. You can cast like 3 spells, they're always at max level, and they come back on a short rest. After that, all your magic is cantrips, normally weak but free spells. Speaking of which, let's get this out of the way. Warlock, your power is great, some of the most fun, but it was bargained for. Your patron may have asked for service or payment, but the true cost is this. There are 7 unique warlock spells, one of which is a cantrip known as Eldritch Blast. It's force damage, strong as a crossbow, and as you level, you can improve on it. Your Eldritch Invocations can make it move people, do more damage, go hundreds of beats, slow the target. However, there is a catch. If you take it, everyone will act like you're the only one with a usual attack. Yes, the fighter said, see that guy? I shoot him every turn for two years. Yes, the wizard and sorcerer used Firebolt just as much. The ranger always hits with the same weapon, and the paladin burns most of her spell slots on smite, but for some reason having a standard option is only an issue if it's you. It's jealousy, warlock, or ignorance, or malice? Whatever it is, it's wrong. Use your Eldritch Blast, modify it, and have fun with it. That said, you can ditch it and use your eight invocations elsewhere. Get new abilities, improve other abilities, make infinite versions of normal spells, and whatever else you might expect from what's basically a miniature fiend. Just know that people will call you boring over Eldritch Blasting twice this fight, then make the same attack as every round of every fight the entire campaign. Anyway, other than your spells, your patron powers come out in two ways. The minor way is a gift at level 3. You can bond to a weapon, making it magical and summon a bolo will. You can summon a special better familiar. You can get a book with three more cantrips from any spell list. Or you can gain an amulet that lets you add a d4 to a failed check a few times a day. You can get these from any patron, but you'll find the different warlock types often have preferences. Those types are the major patron difference, your subclass. Exactly what sort of creature do you draw your power from? Let's start with the obvious one, the classic deal with the devil, the fiendish pact. This is the only one who might ask for your soul as payment, but souls are not mentioned once in the warlock. I know people get confused, it's a classic trope, but not everyone wants your soul. Even devils can go without for the right price. Now every pack starts with a list of thematic spell options from other classes. For the fiend it's mostly damaging spells like fireball with a few curveballs like blindness. You also gain temporary HP whenever you beat someone up. Really helps you survive, especially early on. That actually goes for most of your features. At 6 you can add a d10 to a save or check, and at 10 you can gain resistance to a damage type of your choosing, both once per short rest. Note that you can even choose the mundane types that weapons use like piercing, though magic weapons bypass it so your mileage may vary. Always useful however is 14, hurl through hell. You choose a person and shove them into the pits of hell until your next turn, dealing 10d10 psychic damage unless they're a fiend. So it's the amazing utility of banish with finger of death's average damage. And there's no save, it just happens. Being the classic Faustian bargain, they really had to get this one right. And I think they nailed it. Mostly buying into your role as a blaster caster, but with enough surprising resilience to cover for taking some stray shots. Of course, the question for this and all warlocks is who do you work for? Now of course, this one works well with anything fiery, it could easily be reskinned into a fire elemental or red dragon. The resilience could be a fire giant boon, and honestly, even some angels work great. Solar deal fire damage and resist so many things they could just be sharing that with you. Even hurl through hell works through just casting the unworthy down to hell. But you don't have to bind yourself to the summer court fey just to spice things up. The fiends have plenty of variety. Arc devils hate each other and share their strengths so you'll kill each other's warlocks. Molnock lets you do what you want so you'll go down to hell and help them get back in. Pit fiends change devils into better devils and they're just using their power to improve you too. And you can convince pretty much any demon to lend you their power to sow chaos. It helps their cults bring them into the material plane. Maybe Dagon's whispering you secret information, slowly driving you mad with knowledge no mortal should know. And yeah, Dagon's actually down in the abyss. He calls himself a demon lord, but he was there before the demons. The lord of the dark and depths being a Lovecraftian interpretation, of course. Which actually brings us to the next type of patron. Clever beyond comprehension, with unknowable motive, horrifying, unthinkably massive, it's the algorithm. No. The ocean. No. It's manipulative and evil. Capitalism? No. It's ancient beyond words. Your birthday was last week. Hey. It was a struggle to find that many candles. You realize the wizard is next, right? Call it a preemptive strike. Touche. It's the great old one. <laughs> it's the pact of eldritch horrors from beyond the stars. Also called the gulag for short. And if you think that's gross, make sure that thought's yours, because it can speak into your brain in whatever language you know. This culminates at level 10, where you can guard against telepathy and share psychic damage with attackers. Your spells are all based on mental power and domination, and tentacles of course. Just like the last ability, where you can charm a creature until the end of your next long rest, sharing worldwide telepathy. Jumping back a bit, your level 6 ability lets you give an attack disadvantage, then you get advantage if they miss. It's once per rest and a little out of place, but overall I love how this class sticks to its theme. As per ideas, I mean, Guck did mention the algorithm for a reason. Like and sub, you made it this far after all. But, but seriously, being a YouTuber is trying to understand the system and went too deep. You uncovered an old supercomputer of times past. It injected you with nanobots and infected you with the internet. Those powers and spells were learned by accessing new websites or channels. Personally, I'd love to see 
using one of those as a magical telephone operator or secretary. Your telepathy is just wireless communication or the intercom system. Hijack people through airwaves like a conspiracy theorist's nightmare. Turn those tentacles into telephone cables. Maybe you can treat it like when you go so deep into a hobby or fandom it feels like there's no way out. Like it's clawing into your brain and rewriting the way you think. At first it's just whispers of hidden characters and fun facts, but by the end you're scarred with endless layers of Undertale AUs and MLP fanfics. Or the knowledge driving you to power and madness was just engineering fundamentals and problem solving. At level 3 you went packed to the tome with the engineering standards manual. Or you could keep it classic, go with Aboleth or Mind Player influence. It's the Lovecraftian class, so things rising up from the depths to boggle your mind is pretty standard. However, that's not the only route for your undersea adventures or for tentacles. This is the Fathomless Domain, the ever venerated mystery of the scene. You become amphibious and gain a swim speed of 40 feet to plunge its darkened depths. You also summon giant spectral tentacles, dealing cold damage and slowing foes. And of course, your spells are based on water, storms, and cold. Also, Big B's hand turned into a tentacle, which I recommend for all your spells. And if you're wondering why black tentacles somehow isn't on the list, it's because you have it as your 10th level feature. You also gain an extra use of tentacles, you're bolstered with temporary HP when you use tentacles, and nothing can make you stop focusing on tentacles. Speaking of which, at level 6, you can reduce the damage for those near your tentacle by a D8. You also start resisting cold damage and can speak to anything that's underwater. And I don't mean naturally underwater, I mean you can communicate through waterboarding. Infinite tongue spells via drowning. You wanna be near water anyway? At level 14, you get a panic button, teleporting the party up to a mile to the nearest body of water you've seen in a flurry of tentacles. They honestly should have called this a tentacle domain, but I guess people might have gotten the wrong idea. Or the right one, depending on your character and campaign and source of power. Krakens are the obvious source, but hacks work great with the classes by. Maybe your people venerate an ancient frog hemoth for their wisdom, or an aboleth out of fear, or some tentacled beast from the far realm. You could just be a master chef, and the tentacles are from your cooking, or strands of pasta. Maybe you're insect-based, and they're grasping legs or webs, plant-based with vines, or ghostly chains, but water-based is the classic, and there's a lot of room to work with. I mean, for starters, what does this even want? When my buddy Bittery wasn't magic like her sorceress twin, she sought out a deity of the scene. It offers great power, but she has to learn something new every day. He wants a pulse on the land's great knowledge. Your patron might be benign, or seeking out threats, or learning where to strike and who to tempt. They might demand sacrifice, or your hag patrons need ingredients from inland. Maybe they're raising you until you're strong enough to recover something hidden from them. They might be trying to help your noble goals because the kingdom you're saving runs on coal. The rising sea levels will help them take the coast. And speaking of dragging up from the depths to terrorize the coast, the Undying Pact. It's the undead version from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, and the Skag's name alone terrorizes some with its mediocrity. I actually enjoy some of the Skag classes, but well, the haters can't always be wrong. The spell list is death-themed, of course. There's a few odd bits like legend lore and silence, but they mostly just grabbed anything that had death or disease implied. You also get advantage on disease saves, and if an undead who you haven't tried to hurt is using a single target attack or spell, they have to make a save or target someone else instead. If they do make the save, or you attack them, they're now immune. That's uh, about as useful as the level 10 ability, where you don't need to eat, sleep, or breathe anymore and age at 1 tenth rate. You know what is fun? Getting to recover 1d8 plus level health and reattach limbs. Less great is using it once per short rest at level 14. I'll be real, the only cool ability you get here is level 6. When you succeed on a death save or stabilize someone with Spare the Dying, you are gain a d8 plus con health. That lets you bring yourself back from the brink of death, but only once per day. If your DM's greedy enough to be lopping off limbs, you're not gonna make it to level 14 with this class. They get an undead theme, but nothing active, and it makes you more durable, but not by much, and you don't have anything to do while close anyway. I'm tempted to rework this or skip to the next pact, but I guess this is the perfect place to ask the universal question. Why did you take this pact? Did an undead offer you eternal life, or a place underneath them when you failed to slay them? Did you become a serpent to save your village, or needed revenge and only they were willing? Perhaps you packs with someone else to survive a zombie or mummy curse. The patron's power is just stopping you from dying and your power is the parts getting through. And of course this goes with the rest too. Why did you think that binding yourself to the king in yellow was a good idea? Are you just wanting the world to burn or do you think you can do more good with her power than they'll do bad through you? Does the devil have your sister's soul and you traded yours for hers? So why isn't just important from a story perspective? Not just one of the most interesting parts of your entire origin, it's one of the first things your party will ask you. Right after, why didn't you just pick Undead Pact? Forget about the power, it just does the undead flavor so much better. I mean, yeah, the spells still feel like they just grabbed anything with death in the description, but your starting ability is Form of Dread. You turn into an aspect of your patron, gaining temporary HP, fear immunity, and spreading fear when you hit people. Hey, look, something to actually do with that survivability. And each ability grants extra effects in that form. At level 6, you can make your attacks do necrotic damage, but they do even more damage in the form of Dread. At 10, you gain necrotic resistance or immunity in Dread. You can also just refuse to drop to 0 HP and explode with necrotic damage instead. Be careful with that though, because it takes 1d4 days to recharge and exhaust you. Still, much better than the expected result of blowing yourself up. You can also scout ahead with your level 14 spirit projection. Your soul leaves your body and can run around for an hour. And don't worry about hiding your body, just shove it in your bag of holding. You haven't needed to eat, sleep, or breathe since level 6. You can still take damage 
damage and die, but you resist normal weapon damage, cast spells without using most components, fly and walk through walls, and while in form of dread, you can heal for half the damage of an attack. And if you ditch your body somewhere, you can warp to it or it to you when you're done. Only once per day, but it's still really cool. I mean, it's hard to get more undead flavored than literally becoming a ghost, though that does make reflavoring really hard since not much can walk through walls. You can at least change your dread form to say more about your patron, turn your limbs into their limbs, have their spectral form hover beside you. Maybe they can see and hear you like this, and does your character know? You might hate using this form because you don't like it learning about your life and friends. You could change this to a spirit of the land, a manifestation of rot and decay, a form of death's place in nature instead of undeath's fight against it. But death is pretty entwined in this one. That's fine though, it can be a sign of quality if you can't revive easily. It means they actually committed to the bit, and come to think of it, what happens if you aren't? This is more for the DM, but what if your player just ignores the patron? Do they eventually annoy them enough to lose their powers? Perhaps the patron possesses them, or they start gaining exhaustion, or take daily damage like the Gia spell. They might just start getting debuffs, or get warped back to their patron. Maybe the secret is that they can't take the power back, but suddenly you have other powerful allies bearing down on them to kill or capture. I know I don't usually advise combative DMing, but I am all for actions having consequences. I'd give them warning since they're a valuable asset, but if they chose to use then betray an arc devil or a lich or god, then they're gonna learn what happens when they don't stay in their weight class. After all, as we learned from the most well-known melee warlock, there's farming equipment that outranks you. The Hexblade has you working with a sentient magic item. Yeah, some are so powerful they can basically manifest multiples of themselves. And don't worry, they're not expecting you to rush into a brawl with a short sword and a dream. Your spells are all focused on combat, mobility and damage and avoiding damage. You get medium armor, shields, and can use martial weapons. If your weapon is one-handed, you can also bind it to yourself. You can then use your charisma instead of your strength or dex. And this works for all your conjured weapons if you choose Pact of the Blade at level 3. And I'm gonna be real, you probably want to do that since it lets you conjure better weapons or dual wield. There's also an invocation that lets you use a bow if you want to go archer, just saying. Anyway, you can also hex people once per short rest. You'll crit them easier, do more damage, and heal a bit when they die. At level 10, you can give that cursed person a 50% chance to miss you too. You are pretty much made to kill bosses, at least until level 14 where you can make the hex bounce to another creature after they die, letting you rip through minions. Level 6 is your non-hex ability, binding souls of slaying bows and making them bite their friends. You make a slightly more durable specter that follows your commands until you rest. That's, uh, kinda messed up. Like, there's nothing else here that's evil unless you count the cursing, but you can just flavor that as being super focused or raging or something. It's basically just a modified version of the Ranger's Hunter's Mark. I mean, I guess you could flavor it as Artemis giving you a temporary companion as a reward for a good hunt? I don't know, there's not much you can do to get around this being messed up. Here's a question though, do you think the Hexblades lean towards edginess because they're upset they were less magical than a stick they found? Like, you know that some of them have to be bitter that a steak knife had more magic than them? More importantly, what does your angry frying pan even want? Do they want to fry the flesh of more creatures and you're an easy way to do it? Do they have a grudge against their smith or the god that formed them? Are they a tool that lived long enough to gain a soul? Or did someone use and care for them enough they started to copy their personality? Maybe the previous owner lives on inside their tools of the trade. Are you just there to fulfill desires they no longer can? Maybe they link minds to peel the breeze on their skin again, if only for a moment. It could be some poor grandma or hyperactive kid who misses being alive. Or they're a collective of everyone who came before you whose only goal is absorbing your kills and eventually you too. I like to think of them as kind of like an egg. Those massive artifact level items are all different forms of the same base materials or creatures. You have a shard, this larval form, basically embedded in you. As you adventure, it inhabits new weapons like a hermit crab, until eventually you die and it uses your body as a catalyst to fully form. Maybe you are dead, but it wasn't ready, so the person who's speaking is actually the weapon piloting the body and keeping it alive. Let's just hope you don't run into people from their past who might spot the difference. A peer that's all too familiar to the patrons of the Archbay Pact. Look, we gotta remember one of the original bad decisions. The Hexblade's a bad decision because you're taking orders from a soup spoon. The Fae will mess you up as a party game. You start off with utility spells. Sleep, dominate, invisibility, the stuff that helps but mostly does no damage. Continuing that, you can charm or frighten creatures for a round if they get too close once per short rest. That mostly helps in early game, but by level 6 you'll usually default to Misty Escape. It's Misty Steps teleportation, but also makes you invisible. It's only once a short rest, but you usually won't need it much more than that anyway. At 10 you become immune to charm and can actually reflect them back at the caster. You'd be surprised by how few things with charm abilities are immune. The Beholder will probably charm themselves by accident at some point, and at level 14 for one minute you can make someone see only you. The world falls away, no sight, no sound, just you and the Misty Void. Don't underestimate it, it's a terrifying feeling. I would know. Um, anyway, a little underpowered by modern standards, I'd up some of your weaker abilities to proficiency times a day, but it's still barely solid. A fifth of all monsters are immune to charm, but that's what spells and your friends are for. As for flavor, I mean, there are tons of fae to choose from. Make the queen of anything from mean lock to giant hydra geese. Strides and naiads and pixies are classic. Hags basically go without saying, and that's not even getting into all the named ones. Maybe you just got really messed up at a satyr party and came back as part of the fraternity, drunken oath to boot. But with fae especially, remember the terms of your agreement. Maybe the satyrs demand the spread of their 
their debauchery or the red caps demand blood and the little house may have a strict set of hospitality rules they expect you to follow. The queen of the fairies might yank you back to her place to act as a servant in your dreams, using you as the court's entertainment. Whenever you level up, you disappear for five seconds, but it was years in your time. One of my favorite people is a Paylock, a dear to I've known for much of my life. Her dumbass parents got a fake queen to bust their child with being beloved and beautiful, then mocked her in private for being so easy to work. The fake couldn't go back on the blessings, but showed them how easily they could backfire. The girl grew up to be the sweetest and most kind-hearted soul who eventually found the Fane Lake and broke down crying. Her parents could barely bend off the army of horrible suitors and there was no way her spine was surviving much longer. Her species moves by jumping. She swore an oath to always try and help people and do good things to the best of her knowledge if only they would grant her relief. The Fae felt pity and accepted, complete with thaumaturgy fueled magical girl transformation and a fitted bag of holding. Unfortunately, she's dumb as rocks and has trouble understanding what good and people are. How come these dragons are people and these ones aren't? Maybe that one's tail flick is sign language you don't understand. Or that one isn't speaking and you're lying to me. She mostly gets it right from dumb luck, but it causes her fairy godmother so much grief. Cause in her little crayon notebook, she's decided people have names and clothes and stuff, but a title isn't a name. So a dressed up dog named Fred might be a people, but if that's just a guard, all bets are off. But she's technically not breaking contract when she ties up and robs that villager, cause she is genuinely trying to do good. Sometimes your magical girl is just an airhead. But speaking of doing good, thanks for sticking around for the story by the way. There's more to it, but I didn't know where else I could share this, and I've been friends with her for like 11 years. But speaking of good, Celestia Warlock. Why spend your life in undying devotion for a tiny chance you get something in return? Just be an employee and get the powers guaranteed. Your spells are healing with some radiant and fire damage, plus the light and sacred flame cantrips. They might not be the most useful ones, but if you don't want to focus on upgrading Eldritch Blast, then sacred flame is a great substitute. Especially at level 6, where you add your charisma modifier while dealing radiant or fire damage. Also at level 1, you get a bunch of d6s that you can use to heal people as a bonus action from 60 feet. Your raw numbers aren't going to outheal a cleric or something, but getting your level plus 1 in free healing word spells is amazing. At 10th level, you and the party get temporary HP when you rest, and at 14, it's hard to make you stay down. Once per day, instead of making a death save, you can heal to half, blind all enemies within 30 feet, and do a bit of radiant damage. There's also no save on that, they're just blind. Now I am a bit biased towards it because I love the flavor, but it does leave me wondering, why Sacred Flame? Why not just make your Eldritch Blast radiant? Come to think of it, why doesn't every patron modify the blast? The Fiend is Fire, Old One Psychic, Fathomless Cold, etc. Anyway, the first thing people are gonna wonder is what makes you different from the Cleric? Well, for one, you're not always chosen by fate or even devoted. Now, you could be devoted, and I can actually see these warlocks as being more trusted than the Cleric. A Cleric can go corrupt, or start hating the God, or secretly be drawing their power from a different God. When the Cleric stops doing the God's work, they still keep their power. But with the Warlock, regardless of why they're devoted, you know they have to follow the terms of that specific God. And not some biased interpretation of old text, they have clear and direct instructions that are always being updated and they are being monitored and reprimanded. Finding yourself in service like this might be seen as a high honor, though you might see them as no different than any other powerful magic creature. Maybe this really is just a job or a means to an end and you're willing to work for them for the power to do what you really want. You also might not have made this with a god. Maybe you saved a minor archon, garnered favor with an animal lord, gained the affection of a unicorn. Maybe it's a fallen angel who's granting these powers and really you're more healing based than celestial based. There are dukes of hell that have healing and even Lolth can grant it. Maybe you made a pact with the sun or the core of the plane of fire or you're worshipping what was essentially a nuclear strike. You're some sort of mutated animal or plant and owe it your sentience. And to the alarm of everyone around you, the pact of service you offered actually went through. Nobody knows who accepted that pact or what it wants to do. And speaking of someone suddenly getting power from a mysterious entity due to what people thought was just a wish upon a star, it's genie time. Not gonna lie, this one's probably my favorite. If you watched the druid episode, you know I have a history with half genie heroes. Since you're getting your power from an elemental genie, you have two sets of spells. Half comes from the elemental portion, like burning hands or wall of stone, and half comes from the genie part, like creation and wish. But forget about that, you still need to pick your symbol of office. As a reversal power play, now you're the genie in the bottle. A lamp, jar, ring, statue, it's what you're bound to and what you focus your cast spells through. While touching it, you can add extra damage of your genie's element to your attacks. You also resist that element at level 6 and learn to fly in 10 minute chunks. At level 1, you also learn to enter your object. It's a 20 by 20 cylinder on the inside, a little room for you. Modestly furnished, comfortable temperatures, and you can hear what's going on outside. It's great for sneaking into places, resting in places others can't follow, and just being kinda cool. If it gets smashed or stolen, you can get a new one during your short rest, and it kinda acts like a limited bag of holding since your items stay in there. At 10, you can bring others inside with you, take a short rest in the span of 10 minutes, and make healed hit die much more potent. I'm always hearing about tension between classes over short rest, but not with this one. Anyone who needs one can just hop in your bottle, and the people who don't just keep moving. Or you can wait till the end and have everyone stay in there for a safe long rest. And at 14, you get Limited Wish. I miss this so much. Limited Wish lets you cast any spell of level 6 or lower for free, though it has to be an action and does take a few days to recharge. However, within those bounds, it can be anything you want, and note that there isn't a cost. If the spell consumes a thousand gold worth of rare components,
components not your problem. I put the genie last because this, to me, is one of 5e's pinnacle examples, not just of warlocks, of class making in general. Bits that change to be custom to your character, really flavorful abilities that directly impact your playstyle, things that you can do that nobody else can. It's solid as a base, fantastic with creativity, and that is exactly what I'm looking for. And this really focuses on something that's there for every class. What is your relationship with your patron? Are you related or a favorite servant with unlimited freedom? Did you appeal to their self-importance and offer them a reverse of the usual setup? Humans keep finding them to service, so keeping you around as a status symbol or pet is incredibly appealing. And for all patrons, maybe you just share similar goals. You didn't save a Celestial, you just found one whose goals aligned and they respected you. You approached a company with a business presentation and the board agreed to your proposal, turning you into Undying Domain. Undead Domain's the promotion you're after. Maybe you're just a little scamp and some pixies like your style, turning you into a mascot and just letting in loose. You gained favor with every satyr at a party and they agreed to help you out so you would keep coming back. Sometimes you took the deal because it's genuinely good for both of you. Remember, after all, despite common belief, they don't have to take your soul. What they get out of it could just be entertainment, their agenda pushed, being family, favors, thinking you're hot. It doesn't have to be malicious. But whatever you want to do, I hope I cleared up some misconceptions about warlocks and got a few of you interested. Sorcerer, warlock, alchemist, druid, which one's my favorite class to play honestly just depends on the day. But if you're not a fan of the flavor this class is dripping in, a couple recommendations. If you want to lean into the magical side, the sorcerer also has spells you can modify. And the paladin or ranger is great if you're wanting that melee magician. Though honestly, even the specialized classes have at least one subclass that's a melee caster, so you could just check out the nearly finished class list. That feels really weird to say. What if we don't see the catchphrase, huh? What are you gonna do about it? Ugh, sorry, I'm just kinda torn. These are fun, and this is the end. I'm excited to move on to new things after this, but it's the worst kind of farewell. The kind where I have to say nice things about the wizard. So settle in, class, we got a lot of ground to cover. Mostly in the 11 subclasses, the wizard itself is nothing. Do I really need to describe it? If you've even heard of magic, you probably have a good idea. And no, that's not because they're superior, it's because they're writing most of the books. C6 hit die, can't use armor or tools or even weapons outside what the average kid could. Your magic's in a book which can be destroyed, so make a backup. Bright side, you get two more spells per level and can learn as many as you can afford to rank. So with money and time, you can learn two-thirds of all spells ever discovered. At level 18, you can cast two weak spells infinitely, and at 20, you can choose two third level spells to always be prepared with one free use. Everything else is a subclass, with new features at level 2, 6, 10, and 14. Wait, what? Why are we starting at level 2? The subclass is always at level 3 unless it's vital to start with it like the Warlock. Did Watsy just want to make him feel more special? Would make sense, that's kind of their thing. There are 27 spells unique to them, and 58 to them in the Sorcerer. Guess you don't need features when you have 337 spell options, and if you can afford 50 gold per spell level, you can take everything you find. It kind of makes Blizzard duels like playing a card game for keeps, like if Yu-Gi-Oh kept more of the original manga's tone. Anyway, let's get this show on the road. One more time. You ready? Let's go. Let's start with a standard straightforward one, Evocation. Most of your subclasses are specializations of a specific type of magic. You can still use other types, but your abilities will make use of or invoke the flavor of the school you majored in. All your subclasses will have two level two abilities and the school beast ones will all have one in common. Cut the time and gold spent when copying spells of your school in half. Funnily enough, the ability works best when you don't take spells of your school when you level up. But if there's no spell shop or university around, you probably should. It's mostly there for snagging spells from other people's books. For the Evocation Wizard, your second level two ability is Sculpt Spell. You can choose people to automatically take no damage from your area spell if there's a save for half. You know, basically that sorcerer meta magic they have to spend a resource and part of a feature on. Only infinite and for free. At level 6, your save for no damage cantrips become save for half. At 10, you add your intelligence mod to one damage roll for your evocation spells. And at 14, you can automatically do maximum damage with spells up to 5th level. You can technically do it as much as you want, but you start taking increasing damage each time as you overtax yourself. Pretty straightforward with evocation, both in subclasses and in spells. It's the school of blasting people with every element. It's energy emission. This is for the wizard that doesn't want to think, they want to make things explode. And you know what, when you're in a profession based in killing things, that's not a terrible mindset. Evocation wizards are the premier battle wizards for that reason. Whether you consider explosions in art and yourself the greatest sculptor, or just want things dead with a wave of your wand, evocation's got you covered. However, since it's the most straightforward one, it's harder to find a magician I can't use as an example, so how about we twist something else? The spellbook. Talk with your DM to approve the change, yada yada, but what exactly is that spellbook? I've seen it scrolled on the hilt of a weapon, primal magic written in codes of woven beans, Pockets full of napkin scribbles and an hour of prep was just finding the ones he needed. Perfectly neat tomes do work, of course, or maybe they're embroidered, or runes on a tablet, or a bag of little hand-carved statues that inspire you. And if your DM doesn't want to take away your spell buck, you can get even weirder. Instead of a book, you cloud watch and find the day's spells there, or they're tattooed onto you. Or you've got a perfect memory, but if you don't prepare by pacing around repeating them to yourself, you freeze up from panic anyway. Also, your spells take so long to copy because they're all written in unique ways. Maybe yours are written as poetry, or stories, or in stage notation. It's a picture book with things to remind you of people and creatures and 
and how they did it. Maybe it's all incomprehensible memes from your time in wizard school, or fan art collections that invoke the proper feelings. You could even have it be like a diary entry and you're relearning how you first did it. Though you might want that warded, which is what abjuration is all about. I mean, if you're planning on getting into fights, defensive magic just makes sense. It's guards, wards, removing hostile magic. Abjuration wizards gain a damage ward once per day that works as a shield, and they use it by casting any abjuration spell. Twice your level, plus your intelligence mod, and lasts all day, so it's usually active from the start thanks to mage armor. The way it's worded basically makes it a better temporary HP that stacks with temporary HP. You can also have it absorb damage your friends take at level 6. This is especially important because an attack that doesn't break your ward doesn't break concentration, which most magic classes will always be using. At level 10, you gain proficiency in spells like Counterspell that require a check, and at 14, you resist all spell damage and have advantage on your saves. Overall, it's pretty solid, especially for people who tend to freeze up in combat. Your abilities in most spells are either reactionary or used before battle, which also cuts down on your number of offensive spells. Counterspell proficiency is also amazing. You can shut down enemy casters so consistently. Your main goal in battle is survival, because you know that target the caster is one of the first rules of combat. By the way, this school attracts nervous types, so why are you in a dungeon? Are you a scared researcher dragged into battle because dungeons have ancient magic you can study? Maybe you're too poor for magic school, so you're adventuring for spells to raid. You know that dungeoneering might be dangerous, but the school of hard knocks teaches quick and you need an edge. Or maybe your party is forcing you in the back because you'd charge headfirst in the battle. You think your magic makes you near invincible. You're actually really big and burly. You just became a wizard to shore up your magical resistance. You are a war mage and far more than one of those evocation wizards. Anyone can launch fireballs from the back lines. You're putting yourself in harm's way to shield against them and shut people down. Though of course the real war wizard is the war w wizard. The war wizard doesn't specialize. Adaptability is key for a battle tactician. You add your intelligence to initiative instead of the usual magical discount and when you get hit you can give yourself a bonus to your AC or the same. The downside is that you can only cast cantrips next turn but plus four in a save is a lot. Especially at this level when saves are like DC 12. Now a plus two AC is not the biggest surge but it does stack with your level 10 plus two to AC and saves whenever you're concentrating on a spell. You'll almost always be concentrating in battle so if you start taking heat just stop doing big spells. You can easily have an effective AC of more than plate mail and a ridiculous save resistance. Plus you're not too far off from 14. We're using that level 2 ability also makes 3 people take force damage. Helps make up for your lower damage next turn. While Abjuration's great at keeping the party alive, you're great at keeping yourself alive. The only non-defensive thing you get is level 6. Power Surge lets you gain a stack of energy anytime you successfully counter spell or dispel magic. Every stack you burn on a spell adds half your level in damage. You also get one on a short rest if you're out, so it's not entirely useless even if you don't run into enemy mages. This is for the wizard that wants to use all those cool short range spells despite being a glass cannon. I mean I know I glossed over it, but you have no armor and the lowest HP. Mage armor can help, but you're still not that durable. I would double down on that concept too, be a dwarf or a turtle or something. Either go for like a grung or a halfling, someone who needs all the help they can get surviving. And if you're focusing your infinite magical possibilities on one purpose or school, you need to know why. Maybe War Academy was expected of you, or just cheap enough to afford. Or maybe you aren't trained, you're just an old mercenary who can't keep up anymore and is turning to magic to stay useful. You could have nothing to do with war, you're just a merchant who picked up any spell they thought could keep them alive. Maybe you were sent to learn magic as a tactician, but like fighting too much to stay out of the action. Besides, it's tactical, some of the best spells are close range, and you can take advantage of people getting out of position to attack the wizard who's right there, only to find themselves suddenly surrounded. It's still a dangerous game, if your defense fails you've still got low HP, but it lets you at least play the close range game without instant death. But if you are fine with a risk of death, you just really want to live on that knife's edge, might I interest you in Blade Song? Blade singing is an elven thing, but they remove the restriction in Tasha's. Good, they can have their special toy back when they stop considering multiple apocalypses a valid cause for an elves only clubhouse. Anyway, Blade Song's for wizards who want to take up a sword and go running into battle. You're proficient in knight armor, which is actually worse than mage armor, and a single type of one-handed melee weapon. You also get this special state you can enter called Blade Song. It only lasts a minute and you have to meet your list of requirements and not get knocked out, but it has a host of benefits. You're faster, add intelligence to AC and concentration saves, and have advantage on acrobatics. You can use this state your proficiency times per day, like a barbarian rage for nerds. At level 10 it lets you expend spell slots to reduce incoming damage, and at 14 you add intelligence to your damage as well. Be careful though, because it's all wrapped up in that song. Except for level 6, which lets you attack twice per attack action with the option to replace one with a cantrip. Attacking multiple times per turn is pretty required for a martial class, so it makes sense you have it. Now all that said, you're still taking a gamble on this one. Your AC can get crazy high, but there's plenty of ways around AC. On the sliding scale of subclasses from warrior to caster, you're among the furthest on the caster side. It can be fun to be a wizard who runs in swinging like the rest of the party. Everyone else dabbles in magic, so why can't you dabble in swordplay? Maybe you like studying fitness and combat as a hobby. Or everyone in town knows combat, so even you couldn't escape without something. Sometimes you snap and go to a frenzy of blades, too angry to focus on spell placement and strategy. Or maybe you're just acting out those music back fight scenes you daydream about during long study sessions. You think you're gonna be so cool, you'll be just like those anime sword fighters from the videos, but sometimes you get hit and lose your focus and have to go back to fireball. Or it's just military training and even the wizard needs to know how to use a spear. Though with so many war-focused wizards running around, the smartest thing to go into is probably necromancy. Always plenty of subjects and so much variety in your spells. Blasting, cursing, reviving the dead to normal.
normal life and a knife, astral projection, even some weird healing spells. But as for your necromancer abilities, you get what you came here for. Casting animate dead, getting more skeletons with it, making them stronger and tougher. And at 14, you can take control of wild undead and steal them from other wizards. So smart undead do get a save to break free every hour. You can also do more than just raise undead. At level 10, you resist necrotic damage and can't have your max HP reduced by undead. And at level 2, where you start off, you can heal whenever you kill things with a spell. Twice the spell up on health, triple if it was a necromancy spell. I know it doesn't sound like much, but you're gonna have like 9 HP when you get this. Not that much is still a pretty decent amount for you. And look, you can be the cackling evil overlord and have tons of fun. Don't get me wrong, being a villain is great. You can be that cartoon villain who's on the party's side, but only for now, young heroes. There's a difference between being evil and being a jerk, and a lot of DMs who are against evil characters have plenty of those in their campaigns. I think most people are against evil characters because they think they're gonna be disruptive, but I have yet to see a disruptive evil player who wasn't a disruptive hero too. As long as the villain goes along with the party, I see no issue. But forget about the villains, but about the friendly necromancers with flowers in their hair and on their skeletons. The ones who are spreading seeds in their zombies, turning them into walking fertilizer packets. Blue collar workers using them for manual labor and dangerous jobs so people don't get hurt. Picture a society where you can sign up your body to help out in the mines like you'd sign up as an organ donor. Screw what the book says, necromancy doesn't have to be evil. Yeah, it's the study of life, not just on life. Healing spells have changed school in like every edition, but they were originally necromancy and have been that more than any other school. People keep trying to reclassify because they can't handle nuance. Stop turning necromancy into spells that scare me, school. Most spells are just tools with no moral alignment, and the ones that can be used almost exclusively for evil aren't usually in this school. Oh yeah, the skeletons will roam free after 24 hours. Then redo the spell or end them first. Name a long-term spell that won't keep messing with its environment. What machine doesn't keep chugging after your death? And yours can be undone by a passing pig or dairy cow. Anime dead is mimicking life. It's magical puppetry. People keep saying we're disrespecting the body like they aren't doing the same to animals. The only difference is a sense of self-importance. Some of us are evil, but some of all wizards are evil. At least we're honest and having fun with it. Yeah, not like the enchantment wizards. Not all bad, whatever, but if you're wanting a real evil, that's what you look at. Enchantment isn't really enchanting items like you might expect. It's mostly controlling people's minds and thoughts. You have a few odd spells like Power Word Kill for some reason, but even your host of buffs and debuffs are mostly through muddling minds. As for your abilities, at first you daze someone within 5 feet of you. You can use your actions to keep it going forever and they're incapacitated, but it ends as soon as they're attacked or you're more than 5 feet away. So it's good for freezing something that's about to kill you, but you're basically removing both of you from battle. It's an interesting risk reward play against a boss though. Level 6 is similar, this time making someone attacking you within 30 feet change target. Note that if there's multiple people closest to them, they can choose the target, so you're not usually making them hit their allies. This also fails if they're immune to charm, which is about a fifth of the monsters, so just be aware of that. Same for 14, where you make a target unaware that they were ever charmed, the main drawback of most mind manipulation spells. You can also make your victim forget hours of memories, make them do whatever you want then forget they were ever there. And you'll have plenty of targets because at 10th level, your single target enchantment spells target two creatures. Single target is most of your best spells. Forget the mind manipulation, you could infinitely twin power word pain. And look, I'm sorry, but there's no way around like half of these spells just being evil. It's mind manipulation and control. Ripping someone's sense of self away and forcing them to do things they don't want to do is never okay. And even if they did consent, being unable to revoke consent is sketchy as hell. Now the enchantment wizard is strong, absolutely. You can shut down like half the field with some bad rolls, but this hypnosis has no safe word. It's a good thing I allow evil characters because if you're playing one of these, neutrality is a struggle. Do they struggle making friends because they're never sure if their love for you is real? Is your enchanter a master manipulator reveling in their abilities? That's the way I'd run it. Go full supervillain, manipulating your enemies and forcing them into line. Maybe you're a cutthroat business owner, using enchantments to claw your way to the top. The adventuring's just for quick capital after your stores got burned down by a rival. You'll get strong, enact bloody vengeance, then rise again unopposed. And if your DM's fine with you breaking the mold, try out different ways of making these effects. Maybe you use pheromone-filled perfume, or you daze people by teleporting drugs down their throat. Or maybe a bay gave you your spell book and the power to enchant those and look in your eye. And your hour of prep is just sating her with food and conversation. But if total manipulation is giving you a god complex, put it away. The only divine a wizard handles is divining the future. Divination is basically just the school of knowledge. The future, past, languages, relationships, locations of things and people and what they're doing. Divinations have knowledge and with it comes power. Knowledge of the future gives you two d20 rolls at the start of every day. You can then replace basically any d20 roll with that number. I didn't say any of yours. Any roll made by any creature you can see. If you roll high, the paladin gets an at will ultra smite crit. Roll low and the enemy's missing whenever you choose. Mid rolls are a bit more tricky, but I find they're best for saves. Your spell DC is good enough that 11's probably not passing unless they're really good at a skill, and a 
medium roll on something you're good at is usually enough to get by. Those two dice become three at level 14 because it's powerful enough that one use is still a fantastic level 14 ability. But what about more knowledge in the way of so many more spells? Starting at level 6, casting a divination spell makes you regain a spell slot of one level more, or a fifth level spot if it's level 6 or higher. This means you can use divinations all the time, they barely affect you. Make sure to take mind spikes so you can splash out level 2 spells like cantrips by mid game because they just turn into level 1s for magic missile or silvery barbs. And at level 10, you can save on a few spell slots by getting some utility. Once per day, you can choose to see in the dark, see the invisible, or peer into the ghost dimension. Last until your next rest. I just can't overstate how cool Portin is. But don't forget that you have so many spells, you should always be spying on the next room to know what comes next. Though as useful as it is, why are you studying it? Are you a scholar who actually prefers peering into the past and learn forgotten history? Did you lose someone in an ambush and swear it would never happen again? Are you just power hungry and knowledge is power? And do you find it a curse like so many oracles pass? Or maybe you just have a crippling need to be the smartest one in the room, and by knowing what's coming next, you can act like a problem you are given the answer to is super obvious because you're just that smart. I know that's some of you. That's why I've got my attitude towards wizards. I've got nothing against the craft and I look up to quite a few. My admiration towards the school's founder is why I'm here and Amelia is one of my closest friends. But a lot of them turn that power into elitism, which is one of my most hated traits, bringing down my general opinion. Turns out that thinking you can outsmart physics doesn't tend to make you humble. It could. Maybe you read things in the stars and feel the weight of how cosmically small you are. Maybe you're so desperate to learn and prepare because it makes you feel weak. You're the type with 10 backup plans for every situation. Or maybe you don't know what's going on, you're just guessing based on vibe. The insanely lucky person foretold by the law of averages to counteract my birth. I've made several people who are against superstition and religion as a concept start believing in petty luck. But if you're looking to make people change, transmutation has got you covered. More in a physical sense though, really useful. Everyone's always hating on them for being weak or whatever, but I've seen a transmutation wizard in action and he was fucking awesome. They just take a little bit to come online. I'll admit that the level 2 ability isn't great. You turn a non-magical object made of iron, copper, silver, wood, or stone into something of a different material. It's useful for scamming people or breaking holes in walls, but the fact that it's 10 minutes really limits its use. Thankfully, you have more abilities, like your level 6 transmitter stone. You have a special rock that can make its holder faster, resist a damage type off a list, have proficiency in con saves, or have dark vision. The fact that you can pass this around and change its function when you cast a spell makes it a lot more useful than you might expect. It also gets more functions at level 14, letting you break the stone to raise the dead, make someone look younger, completely heal them while curing curses and such, or transform an object into another object. Having a free raise dead or full heal is wonderful. Oh, and level 10 gives you polymorph and lets you cast a restricted version once per day for free. It's good for travel and scouting. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and say they're the strongest by any means, that's probably divination, and if you're a DM, I'd suggest making a new second level ability or at least reducing the time. But to be fair, with this school, your discounted spell really makes a difference. You can learn 69 transmutation spells and they're the best ones. Tons of buffs and utility, but also teleportation, flight, breathing fire, shape-shifting, spells like reverse gravity, disintegrate, haste, time stop, and of course my love, my favorite spell, catapult. Launching random items to people is the best. Like, we've been glossing over these spells, but wizards have it all. Transmutation is one of the schools that benefit the most from having creativity at the table. You affect your friends in the battlefield as much as you do your foes. You're a battle tactician molding the field, a scholar of the building blocks of existence, or the type of person who makes things like the owlbear. Whether you're a mad scientist or a humble engineer, transmutation magic is my favorite spell school. Though to be fair, the next two are contenders. If you can handle even more creativity at the cost of physicality, illusion is for you. Illusion spells are all about misleading, distracting, and invisibility. Though you do have a few damaging spells, sometimes belief is nearly as good. You'd be shocked at what the body can do to make its perception reality. The placebo and nocebo effect are absurdly strong. Now as for the subclass, a creative player will have a field day with a catch. Put a pin in that thought, we'll come back to it. At level 2, you crank up the minor illusion spell to have all of its effects at once. Your illusions can be visual and audible. A crack in the wall with a growling creature, a terrified goblin that actually screams, etc. And it takes an action to even try to disbelieve. And honestly, if it's me running, having both really eliminates most reasons people would even try. And even better, at level 6 you can change your illusion as an action. If you need a different one, you don't have to waste a slot. Now most of these only last 1-10 to 10 minutes, but you can get some use here in a dungeon or crowded area. Especially since you can change the audio, so you can basically have it hold a conversation. And if they try to prove it fake by touching it, at level 14 the illusion can just become temporarily real. Or at least you can make it partially real. Like if you make an illusion of someone climbing a ladder, the ladder can actually be real for a minute. So as you'd expect, your illusion spells are cranked up to 11 here. The only thing not aimed at a spell is your level 10 ability. You can make someone automatically miss their attack against you with an illusion of yourself, and it's once for short rest which is pretty nice. Honestly, it's my favorite defensive ability, since as a wizard you really shouldn't be getting attacked much to begin with. Now let's go back to that part I told you to remember. The illusion wizard can be one of the best of all, or the worst by far, and it depends on both you and your DM. Now I don't usually factor this in, because if your DM's a jackass, every class is bad. So we're not calling divination bad just because your DM might refuse to let it work. The thing is, with illusion you can be shut down by a nice DM who's trying to be generous. It really all depends on your expectations, because there's a lot of interpretation in this class and it's their job to balance you. If you're wanting to use this, think of a few example situations 
situations to run by him. If you make a little plucking chicken wander near goblins on a stealth mission, how do they react? You've crept into the base of some cultist during a ritual, and since you know who the god is, you create a flaming symbol that speaks. You snap the bandit's rope bridge and made an illusory copy, things like that. Some DMs will revel in it, embellish it, or at least give you a chance unless the situation's far-fetched. You're gonna have a great time with those ones. Some, however, will absolutely not. Some will have everyone immediately roll to disbelieve everything or fight you tooth and nail on every limit. Don't roll illusion with them because your limit isn't your creativity. It's how well the two of you can meet in the middle. And this goes with a lot of classes, of course. Anything that's based in creativity or interpretation. Communication is key because what's obvious or sensible to one of you won't always be for the other and you won't know where that line is until you find it. And I find it's better to find it when workshopping than mid-session. But if you want less DM leeway and more tangibility, allow me to interest you in Conjuration. Flip the script on the DM because this is the one with all the summons. But even without bogging down the action economy, you can summon knives, tentacles, clouds of fire, teleport by summoning yourself. You start by being able to summon an object of your choice, up to three feet tall and glowing. It's good for items you don't have on hand and fun to use as a visual aid. At level six, you can teleport 30 feet, potentially swapping with a willing creature. It also recharges whenever you cast a conjuration spell, so feel free to swap with your fighter. At level 10, you can't lose concentration on a conjuration spell due to damage, and you should always have a concentration spell up because why else are you playing this wizard? Especially when your summons get 30 extra HP at level 14, which is the HP boost from upcasting at three levels, so pretty solid. But despite that, you don't have to be summon based. There's all sorts of fun you can have with conjuration. Be battlefield control with all your hazards and debuffs. Combine that with epication for maximum area of effectiveness or abjuration to be impossible to put down. Divination and enchantment can help you tangle them up, and if you're constantly making real summons, I personally wouldn't have my monsters even check for your illusions. Here at the end, I want you to remember that you still get all your spell schools no matter your specialization, though of course you would still be remiss to ignore your summons. Be a ringmaster with spectacular summons and amazing illusions to boggle the mind. A rogue scientist using spirit summons to workshop new ideas. The kind who's trying to invent the next owlbear. Do you have monster bits and little vials that grow into summons when magically shattered? Wooden carvings, plush toys, a bonsai tree that grows fruit in the shape of the creature. You mold a piece of clay, or your drawings come to life, or you smash screeching stardust into shape. Maybe you have origami summons that fold into the real deal like our founder. That sort of fun is why I'm here. The person behind Goblin U was a conjuration and transmutation savant. The great Cornelius Archibald the Verdant, or as more commonly introduced. Hello, I am a wizard. Humility. Being two of my favorite spell types, of course I got drawn in, especially with his illustrious pedigree and a name like Goblin U. Thought I'd be accepted, maybe get into the apprentice program. Wouldn't if I could now, knowing his protege. Don't major heroes, they might be semi-lucid and controlled by an evil secretary, mage, kobold, creature. Anyway, speaking of my boss, the scribes wizard. What, so the one wizard counts as multiple scribes? Last I checked, that boss isn't a legion. She's not, right? Nope. Okay, good. So, not being a school-based class means your level 2 gets real features. Instead of that usual reduced time and gold spent by half when copying spells of your school. That feature instead gets moved to level 10, but it's for making spell scrolls and comes with a free second level spell slot in the most convoluted way possible. Anyway, level 2 you get a special book and quill. The quill has infinite ink of every color, lets you erase anything you write with it, and reduces the copy time of spells from hours into minutes. The book lets you cast a ritual spell, normally 10 minutes, as an action once per day. It also lets you change the damage type of a spell into the same as any other spell you have at that level. So if you know Ray of Frost and Burning Hands, you can swap their damage, make Burning Frost and Ray of Hands. Please don't. Honestly, I really love it, and lets even spells you don't care about still be a reward. Also, if your book gets lost or destroyed, or killed I guess since it is sentient, just prepare a new book to use as a host and it comes right back with all your spells. The fact that it's sentient also matters since at level 6 it can basically manifest a little hologram. A person, book, a literal wall of text, more if your team's not a stickler. It can float around using your bonus action, you can share your sights and sounds, and a few times a day you can even cast your spells through it. You can make your close range spells into long range or just shove it under the door for a preemptive strength. Enchantment plus telepathy can hijack a social encounter from outside the building. And at level 14, it gets even better. You have advantage on all arcana checks when you have the book, and when it spirits out, you can survive anything. You can completely negate all incoming damage, no matter the source or amount, at a cost. You burn your spirit's form and roll 3d6. You then lose that many spell levels worth of spells. If you don't have that many spells, lose them all and drop to zero. They leave your book for 1d6 days and you can't relearn them or even cast them. That's just, it's so... You okay? The scribes is my favorite, okay? It always has been. They're the coolest. The other schools feel like a tool for the wizard's interest, but this one feels like experimentation and that's what I'm all about. And that final ability, negating anything with a ward so strong it tears the knowledge from your soul? There's nothing cooler than big magic at a cost. That's like my favorite thing. They have the best stuff and they're the logical choice for any curious mage. And when I finally meet one, it's our jerk up a boss and one of the worst people I know is one of the coolest things I know. So how about ideas on how to be a good one? First of all, think back like 20 minutes ago. Remember what I was saying about alternative spell books? That goes so much more here. It could be the skull of an ancestor whispering secrets or an endless scroll dating back millennia or 
made from dragon hide that actually houses the dragon spirit. And on that note, the book's sentient. Who is this? Is this a person or a bound elemental or a wizard who wanted to keep learning for eternity? Is this the spirit of magic itself wanting to learn, explore, experiment? I know that's what the boss thinks it is, but what if it's yourself, a reflection of your spirit, your desire to learn, your curiosity all manifest? I mean, if I hadn't become an alchemist, which was the right choice, but if not, I think I'd be a starry-eyed scribe wizard, just making my janky homebrew magic on a page instead of a pot. But people are similar in all the right ways except a few. You either love each other or hate each other more than anything in the world. I don't exploit employees. Moving on. Now, I have three more things to say. First is the usual end-of-class summary. Obviously, wizards are a fun class. They're well-beloved for a reason. They have absurd amounts of spells. If you're in it for the magic, it's hard to argue with a wizard. But if you're wanting an interesting twist, Sorcerer and Bard are good for similar levels of magic with a different feel. Druid's great if you want to make it even more complicated by mixing animal forms in, and I recommend the Alchemist for wonderful flavor and unique magic at the cost of spell power. Secondly, a word of advice for all classes. Always remember that the only true suboptimal pick is the one that isn't fun for you, because then you're failing the entire point of the game, the only part that matters. If the big numbers are what's fun for you, then that's great, but if it's just taking what's cool, also great. So remember, if the party starts hitting above the raid class, the DM will just move into the next weight class. They're not gonna outgun a goddess in an arms race. I am not saying that being strong is evil. Don't drag down other players on purpose. But if they're mad you took a lightning bolt over fireball or something, they're a dick. Fuck them, if you have fun with the way of four elements bunk, they can deal with it. A good DM will just adjust. Assuming it's not some open world where it's established at the start that picking your challenges is on you. There's nothing wrong with that style, it's just not my preferred one. Anyway, there's a reason I only ever mentioned power when I thought it would really affect your experience. The flavor and feel, to me, that's what matters most. Oh, and third, what comes next? I mean, we're at the end of my main series here, and I said I was shifting my focus after. I'll probably splash back into monster videos, and you know I cover multiple systems at once. I might stay with monsters if you want, or shuffle in some Pathfinder ancestries. Trust me, they are wild. 5e people will find things for your own campaigns, even if you don't make the switch. Or I could do classes if people want me to, though I'll have to figure out how to tackle them. They have less in the way of universal powers, instead giving you a bunch of class-specific options to choose from when you level. But I'll figure it out and write about monsters in the meantime. What I don't need to figure out is my appreciation for all of you, including, of course, my lovely patrons. Sparrow Goblin, Butter Masquerade, Snake Oil, but also for all of those in the past. It's not like I've forgotten about Level 1 Cleric or Sergeant Daniels or Elden Year 95 or all of you commenting. I look forward to your comments and all of your ideas. I still think about you and recognize basically all of you by name. I have an oddly good memory for usernames and profile pics. And to those who don't comment or even like, hey, still thanks. You like me enough to get this far in a video, what else could I ask for? Thanks for the ride everyone, here's to many more. Until next time, class dismissed. And that's that, so I guess there's only one question left. What you doing? Are you playing a new game? Steam Summer Sales in full swing after all. Or maybe you're asleep or AFK in this autoplane. I like to put on big stuff like this when I'm doing a bunch of cleaning or cooking. I used to use cooking shows for that, but I kept absentmindedly grabbing what they were talking about. You really don't want to grab soy sauce instead of vanilla extract. I buy it in bulk, it's the same size bottle. Well, whatever it is, thanks. My only remaining requirement for being monetized is more watch time, so that really helped. But for now, class dismissed.